Hello everyone and welcome to the blog Clone Project. So this is your first clone project. I want to congratulate you on making it this far into the course. And in this project, we'll be creating a blog. And not just a personal blog, but you can think of it more as a company blog since it'll be able to have multiple users. This is actually a great first step to building a larger, more robust social network application as a lot of the knowledge here is going to be directly transferred to our social network clone projects. And this project will include topics on almost everything we've covered so far. So take it on slowly and carefully. And I've made sure to add in elements from pretty much every section of the course. So if you skip the section, make sure you review it before actually coming onto this clone project. And I really recommend having the Django documentation open so you can cross-reference anything new you see. This blog is going to be a multi-user blog, as I mentioned, so it's kind of more like a company blog rather than just a simple personal blog interface. And this multi-user behavior is going to be easily extendable to future projects. So we're also going to be adding in some fun JavaScript and CSS features to give the site a more complete feel. So let's take a look at what the completed website actually looks like. All right, this is what the website looks like running locally. And you can see here that I have some kind of fun CSS where the colors of the blog posts are slowly changing. And even if I highlight everything, uh, my highlighted color will also slowly change. Obviously that's completely optional, but that's gonna be a little fun CSS element we add to that. And that's actually pure CSS. That's not any JavaScript, which is interesting. So what we're gonna be able to do is click here on this little profile tab. And that's gonna show you how to use a Glyphicon. And then here we'll say, please log in, must be a super user, so we can log in. You can see stuff is changing colors. And then once we've done that, I'm a little zoomed in here, so you can see it, but at 100% zoom in, we can see we can create a new post. And then we create a new post, select an author, title will be my great post. And then you can see here, you can begin to type text, so we'll say something like, hello world. And if you've ever used a website called medium.com, which is kind of a blogging site, you'll know that if you highlight something, it gives you options on stating whether something's bold, whether it's uh, italics, underline, header two, header three, and we're gonna actually add in that functionality, whether you wanna link in here. So this could take you to something like google.com, and now it's a link, etc. So that's all now in JavaScript, and we're gonna learn how to add that in. So then I can save this. I have my great posts, and then I can also add comments to it. But note that it's right now a draft, so if I check out my drafts, I have draft do not publish, another uh, mess up draft, and then I have my great post, so I can click on that, and then I can say publish this to the entire world. And now if I look at my tech blog, the homepage, I can see my great post has been published. So then on my great post, or any post really, we can edit the post, so I can come over here and edit. So we'll say new edit, save that, whoops. There we go. And here you see hello world, a new edit, and I can also add comments to it. So I can say some visitor, type the text in, hey, that is a post. And then they also uh, get access to doing things like bold or heading to. Uh, maybe you don't want that, but you never know. And then we'll post that comment and it says, hey, that is a post posted by some visitor. And as a user, I get to uh, approve or remove comments. So I approve that comment, check it, and then it takes me back to my great post. And if I look at my tech blog, come back to my great post, I can see here it has one comment. And there we go. And then you can also use this to link to GitHub, LinkedIn, there's an about page, maybe this is about your company or about me, um, etc. So lots of cool stuff here, and we're going to learn a lot. And believe it or not, a lot of this functionality is actually not that hard to implement, given what you learned already. And then finally, the last thing you can do is delete posts. So you can click on this little X. Are you sure you want to delete my great post? Click confirm and it deletes the post. All right, so let's hop over quickly to the slides and finish this all out. All right, just a few last notes before we get started. It's also really common for real Django projects to make use of other open source third-party libraries. And we're gonna be using quite a few, so make sure you follow along when we install them. If you're kind of going with the code and you ever get an error called no module named some sort of module, it's probably because you forgot to install it. So all you have to do is go to your command line and say pip install that particular module name inside of your virtual environment. And we're also going to be exploring different ways of organizing your Django projects. And we've previously discussed this organization method in the class-based views section. Definitely going to be implementing a lot of ideas from that previous section. So make sure to review it before heading on to this project. 
And a few final important notes. Uh, no amount of clone projects can show you how to use and do everything. So you're going to need to feel comfortable venturing out on your own and reading the documentation when it comes to your own personal projects. And if you're interested in learning a specific plugin, library, or API, you're probably going to need to reference outside of materials if they're not covered in these projects. And one last final note, you should be able to have a full understanding of how we're building up the clone project shown here, but not necessarily memorizing every certain class call or function name, etc. So you should have an understanding, but don't feel obligated that you had to have everything memorized by this point in the course. All right, let's get started. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part one of the blog clone project. And we're going to start off in this short lecture just setting up our Django project, the application. It's going to be a single application project blog and then we'll also just do an initial run, make sure everything's working. After that we'll set up a few files within our application, a couple of urls.py, forms.py, those typical files that we're going to need for larger scale projects. Okay, let's jump to the editor and get started. Here I am at the Atom text editor. Before we get started with anything, we want to make sure we set up some sort of virtual environment. This is optional if you don't have any plans on actually uploading this website to the web and you're just working locally, but it's always a good idea to have a virtual environment. I'm going to be activating the one we've always been using, which is my Django ENV. Feel free to create a new environment for each project. In fact, that's what I would encourage you as a best practice. Okay, so I can see there by the parentheses, my Django ENV is ready to go. So I'm going to CD into a folder that I just made it's called blog project. And you can actually see it up here under Django lectures. We have those older Django levels and here I have Django blog project. And this is where I'll call Django dash admin. Say start project. And then whatever you want to call the project, don't call this project blog because that's actually going to be the name of our application within the project. So usually you'll want to call your project some sort of nickname that corresponds to the site itself. For instance, if you were making an Instagram clone, you would call your project Insta or Instagram or Instagram project kind of thing. You wouldn't want to call it something like pictures or messaging. So here what we're going to do is just call it the most basic nickname you can do, which is my site. So we'll say start project my site, and then we're going to CD into my site. And if I expand this over here on the left hand tab, I should see my site and then my site. Remember we get those kind of dual folders and we also have manage.py. So within my site, I'm also going to start my application. So we can call it Django-admin. And you can actually do this with uh, Python manage.py as well. But I like doing it through Django admin just to make sure I'm doing everything correctly. And then the only application we'll have is the main blogging application that's going to be able to accept posts and comments for the blog. So we'll just call it blog. And that's sort of the reason we didn't want you to actually call the project itself blog because the main application is called blog. Okay. So here I have blog ready to go. I'm going to expand blog and there's a couple more files that I want in here. I want a urls.py file because eventually I'm going to need that. So I will say a new file within blog called urls.py. And then I also plan to create some forms. So again, inside a blog, I'll say new file and call it forms.py. Okay, that's really all we need for now. Later on, we'll add some template folders, etc. But whenever you add in a new application, you always want to make sure that you come to settings.py, come down, scroll down to where it says installed apps, and make sure that the application that you just created is there. And if you ever get some errors with this, whenever you're running your server, make sure that your format is the same as mine. So notice here that I have blog project, my site, and then under my site, I have two folders, the blog, all the applications, the project folder, and then your manage.py. Sometimes it's a little confusing that you have two folders, a subdirectory of the exact same name as its parent directory. That's basically how Django does this automatically. So just keep an eye out for that. Make sure you're in the right my site folder. Okay, once you've done that, let's do what we should always do, which is called python manage.py and migrate everything. So we'll say python manage.py, migrate, hit enter. It's gonna run all those migrations. Looks like everything's uh, working well. And then we also want to set up our application. So we'll say Python, make migrations, and then call the application we want, which is blog. And whoops, I need to say Python manage.py, make migrations, and then call blog. 
Okay, no changes detected in app blog. As expected, I don't actually have any new models there. We'll take care of that later on because here we have an empty models, but it's always a good idea to do that. And you've probably heard me say this a million times by now, but I always like to just run migrate one more time just to check that it says no changes detected and it says no migrations to apply. Perfect. So let's make sure this actually all works out. I'll call Python manage.py and run the server. Okay, looks like we have no errors there. I'm going to copy this and bring over my browser. And then bringing over my browser page, here it is, it worked. Congratulations on your first Django Powered page. That's exactly what we want. And hopefully by now, this whole process of setting up your project, the applications, a couple of the files you're going to need, doing the migrations and running the actual server, this should all be really familiar to you. And honestly, by now you probably have these steps memorized. If you don't, I would encourage you to run through this one more time on your own completely until you have these steps memorized, because this is what you're going to be doing basically every time you start a Python Django project. That's it for this lecture. Pretty short one, just getting everything set up. In the next couple of lectures, we'll start actually filling out some of these files. So thanks everyone. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part two of the blog clone project. So our basic file setup is now completed from part one and the next step is to set up our model. So we have a models.py file inside of our blog application. And personally, I think it's always a good idea for a first step when creating a new project to create that models.py file and actually set up those models because really if you're using class-based views, those are going to dictate the whole way your site works. So I think models are a great starting point. But really you should feel free to choose whatever feels like the most natural starting point to you. So maybe you like thinking about it from a URLs to views to model standpoint instead of the reverse way, which is the way I'm going to do it here. Once you've done enough projects, you'll have a natural flow. So don't feel like what I'm writing here is written in stone. Uh, I personally prefer doing the models first, but really it's totally up to you what you do first. Okay, with all that being said, let's hop over to the editor and get started on that models.py file. Okay, here I am at my models.py file underneath the blog application. And what I'm going to do is start setting up the models that we're eventually going to use in our views and in our URLs. Since I'll be using class-based views for the posts, it's a good idea to just set up the model. That way it's much easier to connect them when we're actually working with the views. So there's a few more things I need to import before we get started on this. I'm going to say from Django.utils import oops, time zone, and that's just uh, all lowercase. And then I'm also going to import the reverse function. We've seen it before, and it'll make more sense when we're actually dealing with the class-based views and the function-based views that we'll see later on. But right now, I'll just import it, and we'll see how to work with it in a little bit. So it's from django.core URL resolvers import reverse. And if we didn't have it right now, eventually when we're working with views and URLs, we would see some more sort of error that says, hey, maybe you should add a reverse method to your class. Okay, so the first thing is to actually create some sort of post model. So each blog post is just going to connect to a model in our database. So I'll create a class and I'm going to call it post and it will inherit from models, whoops, dot model, not motel. And I'm going to have a couple fields here or attributes. I'll have an author, title, text, a creation date, and a publication date. So I'm going to be able to create a post, but maybe not publish it right away. If I want to save stuff as drafts, I'll be able to do that. So I'll say author is equal to models, and this will be a foreign key. And I'm going to pass in here, A-U-T-H dot user. And so later on when we deal with multi-user projects, we won't actually be following this sort of design. But since we only expect one person to really come in and have power over this blog as far as updating or having drafts and maybe even uh, putting in comments and approving them, what we're going to do is just directly link an author to an authorization user. So when we create a super user, that's basically going to be someone who can author new posts. And then the title for posts is going to be models dot, and that's going to be a character field, character field, and we'll give it a max length of 200 characters. Really totally arbitrary choice here. 
and then we'll have a text field to so the actual text of that blog post and that's going to be models and we'll have a text field there and I won't put a max length or anything because I don't know how long my text is going to be and then finally we'll have two date fields. We'll have a created date and that's going to be models dot a date time field and the default for that is going to be time zone dot now. So that's why I had to import from Django dot utils import time zone and if you go to your actual settings dot pi file so coming over here to settings dot pi real quick it's actually over here in this new tab if you start scrolling down eventually what you're going to see is somewhere it should define what time zone you're in. So the internationalization, I have my language code in English and you can see that I have this UTC time zone. So whatever time zone makes the most sense for you, that's what you should set up here. It's some sort of code for your time zone. And basically what's gonna happen is as you're writing a post and you decide to say, oh, I created this post right now, it's going to default to you created this post at the current time zone. But for the publication date, we're going to say published date is equal to models a date time field and we're not going to have it default to time zone dot now instead what we'll do is we'll say it can be blank because maybe you don't want to publish it yet or it can also be null maybe you don't have any publication date whatsoever so you can either leave it blank or have it just be null meaning it can be empty and that will make more sense when we actually start creating posts and again, you have a lot of options here. You don't have to do everything the way I'm doing it, but this kind of makes sense for the way we're going to set up our project. And then finally, we're going to have a couple of methods on this. So one method that we need to do is actually set up the publication date method. So I'll say you can have a method called publish on this post and any method inside a class should take self. I'm going to kind of collapse the tree and this terminal so we get a little more space here to work with. So I'll say publish self and what's going to happen is I'm going to grab my actual published date attribute and then set it equal to time zone dot now and then I'll say self dot save. So what does this actually mean? Well remember that when I create a date it doesn't matter I always default to the current time I hit create which makes sense you can't really edit a creation date so you'll say, okay, I'm creating a new blog post, hit that button, the date of that blog post being created is the current time. But the publish date can be blank and it can also be null. When I'm ready to hit publish, there'll be a publish button. And then when I hit that publish button, it'll eventually say, okay, right now when you hit publish, it's the current time and I'm going to save that. So that's kind of all done automatically for you. The creation date automatically by this one line, publish date, since that's going to be linked to another button or function, we'll just pad it as a method here. Okay, then posts can have comments on them. So we'll create another method called approve underscore comments. That's going to be self. And then all this is going to do is say return self.comments and I will filter it by approved let's see let's make it approved with a d comments equals true so what is that saying eventually i'm going to have a list of comments somewhere some of them are going to be approved comments some of them are going to be not approved comments so what i'm going to do is grab those comments filter them by saying okay is this a truly approved comment and then i can show them along with the post to anyone that visits the website and then finally, if any model, it's always a good idea to have some sort of string representation of it. So we'll say str, pass and self. And what makes the most sense for a post is the actual title. So we'll say self title. And I'm going to save this. Eventually, what we're going to have to do is use this reverse method. So we'll kind of cross that path once we get there. So right now, I'll leave it blank, but we definitely aren't done with the post class. But what I want to do, since the actual comment class is going to look so similar to this, it's a good idea that we kind of take care of it right now. So I'm going to create a new class called comment, and it's going to look really, really similar to what we just created. So it's also going to be a post. You can almost think of these as almost like mini posts. So it has a foreign key 
and it's going to come from blog.post. And we'll give it a related name of comments. And that will make more sense when we start dealing with the actual views that have to do with the comments. Basically, this line is going to connect each comment to an actual post, much in the same way that if you come up here, we connected the author to an actual authorization user. Each comment is going to be connected to a blog application post. And then the author will say models dot character field. And we're just going to have anyone kind of write their own name in there. So we'll say a max length of, I don't know, 200, even though that's probably a lot, but not a big deal. We'll have the text of the comment be really similar. We'll say models dot text field, no constraints there. And then we'll also have a created date. And this will be models dot a date time field. And the default is going to be time zone dot now kind of makes sense. A comment, once they hit uh, create that comment, that date time field gets put into place. And then finally, instead of a publication process, we have an approved comments process. So it will say approved comment, singular, is equal to models dot, and this is going to be a Boolean field, so true or false, is it approved or not? And the default is going to be false, that I haven't approved this comment yet. Okay, so let's save that right now. So just as a quick review of what we have, it's almost the same as if we come up here, the post class, but we have a comment class. Its post is connected to a post, so each comment aligns with a post. We have an author to it, which is just going to be basically what anyone wants. You can just write that in. Note that the author of the comment is not the same as the author of the post, nor is it a foreign key. It's basically just someone uh, typing in who wrote it. So. Uh, John Doe can come in and just say, hey, I'm going to post this comment here. I'll fill in my name and it'll just be a character field. And then we're going to come up here, say text model text field, the creation date, and then approved comments. And what I have to do is make sure that this approved comments is the same as approved comments here. So either they should both be plural or both be singular. Basically what I mean is they should both uh, be the exact same thing. So here I said approved comments. I think earlier I said add an S in here. Uh, since I'm leaving this one singular, let's actually just have them both be singular. So keep that in mind, had a little uh, typo there. They should both match. So either they both have an S or they both have no S. Okay, moving along, what I'm gonna do is create a few methods here. I'll create an approve method, self. And we'll say self dot approved underscore comments, and we'll say set that equal to true. This is essentially just like that publication method we worked on that post. And then we'll say self.save. And then what I'm going to do here, is say def, create some sort of string representation, say self, and then say return self.text. Okay, I'm going to save this now. And so basically we have the main skeletons of a comment and a post. Now hopefully you can see that they're almost the exact same thing, except that a post, its author is connected to an actual super user on the website, and its publication date is kind of analogous to the approval date of a comment, where a comment's post is linked foreign keywise to an actual post, and then we have this author, which is going to be basically anyone can just write their name in. Now to actually finish off this models.py, we still have to worry about the get absolute URL methods. We've seen this before in the class-based view lectures, but now it's time to actually use this. And what we're going to do is take advantage of this reverse function. Basically the whole idea behind this is after someone creates a post or a comment, where should the website take them? So what we're going to do is use those detail views for the posts and we'll use some function views for the comments. But let's start off with this post class. And I'm going to say, over here where it says approve comments, I'll say def and have that get absolute URL method. And it has to be called get underscore absolute underscore URL. This is something that Django actually looks for. You can't uh, call it something else. And so it's saying, all right, once you've created an instance of this post, what should I do? 
Well, we're going to say return and call the reverse. Uh, hopefully remember that we also talked a little bit about reverse lazy earlier on, but right now we just need reverse. And we'll have some sort of view that is a detail view, meaning we'll have eventually a post detail URL. And then something we're also going to add in is a keyword argument dictionary or kwargs. And that's going to be a dictionary where the primary key matches up with self pk. So all this is saying is after I create a post, so I'm done creating it and I hit some sort of publication, where should I go? Well, go to that post detail page for the primary key of the post that you just created. Makes sense. And it'll make more sense when we actually create the view for it. And if, if this is a little confusing for you, definitely uh, refer back to those class-based view lectures. And scrolling down, we're gonna do something really similar to the comment. And in this case, what we're going to do is say DEF. Now, since a comment needs to be approved by a super user, it doesn't make sense to actually go back to a list of the comments. Instead, what we're going to do is say, once that person is done typing in that comment, they're going to go back to the list of all the posts. It's kind of up to you what you think uh, is most reasonable. Maybe you could have them go back to the actual post detail itself, but we'll just have them since the comment actually needs to be approved before displaying there. We'll have it go back to that main homepage of all the post lists. So I will say def get underscore absolute URL self, and I'm going to return as a reverse call to post underscore list. And that's going to be a list view, and we're actually going to use that as the home page. So the home page of this website is going to be just a list of all the posts. All right, so this actually seems like a really natural stopping point for part two, so that's what we're going to do. We'll just end it here, but that's it for the models.py file. We won't need to mess around or edit anything else. So as a quick review, uh, before we hang on to, or before we go on to the next lecture, excuse me, We've created two classes here, or two models, the post model and the comment model. Uh, the comment model is almost like a baby brother or baby sister to the post, where we just have the author, the titles, the text, and then some sort of creation date and some sort of publication date. In the comments, we have the post, which connects to, uh, or the comment post, which connects to an actual post, the author, which is just some character field, so anyone can type in their name, and then we have the creation date and the approval date. And that's really all there is to it. We also have these get absolute URL methods, which once you've created a comment or a post, tells the website where to go back to. And that's basically it. Okay, thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part three of the blog clone project. So the models are all set up from the previous lecture, now it's time to actually use them to quickly create some forms, since we already have that forms.py file set up inside that blog application. And what we're also going to learn that we haven't done before is how we can actually set up the form widgets to correspond to CSS classes. So what do I actually mean by that? Well, we've already seen something along the lines of injecting with a template tag form.as underscore p, which just injects your form as paragraph. And if you're actually using the bootstrap templates, that looks okay. It's just a standard bootstrap form where you kind of get everything from top to bottom using those as paragraph tags. But what if you actually want to style a particular widget? And remember what I mean by widget is an actual form widget. So something like a form button or the text area, text input, etc. What if for whatever reason, I wanted to actually take the text area widget and give it a different styling? For example, give it that medium.com styling that we're going to be using later. Well, all you have to do is add a widgets attribute to the meta class. And what this widget attribute is, it's, it's actually a dictionary and you pass in some arguments or parameters into that dictionary that link the actual widget to the class. Later, you can call in your CSS file that class name and it will affect that particular widget directly. So let's show you how to do all of this by hopping over to the editor. Okay, so here I am at the editor. There's my models.py file, it's ready to go. Remember we have a post model and scrolling down, we also have a comments model. That's what we're going to be using in the forms.py file that we've already created. So the first thing I need to do is say from Django import forms. And once we've done that, I need to actually grab the models themselves. There's various ways you could do this. You could just say from 
dot models. To me, I actually like having, as you've heard me say before, the application name, and then start calling files from that. So we'll say from blog dot models, import, and then I'm going to import the two models we created, which was the post model and the comments model. And then let's actually create those classes. So I will create the post form class, which is going to take forms, model form, and then inside of this, I'll have that meta class. And inside this meta class, what we need to do is actually connect the model we're using. In this case, I'm using the post model. And then we want to also connect the fields that I want to be able to edit in this form. So we'll just edit the author field. So who's actually typing out this blog post. Theoretically, it should be the same person every time, but maybe we'll have multiple super users. So it could be almost like a company blog where you have other super users coming in. So we'll keep uh, author as a field you can edit. Then we definitely want to be able to edit the title of whatever blog post we're using. And of course, we want to edit the text itself. And we'll talk about those widgets in just a second, but let's also edit the comments class. Or I should say the comment form. So I will say comment form as my new class, and then we'll say forms dot model form. And then what I'm going to create here is meta. And inside of this, we'll connect it to the comment model. So there's the connection to the comment model. And then the fields here that this person is going to be able to edit, well, they should be able to say who's writing the comment, the author, and then the actual text of the comment itself. Okay, and let me add in a couple more lines here so we get some space. And finally, it's time to add in these widgets. So what I'm going to do is add in the widgets first to the post form. And again, this is so that I can grab a particular field widget. So let's say I wanted to add a red border to the text area box that corresponds with text. Well, how would I do that? In that case, I need to actually add in widgets. So this goes inside of the meta class. So note my indentation here. And I create a widgets attribute that is a dictionary. And for formatting purposes, I'll kind of write this over multiple lines. But the first key is going to respond to a field. So I'll have title be a field. And then what I will have here is forms dot and then the widget actual name. So in this case, um, this is going to be a text input. And then we have the attributes which is going to be ATTRS and set that equal to, and here we have kind of a sub dictionary and we have a class and then we can give it a text input class. So that'll be the first entry. And then the other one I want to be able to edit is the text. So this is how we're actually going to connect that text widget with those medium editor text area stylings. So I will say forms dot text area. So that's the sort of widget I'm doing. It's just the giant text area. And we'll say ATRS, those attributes is equal to, and I'll set it with a class. And then we're going to have kind of a long class name that is attributed to the actual medium library we're going to be working with. So later on, when we actually work with the JavaScript and CSS of that medium editor library, we'll show you how I actually got this long class name. But for now, just uh, copy or paste from the notes or follow along with me. But the classes we're going to pass here is the editable class, as then you can edit it. Then we'll pass in medium dash editor dash text area. So that's the actual class that's going to allow us to connect it to some sort of medium editor. And then what we're also going to do is add in our own class. So we'll say post content. So we're connecting this text area attribute, which is going to be our text in the blog post form. And it's going to be connected to a CSS class. In fact, it's connected to three CSS classes. First is the edible class. That means we can edit it. And that's coming from this medium editor library that we're going to be working with. Then we have the medium editor text area, which kind of gives it the styling of the actual medium editor. And then we have this post content, which is going to be our own class. So we're doing the exact same thing over here for the title, except we're saying it's text input class. Again, that's our own class. So the only classes that are not ours are these two right here that I'm highlighting. The classes that are ours is the text input class and then the post content class. Then we're going to scroll down and do a really similar thing for the comment form. 
So over here, we're going to have a dictionary widgets. And I'm going to set author, the first dictionary entry, to be forms. Dot, it's going to be a text input widget. And then we'll have this attributes. That's going to be a dictionary. We'll have it connect to a class. And in this case, I'll have it just connect to the same uh, text input class here. So we'll say text input class. So whatever CSS styling. Uh, this title is going to have, the author will also have it here, since they kind of serve the same purpose relative to their actual form. Again, you could create your own class here if you wanted to, if you wanted to add some specific styling elements to the author form box of the comments themselves. And then, more importantly, the actual text, we want to connect this to forms, text area, and in fact, this is actually going to be the exact same thing as what's up here minus this post content. So I'm going to copy and paste this. Let me collapse my directory tree so you can see everything. And then I'm going to copy and paste it here. And then I'm going to delete this post content. So that post content class, I'll make sure that class is only suitable for the post form versus here, I'm just going to have it kind of be the default medium editor classes. So those are my two widgets, and this is the main idea of how you can connect specific widgets to CSS styling. Again, the main idea is just you have widgets, it's a dictionary attribute inside of that meta class, you have the actual uh, field, you'll say forms dot, the actual type of widget it's going to be, and then you set attributes where you have a class key and then the name of the class that eventually will go inside your CSS. So since we're talking a little bit about CSS, let's set up the most basic CSS, which means we probably want to set up a static folder. So I will kind of open up my directory tree here, and this is going to go underneath right here. We see blog project, and then we also see my site. A lot of times what we've done in the past is have the static folder line up with the same directory as my site and blog, but when we were talking about advanced class-based views, we also discussed having template and static folders inside of the actual application folder. So that's the kind of following we're going to do here, since that's a little more common in the real world and doesn't line up exactly with the tutorials of the Django documentation. But a lot of times in the real world, each particular application is going to come with its own set of static directories and template directories, which kind of makes sense if you want these applications to be more plug and play. That way, in case you ever want to have some sort of blog application, you can quickly grab everything from this previous project and insert it or inject it into another much larger project. So what we're going to do is inside of this blog folder, I'm going to create a new directory. So we'll say new folder, and this folder is going to be called static. And inside of this static folder, I'll create two new folders. So I'll have a folder for my CSS, and inside of static, I will also have a folder for my JavaScript, and we'll call that .js. And inside of CSS, what we're going to do is we're not going to mess with it right now, but we'll set up the file that we'll be using. So we'll say new file, and we'll just call it blog.css. And we'll be working a lot more with the CSS towards the end, but right now we'll just keep it blank, but make sure that the static files are all there. And since we're adding the static directories, it's a good idea to come over to the settings.py file and make sure the static is all set up down there. So let's come over to my site, settings.py, scroll all the way down, because usually that's where we're going to put all that static stuff. So all the way down, here I have the static URL. That's totally fine. We do have it under a folder named static. But what I'm going to do here is say static underscore root is equal to os.path.join as we've done before and I will join the base directory with the static folder that way it knows where it's to look for stuff and then what I'm also going to do is create those template uh, folders or directories we haven't actually created any templates yet but we will soon and since we're messing around with the settings.py file might as well do it all now so at the same level of the static underneath blog I will right click, create a new folder, and I will call this templates. 
And then inside of this templates, let's have two directories. I'll have a new folder that shares the same name as the application. Remember, we talked about this in class-based views, where this templates folder goes underneath the application. Underneath that, you have the application name again. A little repetitive, but that's usually what we see in the real world. And I'm going to create a new folder here, and we'll call this registration. And when we actually begin dealing with uh, registering users and authorization, we'll be dealing with a little template there, some sort of login page template. But since we have the template set up, might as well uh, take care of that as well. So what I'm going to do is, I like doing this at the top. You can really do this anywhere you want in the settings.py file. But just to kind of keep in line with what we have been doing, I'll create the template dir here. And I will say os.path.join, pass in the base directory. And what I have to do here is actually point it to the templates we're using. So I'll be using blog templates blog. Save that. And then scrolling down here, pass installed apps, pass middleware. Here's the template. Remember, this can take a list of directories. Well, we only have one template, but if we had other applications, we could be passing these as well. But in this case, I'll just pass in template underscore dir. And that's all there is to it. So now I save this and we have our settings.py file. Now we're not completely done with the settings.py file. Later on when we actually talk about uh, logins, we'll need to do a little edit here. So I will add this in right now. So scrolling all the way down, and we kind of talked a little bit about this during the authorization lectures, but we need a login underscore redirect underscore URL is equal to and we're just going to, in quotes, put a single forward slash. That way we have some sort of redirection to the home page once the person is done logging in. Okay, and we're going to talk a lot more about users logging in and all that stuff when we actually get to that. But so far, the main idea of this lecture, besides setting up the settings.py file a little further, was taking care of this forms.py file. So again, two main things we did here, setting up the forms.py file, learning how to actually use these widgets in order to attribute CSS classes to particular widgets, and then we did a little more in the settings.py file and set up our static and templates folders. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next one. Welcome back everybody to part four of the blog clone project. So now it's time to actually get to the meat of the project, which is creating views and templates and connecting them to URLs. We'll start off with the class-based views handling the actual blog posts. And the basic structure that we're going to follow here is we'll try to create a view, see how to set it up, and then we'll create the template that matches with that view. A lot of class-based views have some sort of default template name, so we'll create that template. We won't actually fill out those HTML files. We'll do that in a future lecture. Okay, let's get started and hop over to the editor. Okay, so the first step here is to actually go to views.py underneath our blog folder. And underneath templates, I also have a blog folder here, which is where I will be adding those HTML files. So let's start off by actually creating the base.html file that we'll be inheriting or extending from. So I will create a new file under blog and call it base.html. So there it is, and I'll just type in HTML here. Later on, we'll work a lot more with these HTML files. But coming back to views.py, Let's start off with that about page, since that's one of the simplest ones we have to do. So I will say from django.views.generic import, and I am going to import with parentheses. Since I'm going to do multiple imports, I can use parentheses to have them across multiple lines. And the first one that I want is this template view. So we'll say class, and we'll call this the about view. And this will be a template view. And all we have to do here is say the template underscore name. And we're going to connect it to about.html. And that's really all we have to do. And then we're going to come here to blog, create a new file, call it about.html. And then we can say over here something like extends. And then in quotes, something like blog slash base.html. And then we can add a lot more content in here, like the body block, etc. But once we have that, the other thing we want to do is add this to our list of URLs. So coming back to URLs.py, 
notice that I'm under the blog urls.py, which is currently empty. So let's set up a way to connect our site's urls.py to our actual blog urls.py. So I'll come first to the urls.py of our entire site. So this one already has the URL configuration. I will scroll all the way down. And then what I'm going to do here is say also import include, since I'll be using that. And then I need to import some views. So I will say, actually, we'll skip that for now. And we'll say URL. And basically, I'm just going to say anything that's not the admin page, go to blogs.urls. And we can pass this in as a string. And then what that's going to do is going to look for the blogs application and then find its urls.py file. So we'll save that for now, and that means we can come back to this urls.py file and start editing it. We're not quite done with the projects urls.py file, but for now we'll just leave it like that. We still have to add in all that registration stuff, but we'll talk about that once we actually get to that. For the urls.py file of the blog application, I'm going to say from django.conf for configuration, .urls, import, url. And then I will say from blog import views. And as always, you could have also said from dot import views. And then we're going to have a URL patterns list. And this will eventually grow to be a super large list since we just have this all basically feeding into the single application. But let's start off by saying URL. And we'll have the about page be slash about. So let's do this with regular expressions. And we'll say about slash dollar sign. And this is going to be views dot. And then the about view we just created. And remember, we have to say as view. And we'll give it the name about, comma, save. All right, so our first view is basically done now. So let's come back to views.py and start with the next one. And this is basically what we're going to be doing over and over again. There's going to be a ton of URLs, a ton of views. And as I mentioned, this is kind of the meat of the entire project. So the actual home page is going to be the list of all the posts. So we'll say class, a post list view, and that's going to inherit from a list view. So let's add that in on our import statement, comma, list view. And then I'm going to kind of start a new line here. Later on, we'll add some more imports. So I'll have a list view that I'm inheriting from, and then I need to connect this to a model. So I'm going to connect this to the post model. But in order to do that, I should actually import it. So coming back up here, we'll say from blog.models, import, and let's import both models we created. We created a post model and a comment model. And then the other thing I want to do here is actually define how I want to grab this list. So let me grab a little more room here by hiding that terminal. And basically what I can do is I can create a method called get underscore query set self. And this allows me to use Django's ORM when dealing with just generic views. So that way I can add a little more of a custom touch to it. So we kind of did this a lot when we were working with function-based views, but we can actually do this as well with class-based views by defining particular get methods. And we'll get a lot more practice with this in future projects. But basically what I'm going to say is, the actual query set I want is going to be post all the objects, and I want to filter them by the published underscore date, and then I'm also going to add in underscore underscore LTE. And I will set that equal to time zone dot now. And then I'm going to also say dot order by. And let me collapse this directory tree to get some more room here. And then I'm going to say as a string dash published underscore date. And that's my whole query set. All right, so what does this all actually mean? Well, with the get query set, I'm basically almost doing a query, like a SQL query on my model. So this is essentially kind of Pythonese version of writing a SQL query. So what I'm saying is grab the post model 
all the objects there and filter out based on these conditions. So then we have grab the published date and then with the field queries you can do this really interesting thing where you say underscore underscore and then the actual field condition. So in this case it's going to be uh, less than or equal to. And I'm going to hop over to a documentation link in a little bit to kind of explain this part a little more because out of all of this, this is probably the strangest thing, this underscore underscore LTE, which we've never seen before because we haven't really dived this deep into the ORM of Django. But basically what this is asking is, okay, grab the published dates that are less than or equal to the current time and then order them by published date, except with this dash, we can uh, clarify whether we want ascending or descending. Because if we were not to order them by dash publish date, what would be happening is we would see the oldest blog post first. So here with this dash, I can order them in kind of a descending order. So the most recent blog post comes up front or at the top of this list view. So this is the get query set method and essentially allows you to use this ORM sort of a particular query on a list. So you can only get items that you want in the list with some sort of filter and then you can also order them. So let me hop over to the documentation briefly to explain a little more about this kind of curious line underscore underscore LTE. All right, so here I am at the documentation. I'm at the documentation for 1.10, although if the, by the time you're looking at this, it's 1.11, this should be basically the same. And I'm under slash topic slash DB slash queries. And I, you can just uh, do control F or command F and look up underscore underscore LTE and you'll find a simple example, but this all falls under field lookups, where it's essentially how you can specify some sort of SQL query using the query set methods. And there's three main query set methods, filter, exclude, and get. And the basic lookups look like this. The actual field you want, those are the fields of our model, remember those are the attributes, and then underscore, underscore, and then the lookup type equal to some sort of value. And again, that's a double underscore. So for example, and this kind of plays along with what we've done, is we say entry, so whatever that model was, dot object, so grab all those objects, and then filter them based off some condition. In this case, they want where the publication date is less than or equal to this particular value. So roughly, this translates into this following SQL. If you're not familiar with SQL, don't worry about this too much, but if you are, this is probably really helpful to you. So it says select everything from a blog entry or whatever entry we have here, where the publication date is less than or equal to this particular date. So almost exactly the same example that we're working with here. Now, if you're curious more about how this is actually possible, because this is definitely some more advanced Python as far as how the creators of Django kind of built this in with this underscore underscore, they have a link here to keyword arguments that you can read more into. But what you're probably more interested in is how do I actually figure out what's possible here in this double underscore. All you have to do is actually keep scrolling down and then there's uh, various examples that are available to you. So you can say underscore underscore exact, which translates into just an equal call. Again, keep scrolling down. You can say I exact, which is going to be case insensitive matching. You can say contains. And this is essentially just, if you keep scrolling down, uh, a bunch of stuff that has to do with translating SQL code into Python. But the weird confusion about it is this more advanced Python mechanism where you have these double underscores separating the actual field versus the type of comparison you're doing. Now we're not gonna be using these too often throughout this particular project, but I do want you to be aware of them. And later on in a future section, we'll talk more about the ORM that Django has. But I just want you to be aware. Again, you can always check out the documentation page here if you want more in-depth information on this. But that's a little background to where we got all those commands from. Okay, so that's the post list view. Let's minimize this and go add this view to our actual urls.py file. So I'm going to come over to urls.py of my blog. So there it is, and let's actually add this in. So I'll say comma, call URL again, and then what I'm going to do here is, since this is actually going to be the home page, let's delete this and let's make this the top one. So usually you'll always see the home page as the first URL pattern, so let's do that here. So I'll just say r, caret, and then dollar sign. And this is going to accept views dot post list view dot as underscore view. And then I'm going to set the name equal to post underscore list, which is kind of the default name 
it expects here, and that's it. So again, I'm setting the home page to all my current blog posts that are published. And that's it for that particular post list view. So let's continue moving along. And you can always reference the code to make sure it matches exactly. So if you ever get stuck on something, make sure you're checking out the code notes. Next uh, view we're gonna make is another class-based view. So let's say I have those lists of posts. I click on one, it takes me to an actual blog post. That means it's a detail view. So this one's a lot simpler. All I have to do is say post detail view. And then what I'm going to do is up here, let's import detail view. Save that, and here I'm going to say detail view. And underneath a detail view, all I have to do is say model is equal to post. And that's it. That's a detail view, as we've seen before. Let's go and add it in. I'll come over to my urls.py blog, and then a lot of this is taken care of for me. So we'll say URL. And then here what we're going to do is for a post detail view, I'll say that's going to be under post. And then I'm going to add some regular expressions here, which is going to basically be taking the primary key. And we've seen this a little bit before, but let's go ahead and show it again. It's going to be question mark P. And then it's going to accept PK like this backslash D plus, and then outside of this, dollar sign. And again, I would never really expect anyone to know this off the top of my head unless they're working a lot with Django. Um, this is more the kind of thing that you reference other examples or the documentation for. But we've already seen how to do a detail view, so we've seen this or something very similar to this before. But luckily, a lot of this heavy lifting is done for us. And all I have to say is post detail view and call as view. And this will automatically take care of matching the primary key to whatever you clicked on. And then let's give this a name. And we'll set the name equal to just post underscore detail. Okay, so that's a detail view of that post. Let's save that. And we'll hop right back over to views.py and move on to the next class-based view. So I'm gonna kind of get some more space here. And the next thing I wanna do is some sort of create view. So we'll say class and we'll say create post view. And then we want to inherit from create view, but first thing I need to do is actually import it. So we'll come back up here and then we'll say create view, save that, come down. And then what I want to do is connect my model to be equal to post. And that's what we've seen before, but there's a couple more things that we want to do here. And the main thing we want to do is I don't want anyone to be able to access this create post view. Earlier, when we were talking about authentication and authorization, we discussed using decorators. So remember we had that at symbol with something like login required, but that only really works for function-based views. And now we wanna know how do we actually work with that sort of login required with a class-based view. And that's where the term mixins come in. So you haven't seen any real mixins, but they're really easy to use, just like those decorators were easy to use. You just scroll up the top here and you're going to import them. So I'm going to say from django.contrib.auth mixins. I'm going to import and then the one we want is called login required mixin. And you can basically think of this akin to the decorator. So I'll show you the example of the decorator one. Remember we said from Django.contrib.auth.decorators import login underscore required. So essentially, back when you're dealing with function-based views, to actually get that sort of automated login required functionality, you had to use these decorators. But luckily with class-based views, the analogy to that is using these mixins. And these are essentially classes that we mix in to the classes we're inheriting with. So not only do we want to create view, but we're going to mix in that login required. That's kind of where they get their name from. So we'll say login required mix in comma. So now I'm going to inherit methods from both of these classes. So not just create view, but also login required mix in. And with the mixins, they take in a couple more attributes that are necessary. 
So one attribute we want to do is set up the login URL. So in case this person is not logged in, where should they go? And later on, we'll say they should go to slash login, almost like when you're setting up the static files. And then what we also want to do is have some sort of redirect field. So that attribute is called redirect underscore field underscore name. And I'm going to set that equal to blog slash post underscore detail dot HTML. And what this is going to do is going to say, all right, so redirect them to the detail view. And then we'll say form class is equal to post form. But that means we actually need to import that. So I'm going to scroll back up here. And we imported the models already, but let's actually import the forms themselves. So we'll say from blog.forms import post form and import the comment form. So what is this all doing? Well, I have the create post view that we've seen before. We've seen it with just a create view where you kind of have these models or these forms connected. But now I'm also kind of mixing in this login required, just like I did with decorators. But this is kind of the class-based view version, also very easy to use. You just end up having these two fields uh, where you want to redirect or where the login URL should be. So we'll put those all in here. And we will save that. And we're going to come back to our urls.py file and then match that up to some sort of URL call. So I will say URL and we'll say this is post. And you can say post create, but you're not limited to just saying create. You can call this uh, whatever you want. So oftentimes you're not going to want the URL to just always say create. Maybe you want your own specific thing, especially with larger sites for users. In this case, let's just call this post new which kind of also makes sense. So we'll say our post slash new. And then over here, what I'm going to do is say views dot, and I'm going to create a post view dot underscore as view. And then I will say name is equal to post underscore new. And I'm going to save that. So this is now my create post view. So let's continue on. I've been able to check out the details of a post, create a post, my home page, and then my about page, checking off a lot of these boxes on generic views. Let's continue on. A lot of times I'll probably want to update a post. Maybe I made a mistake. So I don't want to just be able to create them. I want to update them, which means coming back up here. Remember, this is all from those uh, CRUD lectures. I'm going to say update view. Scroll back down. And then we'll create a new class and we'll call this post update view. And we'll have this also be login required. Makes sense if I need to actually update something, I should be logged in. And then we'll call update view. And then this is going to have the same login URL and redirect field name as the creation of it. In fact, it's actually going to have everything the same. So we can just copy and paste this. And whoops, forgot my colon. And there it is. All right, so all these attributes are the same for update and creation, which makes a lot of sense. Basically, the only thing you're saying is, okay, now you're updating it instead of creating a brand new one, which kind of has to do with whether or not you're creating a new primary key or linking to an old one. So same thing as always, come back to urls.py. Hopefully, you're beginning to kind of feel out the pattern of what we're doing here. And we'll start with some regular expressions. So we'll say this is post. And actually, this should be... They should have carrots on them, so I apologize that I forgot about that. But there we go. These should all have carrots now. And then what we're going to say is for the post update, we'll say post slash, and then I'm going to call the same sort of primary key to make sure it matches with the primary key. This is essentially just making sure I link to the correct one. And then let's say something like slash edit. And then we'll have a dollar sign here. So I'm going to say something like, oh, post number one, edit that post. And then we'll say comma views dot. And then I should have a post update view. There it is. As always, you need to call it as view. And then we'll give it some sort of name. And let's call this name post underscore edit. 
You could have also called it uh, post update if you just remember that name and match it or I call post edit. Okay, almost done with the post views. Coming back to views.py, I have right now my creating, updating, detail view, listing view, about view. This is all just for the blog posts. And then what I also want is to take care of the drafts. So remember, I publish posts, but before they're published, they're going to be drafts. So let's actually create a view that lists all my unpublished drafts, which means I'm going to create a class. And actually, before we do that, let's kind of sneak in a simpler one. What if I want to delete a post? I'll need a post delete view, and we'll take care of that draft in just a second. But this should also be login required. And this is going to inherit from delete view, which we haven't imported in. So let's do that as well. So update, delete, and if this is confusing you, definitely check out the CRUD lecture inside of the advanced class lecture, or section I should say. Okay, so here's class, post delete view, login required mixin, and then I'm gonna call delete view. And this is a really simple one. We just connect it to the model that we're gonna be deleting from, and then we need some sort of success URL. So hopefully you remember this as well. So what happens when you actually delete it? Where should it go? And remember that when you're deleting a view, you don't want the success URL to actually activate until you've deleted. Otherwise, you'll kind of be jumping always to another website or another page on your website, I should say. In order to do this, we need to use the reverse lazy. So again, scrolling all the way back up here, we'll say from Django.URLs import reverse underscore lazy. That way it waits until you've actually deleted it to give you back the success URL that you're going to be going to. So we'll have it go back to the home page, which is going to call reverse lazy, and then we'll pass in the post underscore list, and I will save that. Okay, so that's the delete view, and that basically takes care of our CRUD, this sort of creates, um, updating, the actual retrieval process, well, that's just displaying it, so that's kind of inherent to all these classes, and then deleting. So these are my CRUD views right here, these three. And then I also have the detail, list, and about, or a template view, I should say. Okay, so come back to urls.py under blog. And I know this is a lot of code, but hopefully it doesn't seem super overwhelming. If you saw this all at once, it would seem uh, kind of crazy. But I believe the way we're kind of structuring it out here, it shouldn't be so bad. And we just created the delete view. Let's set that up. So we'll say post underscore, and I'm gonna copy and paste this again. And then we will say slash, and let's call it, I don't know, let's call it remove dollar sign. And then we'll call views dot, and this should be called post delete view. There it is. And then we need to call it as view. And we'll give it a name. And we'll call this name so it kind of matches up with the other one. We'll say post remove, comma. OK. Now you could always break this up into multiple lines. So a lot of people, when they're working with these URLs, they kind of style them like this, just so it's more readable. I'm going to follow along with the actual notes that I have for you guys, where everything's on a single line. But keep in mind, this isn't exactly the best PEP8 styling since it's going uh, beyond the number of character limits here. You can kind of see this line. It's a very faint line. But again, I think this is a little easier to read if you just uh, kind of scroll back and forth versus having everything on multiple lines. Okay, just a little side note. Coming back to views.py, we have one last class-based view. We'll come over to views.py and finish it. And that is that draft list I was mentioning. So let's create it. We'll say draft list view. And this is just another list view. So again, I'm gonna call a login required. And this will look a lot like the post list view, except it's going to have a query set, specifying that I wanna make sure that the publish date um, isn't there. So we'll specify a login URL is equal to login. And then let's get some more lines in here. I also want the redirect, so let's actually say the redirect field name is going to be equal to 
blog slash post underscore list dot html and then let's connect it to a model the model is just going to be the post and this looks basically exactly like the post list view so if we jump back up to the post list view remember I said for the post list view uh, get me stuff that's actually been published uh, less than or equal to the time zone now which kind of makes sense you don't want stuff uh, future publish just in case you get some sort of error that way and then we also have the ordering of it in this case if I scroll down for the drafts I want to also get a query set but I want to make sure that it, there actually is no publication date on it so we'll say DEF get query set pass and self and I will return post.objects.filter and I will grab that publish date underscore underscore and the method I'm going to use here is called is null and I'll set that equal to true so what does that actually say well if this is a list of my drafts then I want to make sure that it doesn't actually have a publication date meaning I want is null to be equal to true and then what we're going to do is off of that I will call order by and I'll order these by the created date you could also say dash create a date, um, kind of up to you, depending on how you think these should best be ordered. So we'll save that. And let me make sure that my parentheses are balanced up here. Time zone now, order by. And if I look at this post view, I should actually have another parentheses here. Okay, so that makes more sense. So I was getting some weird errors because there was some unbalanced parentheses here. Let me scroll all the way over here and delete that one. Okay, so just a quick note, I forgot to add this parentheses because it should be an entire filter command, and then off of that, it should be an entire order by command. So I was accidentally calling off the dot now instead of off the entire filter call. It's kind of more clear if we scroll down here, we have this entire filter command, and then we have this entire order by command. And last but not least, we need to still add this draft list view to our URL. So again, checking back to the urls.py file, and let's hit it up. So let me make sure I have a comma here, and I will say URL, and hopefully on your screen this is a little more clear. Right now I'm zoomed in for you guys, but on my own screen, if I'm kind of programmed by myself, I'm not as zoomed in. So what I'm going to say is post, and this is going to be for that draft list. So let's say, for instance, we want, actually let's just make this drafts, keep it simple. So drafts, dollar sign. So if I ever go to drafts and I'm logged in, I'll be able to see all my drafts. And this is going to be views dot the draft list of view. Since it's a class based view, I need to say as view. And let's give this a name. Let's give this a really obvious name so I don't forget it. We'll say post draft list comma. Okie dokes. So that is all the class based views we're going to be working with in our project. Now I know I said that's all, but there's definitely quite a bit of them. Definitely take the time to review what we've done here. There is a lot of code. I mean, basically we just wrote, what, about 46 lines plus all these specific URLs, about 50 lines of code. Um, so definitely take the time, review what we just did, check with the notes, make sure everything's matching exactly uh, in case you run into any errors. I know we haven't actually been running the site, but that's just to make sure you completely understand each of these views. Hopefully this all made uh, basic sense. The main things that were new that we introduced was the ability to have this get query set inside of these template views. And the other thing we introduced is if you scroll down this sort of login required mix in, which is just analogous to those decorators that we've worked with before. Okay. I know this is a really long lecture, so definitely uh, take some time, walk around, relax. Uh, you definitely earned it after listening to all of this. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part five of the blog clone project. So we finished the blog post views and URLs, that is the class-based views that work with the actual blog posts. But we still need to actually create the templates for the blog post class-based views, that is the actual HTML files that link up to those views. And after that, we can create the function views that are going to handle the comments. So let's get started and hop over to the editor.
All right, here I am at the editor, and what we're gonna do is first create all the templates that will match up with the views that we created here in our classes, and we'll create one extra template for the actual comments. We already have our about page template. That was actually quite easy. Remember, that was the very first one we did, and it's just linking to the actual base.html, which doesn't have much of anything right now. Let's create a couple more templates. I'm going to right-click on blog and create a new file, and we're going to have this one be the post underscore detail.html. And I do recommend that you follow along and name these HTML files exactly the same name that I'm doing here. Otherwise, when you actually run the server, you may see some errors that we saw and discussed when we talked about class-based views, that there's actually default names that Django looks for. So there's our post detail. Let's also create our post underscore form.html page. And let's create another one. And this one's going to be our post underscore list.html. It's going to be our home page with all the lists of all the posts. And let's create a draft list. So we'll say post underscore draft underscore list.html. And then finally, I want the delete for the post. So we'll say new file. And this one goes post underscore confirm underscore delete. So usually when you click on delete buttons, you need some sort of confirmation page. So there it is. And what we're also going to add in here is a comment form.html. So we haven't done any comment views, but we will in just a second. So let's create a new file and say, this is the comment underscore form.html. Okay, so we have the about, the base, the comment form, post confirm delete, post detail, post draft list, post form, and post list. And then under registration, what I'm going to do is create a new file called login.html. And note that this is going underneath the registration subdirectory under templates. And we'll discuss registration, authorization, all that later on. We're gonna do it a little differently because basically we're kind of piggybacking off the super users that you can create at the command line, since those super users are gonna be people that are actually able to log in. Okay, I'm going to close all these HTML files and templates that I just made. Later on, we're going to be working with those a lot more. But here are my URLs. This is the site's URLs. We'll come back to that later. That's my about.html page, and here are my views. So essentially, we're going to do what we did in the previous lecture, a bunch of views, and then link a bunch of URLs to them. But in this case, we'll do it for the comments. So we already did everything that has to do with the blog posts. Let's continue on with the comments. So scroll all the way down. And if you want to match up kind of the notes, I did some sort of comment or some hashtags here. So there's a bunch of hashtags just so we can kind of get an idea of what's going on and separate everything else out. Okay, so first thing we need to do is have some sort of publication for the comment itself. So we'll call this DEF and let's have this be something like add comment to post. Add underscore comment underscore to underscore post. So this will allow us to add a comment to a post and I'm going to have this be a request and take in a primary key. And what we need to do is actually import a couple more things in order to make this all work. So what I want to do is get the get object or 404 and then redirect and render. So coming all the way back up, I will collapse the tree right now so we get a little more uh, room is up here where it says django.shortcuts. Not only will I import render, but I will also import get object or 404. And we'll talk about that later on. And then I also want the redirect. And then I also want to make sure I have login required since we'll be using that later on. And then something else I probably want is time zone. So we'll say from django.utils import time zone. And I know it looks kind of crazy with all these uh, from import statements at the very top. So feel free to separate these with comments or kind of in chunks, however it makes most sense to you. But let's continue on. We'll scroll all the way back down here and we'll come back to add comment to post. So what we're going to do is have the post object inside of this function be equal to get object or 404 and it will take in a post model object and have pk equal to the primary key provided with 
the request call. And I want this to require being logged in. We don't have to have it require login, just have anyone um, make a comment, but we want to have the login required just to kind of get some practice with that decorator. So we'll say if the request dot method is equal to equals equals to post, and hopefully it's kind of jogging your memory, we'll say form is equal to comment form and then we'll take request dot post and we'll say if that form dot is valid what we're going to end up doing is grabbing the comment saying form dot save and I don't want to commit this quite yet so we'll say commit is equal to false what I want to do is connect that particular comment post to the post object and then I want to save it. And then once that's all done we're going to just return a redirect. So we'll say redirect to the post detail page with primary key being equal to that post primary key. And else, so let's say the request method wasn't a post, meaning someone hasn't actually filled out the comment form. We'll say form is equal to comment form. And after all that, we'll return, whoops, we need to render the actual page. So we'll say request, and I'm going to have it say blog slash comment underscore form dot HTML. And if I expand my directory, I can confirm here it was called comment form dot HTML. So that's what I'm putting in here. And then we're going to say pass in a context dictionary where the form is form. Hopefully this is more or less a little familiar to you given what we covered back when we were talking about forms. Okay, so in case you're feeling a little fuzzy on this, let's quickly go over everything. We have this decorator, which is a convenience decorator to make this entire view require being logged in. So in order to add a comment to a post, we take in a request and the primary key that links the actual comment to the post. So if you're on a post detail page and you click okay, I want to comment on this. There's a primary key that goes along with that post. And then we're going to say, all right, either get that object, the post object, or the 404 page, meaning you couldn't find it. And pass in the post model, and then PK is equal to PK. So if the request.method is equal to post, meaning someone's actually filled in the form and hit enter or something, we have the form is equal to the comment form, pass in that request. If the form is valid, meaning they didn't mess anything up, we have the save of the form. However, we said commit false. That way we have at least some sort of form in memory. And we say comment.post is equal to the post object. And basically what this does is if we take a look back at our models, remember that the actual comment has an attribute called post, which is connected by a foreign key, which is the actual post over here. And that's basically what's happening here. We're saying, okay, that comment.post, make it equal to the post itself and then save it. Once you're all done with that, redirect to the post detail page with the primary key being equal to the post.pkey, which again is just the PK or primary key for that actual blog post. Otherwise, so if this whole thing didn't happen, else, well, the form is just equal to the comment form and we'll just return the comment form.html passing in the form through the context dictionary so when I actually come to this comment underscore form.html page over here, this is where I'm going to inject that form context dictionary. All right, so that's it. Hopefully that feels uh, pretty okay to you, but we still need to add that to our urls.py file. So let's do that now. Over here in urls.py, again, I have everything kind of as a bunch of long lines, but that's okay for us. We'll say URL, and I just created the add comment to post. So what we're gonna do here is for regular expression, I'm going to say the following. Caret, post, slash, and then copy and paste this primary key regular expression. And then what I'm going to do is say slash comment slash dollar sign, where are you? There it is. And then we'll say views dot add comment to post. And let's give it a name that just says, give it the same name add comment to post as the function. 
There it is. And then what I'm also going to do is add a comma there at the very end. So saving that, let's come back to views.py. And we have one view down, but not too many more. We just need to add in a approval of the comment, a removal of the comment view, and then we'll also use function-based views to do the actual publication. So let's finish off the comments. And it's up to you whether you want to do it below or above this, but I'll go ahead and do it below. We'll say DEF, and we're going to make one about comment approval. So you should be have to be logged in to approve a comment, so we'll just put that in now. Whoops. Decorator, login. So we'll say login required. And we'll say comments approve. And again, it takes a request and a PK, primary key. And then we'll say comment is equal to get object or 404. And we're actually going to be grabbing the comment in this case. And then we'll just say comment dot approve. So if you come back to the models, I should probably just open this since we're going to be referencing it. So if we come back to the models, we have this approve comment method. And if you have the comment, you have this approved comment method here. So what happens is if you call that method, you just say it's an approved comment. So you set this field equal to true when its default was false. So we just call the approve method on that actual model object. And that's all you have to do for the comment approval, which makes sense. We'll say return, redirect. And we'll send it back to the post detail page with the primary key being the comment.post.pk. So what's actually happening here? Again, come back to your model and it's all explained. Remember the comment is connected to a particular post. And if I want to, after approving that comment, go to the post of that comment, then I need the post.pk. So it's actually coming back up here and asking, okay, what's the primary key of the post that this comment was linked to? And that's all there is there. So we'll save that and let's add it to our URLs. Again, kind of a tedious process, but it's not so bad considering that you're really building a website with not that much code. All right, so what we have to do here is we just created the comment approval. I'll say caret comments slash, and we'll copy this so that it links. And then we'll say slash approve slash dollar sign. We'll call views dot, and I think it's called comment approve. Yeah. And let's give it the same name. Name is equal to comment approve. There we go. And note that I'm passing it in as a string. So I'm kind of taking advantage of Adam's autocomplete for functions and then just using it for a string there. So we have two views, add comment to post and the comment approve view. We'll come to views.py again. And then what we're going to do is create another function view. And we'll have this one also be login required. So we'll say login required. And let me make a few more lines here just so you have more space to see this. We'll say, this is for removing a comment. So we'll say comments remove. This takes in a request and the PK. It's gonna feel really similar to what we just did. And we'll say the comments, whoops. The comment is equal to get object or 404 of that particular comments where the PK is equal to PK. And then what we're gonna say is the post underscore PK is equal to comment dot post dot PK. So linking that up, basically what we did over here and setting it as a new variable. And the reason for that is because I want to say comment dot delete. So I'm deleting that comment from my database and then I want to return redirect and go back to the post detail. And then say PK is equal to post PK. So you might be wondering, well, why didn't you just do the same thing you did here where you said comment.post.pk? Well, remember if I said delete, by the time you get to return, it's not gonna remember what that post.pk was, which is why I need to save it as an extra variable before I delete this. So this approval and this remove are almost the exact same thing, except I have to actually save that post primary key as a separate variable. So by the time I delete it, I still remember it over here. Okay, so pretty simple logic as far as what we're doing. And as you get more experience, these things will kind of come more naturally to you, especially as you move on to just purely class-based views or for comments using some sort of outside library like Discus. But 
Now we're kind of just uh, grinding out the hard way to get review on everything we've ever covered in this course, at least most of what we covered in this course. And then what we're going to do here is, whoops, set up that URL link to it. So we'll have this be comment as well. And I'm going to copy and paste this. It's almost going to be the exact same URL, except instead of approving it, we are going to remove it. Slash dollar sign. And then we'll say comma views dot comment remove. And then we'll say name is equal to comments underscore remove. Okay, so coming back to views, we have three functional views all related to the comments. I need one more function view in order to publish things. And that is to publish posts. So I'll make this also login required. And this will be our last view. I know you're probably tired of writing these views by now. So we'll say post publish, request, takes in a primary key. And this one, it's gonna look pretty similar to the ones we just made, except now it's related to the post. So we say the post is equal to get object or 404 of the post, pk equal to pk. And then we're gonna say post.publish. And after that, I'm going to return a redirect to the post detail page. So once you actually hit publish, you go straight to that post detail page where the primary key is just the primary key of the post you just made. And once we finish this functional view, we need to just come over to urls.py and add it in. So again, we'll say URL and we'll do some regular expressions here. And we'll say this is post and we're kind of going to add this to whatever this is. So it's essentially the exact same thing here, except instead of remove, Let's copy this and just paste it in, save ourselves some typing. But we're not removing something for a post. We are going to be publishing that post. So we'll say dot publish or slash publish, excuse me. Views dot and this should be called post underscore publish. And the name of this, we'll just give it the same name. Post underscore publish. Save that. And now all your URL patterns are ready to go. So we have about 10 URL patterns, I believe, five through 15, and we have all our views ready to go. So you did a lot of work here, uh, about 85 lines of code if you count the white blank spaces or blank lines, um, not bad. So we have all our views, all our URLs ready to go, and if we look at our templates, we have all the blank templates that are ready to be filled out. Next thing we have to do is just fill out these templates, make sure everything works together, set up the actual bootstrap and CSS and JavaScript for everything, for those kind of special features. And we should be pretty darn close to getting a full functional website. Now it's just the simple templates. Okay, we'll set that up all in the next couple of videos. Thanks, and I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part six of the blog clone project. So we finished up all our views, and now let's wrap up all the URLs, including the URLs in the project urls.py file, by setting up a quick authentication system that runs on top of that super user group. That way, anyone that actually wants to create uh, posts needs to be a super user. Should be pretty brief, so let's get started. All right, here I am at the Atom text editor, and I will open up the urls.py file that corresponds to the My Site Project folder. And here, what I'm going to do is say from Django.contrib.auth for authorization, import views. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm just importing some views just like I would from another application from the authorization application. And we've seen this actually done before. So let's set this up. I'm gonna call URL and I'm going to create a domain slash accounts slash login. This can be our login page and we're just gonna call views.login and give it the name login. And then the next thing we're gonna do is create our logout. So we'll say our accounts slash logout slash dollar sign. And here we'll say views.logout, give it the name log out and then give it some keyword arguments or some kwargs and we can collapse that directory tree give ourselves a little more room here whoops and then we'll say equal to and what we'll do is we'll give it the next page so that's the next page it's going to go to 
and we'll have it go with a value of just a forward slash. So when you log out, the next page you go to is just the home page, which is our post list page. Okay, so those are the URL patterns. And if we check out under registration, we have our login.html page, which is ready to go. So let's fill that out right now. And we'll say that this extends from blog base.html and depending on uh, what plugins you have for Atom this could be syntax highlighted and we'll eventually have some base.html uh, block so I'm going to say block and we'll have some sort of content block which will behave as our body block that we've usually seen you can basically call it whatever you want and then we'll need to call end block here so this is essentially going to be our login page so I'm going to have it be a Jumbotron. Eventually in the base.html file, what we're going to end up doing is sending a link to Bootstrap. And we'll just say something like, please log in. Whoops. And then after that, we'll have h3. And in parentheses, we'll remind the person, must be a super user. Please check with the site admin. Just some sort of message there to indicate, hey, you must be a super user if you're not checking the site admin. And then here we can add in some logic. So what we're going to say is if the form dot errors, and then whenever you have an if, you should have an end if. So if that's the case, so if our form has any errors in it, meaning essentially there wasn't a match between the user or the password, I'm just going to have something pop up here saying your username and password didn't match. Please try, whoops, please try again. Otherwise, we'll just uh, continue on with this form. So we'll create a form tag and it doesn't need a class. And for the action, what we're going to have it do is go to the login page. So this action, instead of index.html, I'm just going to have it using URL template tags. Whoops. We'll say URL login. And we're basically, since we're in our URLs.py file, pointing everything as far as all templates to go straight to the blog, I don't have, like we've typically seen, something like blog colon login, because there are no templates at the site level. Everything goes to the blog. So in that case, I can kind of simplify things by just saying login. And we'll discover that more as we mess around with more templates. But we also don't need a, whoops, actually, let's make this capitalized just so it's clear. But what we do need, excuse me, is the CSRF token. So let's add that in. So we'll say CSRF underscore token. And after that, we're going to have form dot as underscore p. So that creates the paragraph form and after that we need some inputs. So we'll have a submit button and let's give this a class that's going to align with the bootstrap classes. So btn, btn dash primary. Eventually you'll start kind of memorizing more and more of these button classes and it doesn't need a name because we're not linking it to anything html wise but we give it a value and let's just have the button say something like login. And then beyond that, what we want this to have is some hidden input. So we'll give this a hidden input. The name will be next, and the value is just going to be next here. And this basically has to do with the view that we're operating with. So if we come back to urls.py, this login page, essentially this views.login, it's going to supply this next value for us, which is going to allow us to kind of deal with what to do next after this person's been logged in. And let's make sure this div is closed and that's it. Great. So that's our entire login.html and that's all we have to do for the URLs page in this actual, if we come back here, uh, this is all we need to do. We should just have these four URL patterns, two of them dealing with login and log out, setting up the admin and then including blogs.url. All right. Pretty brief lecture, but basically all our login and auth authentication stuff as far as actually going into registering on the site should be done for us. Up next, what we have to do is take care of these rest of these templates, and that's what we're going to do in the next lecture. Thanks, and I'll see you there.
Hello everyone and welcome to part 7 of the blog clone project. It's finally time to actually start filling up all those HTML templates that we've created in the previous lectures. And we're going to start off with the base HTML template since that's the one we're going to be using by extending it to all the other templates. And we'll also be setting up some of the CSS and JavaScript calls we're going to be making throughout the future lectures. Let's get started by hopping over to the editor and I'll also be showing you the resources in the browser so we'll kind of hop back and forth between those. Let's get started. All right, here I am at the editor and I've opened up the base.html file. So far, we don't really have anything in it. We just have this doc type HTML and I've gone ahead and added load static files. That way I can reference things such as the blog CSS file we did using template tagging. So I can say that static template tag. So coming back to base.html, we're gonna add some stuff to this. So the things we need to add after adding a title is bootstrap so i'll type that in as comments so i want to add in bootstrap i also want to add in this medium style editor and that's going to be the thing that allows us to kind of mimic medium.com editing and we'll show you what that means in just a second we also want to have some custom css and then probably some google fonts as well so we'll grab those as well and then the other thing that i want is over here in the body I will probably want a nav bar eventually, so we'll be adding that in this lecture. And then since this is going to be the base.html, we'll probably also have some content. So I'll have some sort of body block here. Or I believe we called it the content block, so we'll call it content block. Okay, so let's save that. And let's come back up here and show you the resources and how to grab everything. So for Bootstrap, we've done this a bunch of times before, but just come over here to get bootstrap.com. And then I'm going to grab these CDNs. So I will copy this and then I'm going to paste it here. And here we can see the latest minified CSS and also an optional theme is what I've copied and pasted. Those are the only two lines we need. And let me collapse this directory tree to get myself a little more room. Now the next thing we're going to add in is the medium style editor. So in case you're not familiar with medium.com, let me show you what that looks like and then we'll explore some GitHub libraries that are open source for us to use to mimic this. So I'm going to hop over to my browser here and close this get bootstrap. And here we can see I'm at a GitHub page. If you go all the way to the top, you can check out these links, but it's just that the user yabwe slash and then the medium editor. And you can see this is actually a library that has a ton of commits. It's actually updated pretty recently as far as uh, this filming, at least a month ago, it was updated. And if you keep scrolling down, you'll see that it supports most major browsers. But to actually get an understanding of what this is, I'm going to go to medium.com to kind of show you. So if you go to medium.com, right now I'm logged in so I can see particular articles. But medium.com is basically where you anyone can just write an article or a blog and everything has the same style and formatting. So if we click on one of these articles, such as this one, How Machines Make Sense of Big Data, obviously you can tell that I follow a lot of data science and technology articles. You'll click on it and it looks something like this. And every article or blog on medium.com basically has the same look and feel. You have images and you have this text editor and you have kind of these wide margins. So it looks kind of almost like a uh, blog post. And if you wanna write your own story, you click here on Write Story after you've logged in and then you have this sort of editor. So you'll say some stuff here, and then you can highlight this, and it gives you the option to either make it bold, make it italic, header one, heading two, or you can even put a link here and then say, uh, I don't know, google.com, etc. And then you can see it's underlined, and now it's a link. So that's the kind of thing we wanna mimic in our own blog posts. So if we come over here after some searching, I was able to discover that a lot of people wanted this sort of functionality and it's already here for a clone for us to use. And if you scroll all the way down, you wanna make sure that whenever you're working with open source files that you found online, that there's some sort of license agreement. So we check on the license, make sure that we have permission to actually use this. Now I'm just using this for educational purposes. So you can see that this is copyright, but there's also a particular license. So there's permission free of charge to any person obtaining a copy of the software to deal in the software without any sort of restrictions and then it's subject to the following conditions. Usually the conditions are for you just to uh, source and attribute who you actually got this from. So 
here's the actual information here on this license. We're just doing this for educational purposes. But whenever you're doing something in production, you should always make sure that you have the rights to this software. Obviously, when things are hosted on GitHub and they're open source, things can get a little fuzzy. So if you ever have any doubt, feel free to just message the person directly. Coming back to the actual, oh, whoops. Let's go back here. Oh yeah, coming back to the actual Medium Editor homepage here on this GitHub, we can see that if you scroll down, uh, it's essentially a JavaScript library that mimics exactly what the medium.com was doing. It C has modern browser support, which is good. And it shows you some basic demos on basic usage. So what we're going to be doing is using this for text area. And eventually if you click on the demos, you'll find this demo. So this is under medium editor demo text area HTML. And you can see that after you've imported and linked everything, the JavaScript and the CSS, you just have to create this script here to create a new editor object. And you also have to make sure that it has this class, this editable uh, medium editor text area, which we actually did back when we were creating that widgets dictionary attribute in the forms classes. And then coming down here, we can see that there's various ways to actually add this in as a file in our project. And there's a service called JS Deliver, which kind of acts like an external CDN. So if you don't actually want to download everything and link it up manually, you can just copy and paste these two right here. So one is the JavaScript file and then one is the CSS link file. So I'm going to do that. The other option is if you're having trouble getting these CDNs to work, then just do the manual installation, which you just scroll down here and then you click down where it says latest releases. It'll take you to the latest release page and then it'll say, okay, latest release 5.23.0. And then what you can do is find out all the information about that and then just download the source code itself. And then just use the linking, which we already learned about with HTML, to link the JavaScript and CSS files. So I'll come back here to my editor and I'm going to copy and paste that medium style editor. So there's only two things. There's that JavaScript and then there's this CSS. So coming back down here, those are the two links I'm going to need to actually implement the medium style editing. And later on, we'll see in the template tags, I had to set up that widget class and then also call that script that we kind of just talked about. Then finally, for some custom CSS, make sure that any custom CSS goes after all these other CSS calls. And I'm going to link it here to this blog.css. So luckily, I've already inputted load static files, meaning I can just say, add a link here. It's a style sheet. And then for my href, I'm gonna use static template tagging, which we've seen before and just say static and then call something like CSS blog.css because if I look at the directory tree, that's where it is. We have static CSS blog.css. And right now our blog.css is empty. And if you remember back to what the blog actually looks like, we have those sort of color changes that the text does. And I'll show you how I discover that. So what's a really fun website to check out, which we probably mentioned at the very beginning of the course as a way to share your code for front end stuff, is codepen.io. That's C-O-D-P-E-N.io. And you can come here and there's lots of pens. And essentially, this is just really uh, nice, fun front end stuff. So using those three front end technologies, that's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And CSS is actually really powerful. You can do a lot with CSS that you would think would be limited to JavaScript. So what I was doing, I was just messing around on CodePen. I kind of wanted to add some nice CSS to this, uh, maybe something that was a little fun for the blog project. So eventually after searching these, uh, if you find something that interests you, for instance, maybe you wanted, uh, well, not the box illusion, that's a little too crazy. Let's say you wanted to have this little guy, this rainbow preloader. So you click on this and you'll notice that it has notes that it's only supported in Chrome. But if you wanted to add something like this to your site, what you could do is just copy this CSS and then copy this HTML, which is basically an example of how to use this CSS. And that would be an easy way to have that on your site. So what I ended up doing is I discovered this little loading. So it's a simple loader and we can click on it. And what it does is the background changes hues. And I wanted to, instead of having the entire background change hues, I would have the letters themselves change hues. And I didn't really care too much about these three dots that are loading. So basically what I want to grab is just the color changing. And this was actually all done with CSS. So I'm going to copy and paste this. And since we're using this for educational purposes, uh, we don't have to worry too much about the license. But in case you wanted to use something like this in production, it's always a good idea to contact the creator and make sure that's okay with them. 
Um, obviously, they're hosting this all open source and there's no real license agreement here, but you should always check and make sure. So all you have to do is copy this and note the class. It's the class loader. And we're going to be kind of calling that on everything later on. So I'm going to come back here after copy and paste that. And I'm just going to put that into our own blog.css. So I will paste that here and then scroll back up. And I don't actually need the B1, B2, B3, etc. So all those were is if you kind of check out this, we had class B1, B2, and B3. That's for th these three little uh, loading bars. What I really want and I'm concerned with is just this loader and then these keyframes. So I'm going to get rid of these .b1 classes. Scroll all the way down and then kind of get rid of them just to simplify my CSS script a little bit. And then what I want to do is the last thing, I don't want to change uh, the background, I just want to change the color. And we'll be exploring this later on as we actually implement this. Okay. So there is my loader, and we actually don't need this left, right, top either. And I don't need this position fix, kind of simplifying this. These are the three things I only really care about. The hue rotate, so where it's actually coming from, the linear gradient of the color, and then the animation. So I will save this, and then we also see we have this h1 call, which we can leave if we wanted to, but I'm actually just going to get rid of it since we don't really need a heading 1. So that was, if you look over here, this loading awesome, how it's also changing. Uh, I don't really want that, so I'm just going to say save it. So the main things I care about are loader and then keyframes. If you keep the other stuff in, uh, you may get some different behavior than what we've seen in the blog so far. And after we've set up our blog.css file with that extra code, the last thing we have to do is set up Google Fonts. So coming back to the browser, I have Google Fonts or fonts.google.com. And I'm going to search for the two fonts I used. Obviously, you have a lot of flexibility over which ones you want to use. I used one called Russo One. Looked kind of interesting to me. And then I also use one of my favorite fonts, this, uh, whoops, Montserrat. And then we're going to add that as well. Two families are selected. So I'm going to open that up and then copy and paste the link here. So I'm going to copy that and insert that into fonts. And now I have the style sheets. Okay, perfect. And now what we're going to do is set up our nav bar. So we'll come down here and we're going to set up our nav bar. So there's our nav and let's set up the class calls. And I wouldn't expect you to memorize these. I basically was just looking at the bootstrap documentation. And in fact, a lot of this was kind of just like copy and paste from bootstrap documentation. So we use nav bar space nav bar dash default. And then I'm going to create another class called tech font, which is going to allow me if I go to blog.css, I'm going to add that in now. That's going to allow me to actually edit the font of the actual nav bar. So let's add that in. I'm going to say the font family of that is Russo one. That was the font from Google that we just got. And then it's also going to be sans serif. And then I'll set the font size to be, let's just say 1.5 EM. And then, of course, you have a lot of leeway with however you want to do this. And I'm going to give a little bit more margin here. So I will save that. So coming back to base.html. So that's my tech font. And then the other thing I want is custom navbar. So custom navbar is a class that I'm going to be using in case I ever want to customize anything else on my navbar. I'll leave it uh, blank for now in the blog.css. I don't believe we actually ever really need it or use it, but sometimes it's a good idea to just add in another class while you're building up the base HTML template in case you ever want to mess around with it. So we'll save that. And then what we're going to do is have a div here, and we're just going to give this a container div. That way anything we put in the navbar will actually be contained. So we're going to have quite a few links here. First one is going to be, in fact, let's give it a class. First one's going to be our brand. So we'll call this navbar-brand. And there's something else you can add in here. We'll add another class, uh, big brand. And that way we can link that to our CSS file if necessary. And big brand is just something to make it a little bigger. So I'm going to come over here and add in big brand class 
and let's just have this be font size of 1.5 em. That way it looks a little larger than the rest of the text. So if you notice back when you, we were running the blog project, the brand font size was a little bit larger than the rest of it. So that's what the big brand is for. And then continuing on with this, what I want to do is set up the link. So if you go to the, if you click on the brand, that should take you back to the home page. And remember, the home page for us is the actual post list. So we'll say URL post list, and let's call this something like my blog. Okay. So in fact, I'm going to expand this since we don't really need to reference the browser anymore. I'm going to add in another list item. And you can kind of fast forward for this if you don't want to watch me do all this, just as a heads up. And then we want an about page, either about yourself or the company. And we'll just have this say about. You can copy and paste all these links to make sure you get the spelling correct. And then let's have two H references. So we'll have a reference, an outside reference that is, to github.com. Maybe you're using this for your own portfolio site or your company's GitHub page. We'll have something like that. And then let's have another one to, uh, I don't know, LinkedIn. And we'll have this say LinkedIn. Whoops. And let's put this all in an unordered list. So unordered list here, and this will be in their class, whoops, nav navbar dash nav and let's grab all these list items and put them into this unordered list and I will save that okay so now we have to make sure that if the user is logged into the website they see those other options and those other options were creating a new post drafts and then logging out and something that says something like welcome user or welcome Jose etc so in order to do that I'm going to add in another unordered list, and I'm going to also give this a class, and we'll say navbar, actually nav, navbar dash nav, navbar dash right. So everything's right aligned as far as the login information. And here's we're going to add in some template tagging for some logic. So we'll add an if statement, and we'll say if the user is underscore authenticated which comes from our imports of the auth library in Django and whenever you have an if you always got to make sure you have an end if so we'll have that as well and we'll kind of leave this towards the bottom so if the user is authenticated what are we going to do well we should have a list item right and that list item let's just give it a anchor tag and the anchor tag is going to be a URL template. And the URL template is going to say, oh, link to post new. And we'll have it say new post. So I'm going to copy and paste this because I want three more really similar things. I want, instead of post new, to go to your draft page. So that is post draft list. And instead of saying new post, we'll just have it say drafts. So those are the unpublished blog posts. And then we also want some sort of log out button. So we'll have log out. And then this will just say log out. And then finally, after all that, I want one more of these, which is a little simpler. That just says, it's actually, it's not even going to have a link. It's just going to say welcome. It'll say welcome, and we'll inject our name. So that's going to be user.username. Save that. Now, if you have an if statement, you probably are usually going to have an else statement in order for this to all work correctly. So if we don't have any of that, what is the right bar going to look like? So we'll say else. We'll have a list item, anchor tag, give it a link that says log in, which makes sense. So if you're not logged in, you're going to want to log in. And we'll say, give this a template tag of URL, login, and let's give this a class so it aligns right. Nav, navbar, dash right, 
And if you can see here, I believe it should fall under the unordered list class anyways, but just because I'm a little paranoid, I'll add it to that particular item as well. And let's scroll over here. And what we could do is just have something that says login. But instead, we'll have a glyphicon, which is essentially that little icon. And these are free icons that come with Bootstrap. And in order to use them, you just use the span and then give the span a class. And the class name just matches up with the actual icon you want to use. So in our case, it's GLY or Glyphicon, and then we'll say Glyphicon dash user. And that's that little kind of Facebook looking face, that little profile. All right, so that should be it for our nav bar. So you can see here, if we kind of review what we did, we have everything on the left hand side, the my blog with the brand page about GitHub, LinkedIn, and then everything to the right. If the user is authenticated, we have these three links, new post, drafts, log out. If they're not authenticated else, when we're just gonna have, hey, go to the login page, and it's a picture of someone, it's not even some text. Now outside of the nav bar, what we're gonna do is set up our actual content. So let's do that. Let's put all the content inside some sort of div, and we can say, have a class called content, and then have another class called container in case we ever want to use it. And if we're interested in collapsing things, like if it's on a mobile display, this is where you could start adding in things like rows. So we won't really worry about this too much since we don't intend for people to really read our blog posts on a mobile. But you would just have the rows in here, and then you can start saying, well, this class is going to be something like call medium eight, and then maybe you have another class for the blog post that way you can link it up to any CSS that you want to affect. But eventually, after you identify your divs, what you're going to want is the actual block itself. So that's going to be block and then content. Or body block, whatever you want to call it. And then we'll have end block here. Okay, so basically you can add in a bunch of divs here that refer to the bootstrap ability to actually collapse things correctly according to whatever your, the grid system you worked out with. Okay, so that is it for the base.html file. It was a lot of typing, but it's definitely gonna save us some time when we actually work with other templates. And that was hopefully a good enough explanation of where we got this medium style editor from, as well as the Google fonts, and as well as this custom CSS, if we go down here for the color changing. And the key thing here to note is that we're gonna be using this loader class at the very end once we got everything done. Okay, make sure you copy and paste this from the notes if you were iffy on actually following along with my coding here. Thanks, and I will see you at the next lecture where we begin to extend this to all the other templates. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part eight of the blog clone project. So now we're going to continue on by filling out the rest of the templates. Let's hop over to the editor and get started. Okay, here I am at the editor. I have the base.html file opened here. And what I'm going to be doing is opening up the rest of these HTML files. And I can double click on them to open them up in new tabs. So I'm going to do that. And then in basically all of these, what we're going to be doing is extending from the blog base.html. So I have it already here in the about page. So let's collapse this directory tree. and put this line in all of these, since we're basically going to be extending from base.html for all of these. And whoops, that's the CSS file, so we don't need to put it there. Okay, so let's start off with probably the simplest page, which is going to be our about page. So in this about page, this is just an empty template, and you can really put whatever you want here. But we're going to add in a call to the content block. So we'll say content, and then we're going to end that block. We'll say end block. And then here you can just put whatever you want. Just keep things simple. We'll have an H1 heading and we'll say about this company or you can say about me depending if it's a personal blog. And then we'll say thanks for checking it out. And maybe you could put in a Jumbotron thing, etc. But what we're going to do is copy and paste this real quick and grab this block call. And now let me delete that end block. And I'm also going to paste that into all the rest of the HTMLs to set up the actual blocks. 
So we'll do that as well. Whoops. And that's because we're going to be using that in essentially every single HTML file, since that includes the nav bar itself. So we'll do that in all of these. Okay, so let me go across the board and save these. And the next one I'm going to work on is post list. Remember, post list is just the list view that lists out all the posts. So it should be pretty simple to work with. What we're going to do is after calling block content, I'm going to create a div tag here called center stage. And that's going to allow me to kind of center these a little more. And so over here in blog.css, I will create something as a new class called center stage, where anything inside this div with center stage, I'll call margin left to be auto to center it, as well as margin right. And you could also just call it margin auto, but this is kind of just to make it a little more clear what center stage is about. And hopefully the name is also pretty clear. But we'll have that. This isn't necessary. You don't need to do that. It'll just kind of be offset if you don't. And what we're going to do is have a for loop with Django template. So we'll say for post in. And remember the default is post list whenever you're working with a list view. It's that name of that model underscore list. And then whenever you have the for, you got to have the end for. And then what we're going to do is let's create another div and we'll have this be the class post in case we ever want to do anything with it and we'll say h1 have a link here and this is going to be a url in fact let's make sure it's a template tag the url and it'll take us to the post detail page with the pk primary key equal to post.pk and essentially what this is going to do is we'll add in the template injection here of post title. And this says, okay, if you are able to click on that post title, since it's an anchor tag, it's going to take you to that post detail where the primary key of that post detail is equal to post.pk, where post is being returned for post and post list. And then after that, let's create another div and we'll give this the date class. We may or may not use it, just kind of keeping us organized here. And then we'll have a paragraph that says published on, and then we're going to have the date. So we'll say post.published, and then I'm going to use some template filters. Remember, that's basically string functions or date time functions that are from Python, and you can use them with template injections. And I'm going to use date just for some formatting here. So I'll say capital D space M Y. And note the spacing here, you sometimes get errors if everything here isn't touching together. So there's no spaces here. And then finally, what I'm going to do is after that div, I'll create one more anchor tag that links to the comments. So we'll say here, URL, post underscore detail pk is equal to post.pk, essentially the exact same thing we wrote there. And then I'm going to say, have some comments. Whoops. Comments. And then what I'm going to do is inject the comment count. So we'll say post.approve underscore comments. And then what I can call off of that is the kind of count attribute or count method. So if you go back to the blog post, whoops, page, basically what this is saying is if I were to click where it says, oh, comments one or comments two, it would take me back to that post detail page, just like clicking the title would, which kind of makes sense because if I click on comments, I probably want to see the detail page that actually has the list of those comments. And that's it for the post list page. And this is essentially our homepage for the website. So we're all done with this now. So let's go ahead and pretend someone clicked on it, which would bring them over to the post detail page. And this is going to be from a detail view. So let's get started on this one. This one's going to be probably one of the more complicated views, or at least the view that has a lot of content with it. So we're going to create inside of this block an h1 tag, and we'll give it the class. We'll give it the class, uh, whoops, equal to. We'll say post title, and then we'll say loader here. So remember loader is that coloring class. So if you come back down here, loader, 
That way the actual colors change. And we'll show later on a kind of a quick fix to get everything to change color, especially the highlighting, which is essentially just coming back to the base.html. And over here, if you go to body, you could just call class and then say loader here, which is going to add a lot more coloring effect. Now be careful of this because you don't want to set everything to have like the background color. So make sure that this is set to color. Okay, coming back to the post detail page, after doing those changes, what I'm going to do is have the heading one be the title of the post. And then what I'm going to do is have an if statement that says if the post published date, I will say else, and then I'll have an end if just to kind of set up my logic. Okay, so what are we going to do if the post published date, meaning there's some sort of publication date, then I'll create some sort of class here, pass in date, the post date, and then I'm going to inject the post.publish date. Else, which means it's not published, what we're going to do is say else and have a button here. So this button is going to be, uh, we'll give it a class so it looks nicer. We'll say btn, btn default. Just one of those bootstrap classes. And what it's going to link to is a button that asks you, oh, do you want to publish this or not? Because if it doesn't have a publish date, meaning it didn't pass this if test, it hasn't been published yet. So what we're going to do is if you click on that publish button, it'll take you to URL to the post publish where your primary key is equal to the post primary key. And there we have it. And then we're going to end if. So let's save that. And then after that, once that little post title is done, or you have the publish button, what we're going to do is add in a paragraph here with the class equal to post content. And we'll be adding these classes to the CSS file later on. Some of them we won't use, some of them we will. I always think it's a good idea to kind of add in more classes than you may need. And then once you fill that the CSS and your website looks good, you can then go remove classes. But it's really helpful for organization to have these classes here whether or not you're going to use them right away. And what's going to be here is going to have the post title. And then we're going to have safe on it. And basically what safe does is since we're going to be using that medium JavaScript editor, if we select something as bold, we won't want it to show up, for instance, in the website looking like this, like, oh, bold text with the tags. So if I don't have safe here and I've affected it using the medium editor, it's going to look like this, including the tags. If I have safe, then it's going to translate that HTML to actually look like we expect it to look. And if that doesn't really make sense, you can basically just take off safe here, and that will immediately make sense as far as what I'm trying to convey. And then what we're going to do is call one more that says line breaks uh, br, which essentially, if there's a line break, the HTML will also call a break there. And then we're going to have another if statement that's going to check if the user is authenticated or not. So we'll say if user is authenticated, we're going to do some stuff. But as always, if there's an if, you got to end if. So let's create some new lines here. So if the user is authenticated, we should probably have something, or let's say two buttons, one to edit the post and one to remove the post. So the first line is going to be an anchor tag, and we'll give it a class. And the class is going to be a primary button. So say btn space btn primary. And then we'll say URL post underscore edit. And we'll pass in the primary key is equal to the post primary key again, just as we've done before. And then we're also going to insert inside of this an icon. So let's do that. We'll use a span tag for that. So we'll say span and we just have to give it a class. So the class we're gonna say is this glyph icon or glyph icon, depending how you pronounce it. And then another glyph icon 
pencil. So that's going to look like a little pencil. So in case you want to actually edit the post, you click on the pencil icon. And then I'm going to copy this, and let's do another one for removing the post. So instead of post edit, this will take you to post remove. And then instead of a pencil glyph icon, instead of, we're going to just say uh, remove, which is a little X. Okay, so that's all we need to do there. Let's continue on. So I'm going to kind of create a separator here. So we'll say, actually, yeah, we can do a horizontal break there, or a horizontal row. And then what we're going to say is have a class here, and let's have a button that allows us to add comments. So we'll say this is an href that takes you to the URL that is add comment to post with the primary key being equal to the post primary key. And let's actually give this a bootstrap class so it looks nice. We can say something like btn, btn primary, whoops, btn comments. So if we ever want to do stuff, we can add it to that. And then coming over to the right, we have add comment to post. And let's have some actual something in this link that says like add a comment. So we'll save that. And then I'm going to put everything else here inside of a container class. So everything that's left. And basically inside of this container is going to be the list of the comments. So we'll say for comment in post.comments.all. And because I have this, I want to end for. So let's add that in now. We'll say end for. And then after that, what we're going to do is, whoops, let me close that in. What we're going to end up doing is saying this. So for every comment in post.comments, I'm going to add in a break that we get a little bit of space. And then I'm going to check if the user is authenticated or if the comment is an approved comment. Otherwise, I don't really want to display it. So I'm going to say if the user is authenticated or the comment is an approved comment, going back with that model. And since I have an if statement, it's a good idea to just take care of the end if right now. I'm going to pass in the comment created date. So let's inject that in. Say comment dot created underscore date. And then what I'm going to do is say, if not comment approved, whoops, approved underscore comment, I'll have two buttons here one to remove the comment, and then one to approve the comment. And these are going to be really similar to what I have here. So I'm just going to copy and paste these. And let's line these up. So I need two end ifs. So here I have the end ifs, and I'm going to tab these in so they look a little more clear. And I'm going to paste this in. So let me give this one more here, and let's copy and paste this one more time. And then here we'll have remove, but instead of a post remove, it's going to be a comment remove. And instead of a post remove here, or actually we can just say this is comment remove instead. So I'll have the top one be comment remove. So comment remove PK is the comment primary key. And then this span class, we'll just have it be remove. So that stays the same. And we can have this be, instead of a primary button, a default button. And then the second one is going to be an approval. So instead of saying comment remove, I'm going to change this to say comment approve. So comment approve, and the PK does need to be the comments PK as well. And then the other one is going to have to be glyph icon. You can really choose any glyph icons you want, but we'll just say OK. All right, so that's our little if statement to kind of check if everything's okay as far as what buttons we show. And then below that, I'm going to actually add in the information with some paragraph tags where I will say, put in the actual text of the comments, pass it through safe in case they use any special HTML, and then say line breaks. 
so that we actually take care of new line breaks. And below that, we'll add in one more paragraph tag, where this paragraph tag is going to say who it's posted by. So posted by, and then I'm going to inject the comment author. And we can pass it in as bold if we want, but that's it. And then what we can do is, in between this end if and this end for, have a template tag to check if something's empty, meaning if there was nothing in the post comments at all, we'll just say, okay, empty, and then it's a nice easy tag call for if this is empty, what you can post. In this case, we'll say no comments. Okay, so this was definitely one of the most complicated views we had to do throughout the entire project. So let's quickly go over it. And if you want to actually reference any of this, I'd highly recommend that you kind of just copy and paste from the notes provided to make sure everything matches because there's a lot of stuff we could have possibly gotten wrong here. But essentially all we're doing is we're saying, okay, put in the post title. If the post has a publication date, start the post date and then actually place it, the publication date. Else, we're gonna have a button here that says, hey, do you wanna publish this? And then it'll take you to the post published page. After that, you have the actual post content, which you start off with just the post title, make sure it's safe and then have the line breaks. If the user's authenticated, they're gonna be able to edit the post or remove the post. So that's what this block of code's doing. Below that, we're gonna be able to add comments to the post. And in this case, we have this container for all the comments that are linked to that post because we have post.pk. If the user is authenticated or the comment's an approved comment, we're gonna show the creation date. If the comment is not an approved comment, so I'm logged in, I should still be able to see these comments, but they're not approved, I can either remove the comment or give it the okay that it's been approved. And then once that's done, we're gonna show the comment text, safe with line breaks, and then show who actually posted that comment. So that's actually all this post detail is doing. So lots of code, but the idea is pretty straightforward. Okay, we'll continue on with this in the next lecture where we go with the other templates. Thanks, and I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part nine of the blog clone project. We've already finished quite a few templates, such as the base.html, which is going to be extended to every other template, has the navbar, all the CSS and JavaScript calls. Then we also did the template view, that simple about.html page, where we just had two basic lines. We also did the post list, which is going to be the list of all the blog titles and the comments, etc., that acts as our homepage. And then once you click on one of those blog titles or the comments, it takes you to the post detail page, where that's the actual blog content. So let's now continue by filling out the rest of the templates. And we're going to start off by doing the post form. So if you ever want to edit or create a new post, you're going to be taken to the post form.html template. So that's where we'll start. And let's hop over to the editor and get started. Okay, here I have the post form.html ready to go. I have the extends and the block content plus the end block. And let's just put a header in here. We'll say heading one. And we'll say something like new post. And we're going to create a form here. So we'll call form, we'll give it a class post-form in case we ever want to have a class that does something with this. It doesn't really need an action because we're using Django for that. And then the method should be post. I always like having it in capital letters just because that makes it more clear to me. So I'll put that in. And then with any form, as we know, we need a CSRF token. So we shall say, whoops, CSRF underscore token. And then I'm going to inject the actual form dot as p and remember back in that form page we had that widgets attribute which is going to let me have classes to individual elements here so in case i never really need to use post form i already have the classes set up where i can actually grab particular elements or widgets from that form and then finally we're going to need a button so we'll create a button it'll be type submit so we can actually submit this and let's give it a class that kind of goes with the look and feel of bootstrap so we'll say Let's give it the save class in case we ever want to affect this particular button. And we'll say btn, btn default. So you probably notice I'm kind of creating classes as I go along with the templates. Some of these I'll use, some of these I won't ever use. But what's nice about these classes is if I ever need to actually do some CSS editing on this particular button, it already has its own class call, which I can add to more submit buttons. And what's also nice is just reading the template itself makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on with these classes, regardless if I use them or not. So let me collapse this directory tree, give ourselves a little more room. 
the name of this button, we actually don't need it to have a name, so I'll delete that. And let's just have this be save. And then that's the end of the form, just form, the token, and then the button itself. And here is where I'm going to call script. So you remember back to when we were exploring the medium editor GitHub page. I'm going to call script here and basically follow along with what they said. So you can check back on that video or on that demo page. But what they said to do is create this editor variable here on the page and then set it equal to a new medium editor object and then have it grab the editable or editable, however you would say that, and then save this. And remember that this dot editable class is attached here as a widget. So if you go back to the actual models or forms, so let's come back to models, or actually it was under forms, come back here, there it is. So here under post forms, remember we're added this in, this editable class for the text itself. So that's essentially what's going to help us link when we're working with the post form page right here, this medium editor. And whoops, had too many E's there. Okay, so save that and we should be good to go there. So that's our post form page. Now let's create a post draft list. So maybe you haven't published this yet, in which case you have the list of all your drafts. So this one's also gonna be quite simple. We're gonna have a for loop that's just going to go for the posts and then give some sort of creation date. So let's do that. We'll say for post in posts. And then we need an end for here. And for, and then what I'm going to do is add in a div. So we'll call this the post class. Again, may or may not use this, but kind of helps me read along here. We'll have a paragraph tag and give that, let's give that the class, I think we were calling them dates. And we'll say created. And then we're going to inject here post.created underscore date. And we've seen before, I can add in this template filter where we will say date. And let's just have it be uh, dm, whoops, dash y. Okay. And then what we're going to do next is let's have a heading one with an anchor tag where the href will take you to that actual post detail page. So we'll go URL post the detail with the primary key being equal to the post dot primary key. And this will just be the post title. So the post title will take you to that post detail page, which kind of makes sense. Collapsing that directory tree, get a little more room. And then we'll have the actual post text. So we'll inject that in as well. Post dot text. And I'm going to use another filter called truncate characters, which is just going to help this as far as formatting. Not necessary, but um, kind of up to you. So we'll have truncate chr chars 200. Okay, so that's it for the draft list. Basically what it's going to do is go through all the posts in the posts and then say when it was created and if you click on the link, it'll take you to the post detail page and it will truncate some characters so you don't see everything. So we'll save that. And now we have our post draft list ready to go. Let's start with this delete view. So we have this post confirm delete. That's actually really simple. Once you click on the delete view, there needs to be some sort of a success URL that will say, hey, do you actually want to delete this? So we'll create a form, very basic form. Uh, it doesn't need an action. And we actually don't even really need to give it a class. It's, it's essentially just a button here. And what we're going to do is inside this form, I'm going to create the CSRF token. Token. And then we'll just have something like, are you sure you want to delete question mark? And let's actually inject object here. So this is something that delete view does automatically. The object itself uh, has that name. Are you sure you want to delete it? as we saw before when we were working with class-based views, and then we'll have an input, and the type will be submit, and let's give it a class, and let's say btn, btn danger, which is always a good call when you're gonna do a delete view, have it be danger. Um, in our case, we won't be using this coloring, eventually the loader will overwrite that coloring, but yeah, for your more basic sites where you not have, we don't have such funky CSS calls with the color changing, a danger is a good call for these sort of delete buttons. 
Well, it doesn't need a name, but let's give it a value, something like confirm or delete or whatever you want. Save that. And that's it for the post confirm delete page. So really similar to what we've done in the past with delete views. So that's it for that. We have post form HTML ready to go. Comment form is something we haven't done yet. So that's going to be a really similar form to the draft or the post form, excuse me. And let's create H1. And this will be a new comment. And then what we're going to do is say form. And it, it, we can give it a class post form just so I can refer to it later. It doesn't need any sort of action call. And then what we're going to do here is give it a CSRF token. And then say form as P. Give it a button. And this button will say it's a submit type button. Doesn't need a name, but let's give it a class. We'll give it the save class that we did earlier. Let's say btn, btn default. And it doesn't need a name, so we'll take that out. But we will give it some text here that says something like post comment. And that can be the end of the form. And since I want the form it, or the comment form itself to have the same capabilities of the medium editor, I'll add in that script here as well. So kind of up to you whether you want the comments to have such flexibility, but just so we explore what's possible here, we're going to do the same thing. So we say the variable editor is equal to new medium editor, and then we'll adjust the class to be editable or editable. And then semicolon to end that. Okay, so let's open up all the templates and make sure we finished all of them. We have the about page ready to go. We have our base.html ready to go, comment forms ready, post confirm deletes ready, detail page in the post, draft list ready, post forms ready, post list is ready. And then we still have this login HTML that's also ready. Looks like we finished all our templates, so let's come over here to blog.css and finish just a couple of those CSS calls. This is basically totally optional, and this is where a lot of your personal choices will come into play as far as what you actually want the blog to look like. So don't worry too much about what we're going to be doing here. This is just so it lines up with the actual example code from the notes. So I've taken care of this tech font. That's the font that goes in that nav bar. We have big brand that just makes it a little larger. Center stage just kind of centers things a little bit more. And then we have the loader. So I'm going to create kind of, um, whoops, something that says here, color changer below comment that out and add in some of my own classes. So something we also did was this post date, which I'm going to say text align center. And some of the classes we made, we won't be calling here. So just keep that in mind. And then I'm also going to create a post title. So post title will give it the same font family as Russo one, but maybe make the, let's say font size a little bigger. So this is the actual title of the post, font family, Russo 1, and then let's make the post title like 3EM, just so it's quite a bit larger. And then we'll have it be text align center. So it's centered there. So that's the post title. And then for the actual post content itself, so I'll have a post content class. And then I'm going to give that the font family of, well, let's say that's Montserrat, and then I will add in a font size that makes it the same font size as the post detail view. There we go. That way when you're editing it or viewing it, it all is in the same size. And I believe we already did something called center stage up here, so that one's good. And something else we want to do, maybe have those uh, buttons. So I think we created one called BTN comment button. I'm going to add in position to be absolute, and we'll see if this actually affects, and we'll bring it all the way to the right. We have zero pixels. So that's just kind of the add comment button, shifting it all the way to the right, and we already have big brand ready to go, I believe, if we scroll up. Okay, big brand's ready to go. So we finished off the CSS and the, race, the rest of the templates, so we should be mostly good to go. We might need to do a quick review, do any uh, bug finding, but we finished basically like 99% of the site. Okay, so coming up next, we're going to kind of wrap everything up and see if everything worked, maybe debug a little bit. 
I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part 10 of the blog clone project. So now it's time to actually debug and get our project up and running by setting up the admin and doing the migration. So let's go ahead and finish off this project and make sure that everything's working correctly. I'm going to hop over to the editor now. Okay, here I am at the editor and the first thing I want to make sure that's set up is my admin.py file under blog. I haven't actually done the registrations yet. So what I'm going to do is say from whoops, blog dot models import post and comment and once are those ready to go I'm going to say admin site dot register and that should actually be a lowercase r so we will register post and then we're going to do the exact same thing admin site register and I'm going to register comment so save that and then I'm going to bring up my terminal and with the terminal here, what I'm going to do is cd into the blog project folder, and then let me cd into the my site folder. And this is where I should be able to call python manage.py, and I will call migrate. Let's see if that works for us. Make sure there's no errors. This may take a while if you haven't done it yet. And then the other thing we're gonna do after this is, okay, here we go, bingo, we have some bugs that we need to do. So it says right here, in line 28 class comment name model is not defined, which means we probably forgot to import something in the actual models. So let's come over here to models.py and make sure that's all fixed. So we'll come over here to this may be either in the forms or let's see, no, it's in the models.py file. Come to models.py. So it says model is not defined, meaning this should have been coming down here, models, plural. So I'm going to save that and let's run this again. And I'm kind of trying to show you realistically how you would actually go about doing these sort of debuggings. Okay, so this next bug that I got was an import error, no module name blogs. So all I have to do is scroll up and try to find out where was I trying to call blogs when I should have just been calling blog singular. And it looks like here in line 22 of my URLs under my site, I was calling blogs.urls. Easy enough, I just come back to urls.py, come over here and see where I was actually calling blogs. And actually, it's the wrong urls.py file. This one is the one I want. Scroll down, and it says blogs.url. That should be blog singular. Save that, no problem. And now let's try to run this again. And we're basically going to keep doing this until we fix out all these various bugs. Now, if you don't actually want to spend the time to go through this sort of more realistic debugging process, feel free to just copy and paste uh, all the text files from the actual notes. But this is kind of trying to show you what realistically would happen if we went about the project this way. Okay, so we have some invalid syntax. I probably forgot to close this off. So we'll say from blog, import views, and this is in the views.py file. I'm gonna hop over to that, views.py, and it looks like it's having issues with my syntax here, and it's because I forgot a comma. So save that, no problem. And we'll run python manage.py, and it needs to say your, oh, no migrations to apply, perfect. So let's actually check this out. We'll say python manage.py, and I'm going to say make migrations blog run that and it looks like it said create model comment create model post add field post comment perfect now I'm going to say python manage.py migrate again and it's going to apply those migrations to the blog perfect and now what I'm going to also do is say python create a or actually python manage.py create super if I can spell this right super user and then what I'm also going to do here is hit enter and we may have an issue. So it says, hint, it seems you set a fixed date as a default for this field. This may not be what you want right now. If you want to have the current blah, blah, you can actually ignore these for now. It's not a big deal given the way we're doing things. So what we're going to do is say username is Jose, email address, we can just do whatever, hello at gmail.com, password, I'll use test password. Password again, we'll say test password. And then the super user was created successfully. So let's see if we can actually get this project to run. We'll say python manage.py run server. And there it is. So time to kind of cross our fingers and make sure we actually get everything to work. I'm gonna copy that and let's bring in over the browser. Okay, so coming to the URL page, we see this no reverse match. 
And if it looks empty like this, where it says uh, no query set or when arguments are missing, zero patterns tried, this is a really common error when you're working with URL templates. And if you see here, it says error during template rendering, which kind of gives you a hint that it has to do with templates. And it's also in the template, and it's right here. If you kind of zoom in, let me do a couple of pluses here. It's under post list.html, error at line zero. And you notice that the very first line what we're doing is we're extending from base.html. So that's where we can look for this actual error. And this is something you're gonna see all the time, this sort of no reverse match, especially while you're starting out, which is why I kind of really want to show you how you can debug this on your own. So we'll come back to the editor over here. And what I'm going to do is here I have post list.html. I can double check to make sure my URLs are okay. And usually a common mistake is to kind of mess up these quotes right here or forget these quotes up here. And if you come back to base.html, these are all looking okay to me. What we can do at base.html is do control F and then look up URL and then explore which ones seem to be having the errors. So we see here we have this nav bar, so there's URLs in there and we can kind of find the culprit right here. URL post list looks like we forgot to put or I forgot to put in the quotes. So I will save that and now Let's kind of start this guy back up again. I'll do, well, actually, we can just probably come here and refresh this page, see if it works. And there it is, my blog about GitHub LinkedIn. So, so far, so good. We'll keep our fingers crossed, make sure everything's working. Hit that button, and bingo, have another error. It's a template syntax error, and it's happening at accounts login. So, thanks to Django, I kind of already have an idea where it's happening. It's happening at login.html. But even better, it says invalid block tag, that's a keyword, with form.asp. It says expected end block. And you might be thinking, well, that's weird. We never have to put an end block with a form. And then it says, did you forget to register or load this tag? Well, maybe I did, but that's weird because I wouldn't have an end block with a form as P. And if you scroll down, it actually highlights it for you. And this is where we can actually see the error we did. Here, we were using the wrong template tagging. Remember with form.sp, you just inject it. It's not an actual uh, code here with the percent sign. So coming back, to our login.html, what I actually should have done was have this sort of syntax, these double brackets, since I'm essentially just injecting that form in. So I'm going to save that, and now let's try this again. I'll come back, refresh the home page, and now it seems to be working if I hit the person. My username is Jose, and then let's input test password, login, see if we get an error. Okay, looks like I'm zoomed in right now, which is why you kind of get this weird behavior. But if you start zooming out, you see it uh, right align. So let's check this all out, see if it works. I'll hit a new post, see if we get an error. So far, so good. Jose, title of my post, test post, and let's type in some text. So we'll say something like, and we can see that the color changing is working. So this is a test. And if I highlight it, I can see that if I put in bold here, it's actually working. So let's save this, see if we get an error. Okay, looks like that's actually working, nice. Um, let's try editing it first. So it says, this is a test. I'm going to say add on edit, and I don't actually want this to be bold, so we'll say something like underline it without the bold, and then save that. Okay, so looks like we are not seeing the actual content of the post, so it just says test post. We'll have to check back on that, but let's see if we publish it, if we actually end up seeing that content. So I hit publish and nothing's happening. I'm not being redirected anywhere. Meaning if I come over to my blog, I don't see anything. So something has an issue when we're actually dealing with editing and posts. So let's come back here to drafts and bingo, we found the error. Okay, so now we see we have this field error at drafts and it says it cannot resolve keyword created date into field. Choices are author, author ID, comments, create date, etc. So this is actually quite an obvious error, hopefully. You can see here that somewhere along the lines, I started calling it created date instead of create date. So we have two options here. Either I change the model to have it say created date, or I change this keyword to say create date. It's up to you at this stage which way you should go. If you already have a bunch of stuff in your models, you've already created a bunch of blog posts, then you should probably affect the keyword here instead of the actual choices here. But what we're gonna do is kind of explore how we could fix this since we're just starting out. So I'll hop back over to this and I'm going to come to models.py to kind of confirm. Here I have create date and what it should have been is created date. So I could do that or the other thing I could have done is go back 
to the actual reference of create a date. So if I come over to drafts, whoops, let's expand this. So coming over to my post draft list, somewhere along the lines here, I said create a date instead of create date. So I would actually usually recommend that you fix this in the HTML template rather than coming over here and affecting your model. But since we're just starting out, I think it's better to kind of switch the model out. And that's also because this matches the notes. So I will save this and I'm going to control C here and migrate everything again since I affected the model. So we'll say Python manage.py migrate and it says uh, no migrations to apply. So I'm going to say Python manage.py make migrations and then call blog over and it said alter field so added this and it altered that so perfect so then we can also see it's affecting comments and if we come over to comments let's make sure that's working well so we see create date there and let's have that be also created date so we're kind of gonna fix that as well created date and I will save that and now let's actually run that same line again Okay, so it's altered that in the comments as well. So now I have created date on both of them. And I'm going to say Python manage.py migrate. And it's going to apply all those changes. Let's start off by actually saying Python manage.py run server and see if that works for us. And I'm going to refresh my drafts. And there it is, test post, perfect. So I come to my blog, I have nothing. Come to my drafts, looks like that's working. Hit test post and it looks like I still can't register what I'm actually adding here. So if I type some stuff here, you can see that the colors are changing. I can highlight stuff, uh, take away the underline. I can save it, but it's not actually showing the text. So somewhere along the line, I'm not injecting the text. So let's see if it works with comments. If I say add comment, let's put in a new author for this comment. So we'll say visitor, we'll type this text. So this is a comment text. I'm gonna post the comment. And it looks like I can see the text there. So let's approve this. So that comment's been approved, but I still can't see the test post. So even when I click publish, I can see that nothing's really happening. So I come back to my blog, drafts, something's wrong with that publish button. So let's go check it out back here. All right, so coming back to the post detail page, which is where I should be going to, if we check out our views again to review this, coming down, once you click publish somewhere, so here it is, once I click publish, it should be taking me to that post detail page. So something's up here. Let's go to that post detail page and see if we notice anything kind of fishy. So I'm going to get a little more room here. And you'll notice that I have this post content class and up here I'm calling the title, but over here in post content, I'm accidentally calling the title again. This should have been actually calling the content of that post, which makes sense. And the content of that post was the text. So let's type that in. We'll say text and save that and see if we can continue debugging this as I refresh. And now I see this is a test, add on edit, etc. So it looks like that actually worked. Let's see if hitting the publish button affects this. It still, I suspect, would not do anything. So there's publish. So we're not getting any sort of redirect on publish, but we figured out why I wasn't showing that actual text of the post. So let's figure out how we can connect this publish button to actually work. I'm gonna come back here and then let's check out the actual draft page or what the post detail page looks like. All right, so let's actually try to track down the source of that error. When you hit that publish button, nothing's really happening. So if we come back to the post detail view, I see here that the button I'm pressing is this one right here. Class has a button default. And then if you look at the href, it's taking us to post publish with the primary key equal to post.pk. So let's go ahead and review that post publish URL and see if there's the issue there. So I'll come over here to urls.py and Lo and behold, the very last one is the published one. Well, that's interesting. And it looks here that this is okay. It's gonna take you to post the primary key and then publish. The view is post publish, so that makes sense. And the name matches post publish. So that means the culprit might be at the view. Let's go over to the views.py file and explore that. So I'll come to views.py and then we'll scroll down until we actually get to that post publish view, that function view. And then here it is, it says login required post publish, it'll get object or 404, and then it's gonna call this method on that post object, the publish method, and then it's gonna redirect you back to the post detail. So, so far that actually kind of makes sense. So maybe the problem is not with the view, but with the model itself. And if you remember back when we first started this, Django tried to warn us about a time zone problem, and we're basically about to see why it was trying to warn us. So one thing here is that 
I'm calling the method but not executing it. So that's the main error we have is that I was not executing it. So I'm going to save that. And then I'm also going to, well, you can see immediately uh, fix that. But besides that, I also want to make sure that the post is OK. So I'm going to come back to models.py. And remember that Django was warning us about some sort of time zone issue. Well, we can see here that I was supposed to be actually calling publish instead of just, whoops, over on views.py assigning it. So we're actually calling it to execute now, which makes more sense. And coming back to models.py, another issue that Django was complaining about, which is a little hard to explain if you haven't seen it uh, often, is the issue of the date time field, the default being time zone dot now. I was actually calling it to execute, but what it really wants up here is just the function itself. So you don't execute it here inside of the date time field. So now I'm going to save that. And I will also save my post detail page. And let's try this again. I'm going to refresh. And then I'm going to hit publish. And whoops, looks like I need to log in again. So we'll say test password, hit login. And now we can see that the publish is gone. So if I go back to my blog, now I see the test post with the one comment. Perfect. So let's try this all again and make sure that it's actually working. I'll create a new post. It's going to be by me. And this we'll call, we'll call this last test post. And then we'll say, hello world, my site is functional. I'll hit save. Looks like it says, hello world, my site is functional. If I hit drafts, I should see it there. Last test post, perfect. And then if I add a comment, I should be able to do that. We already tested this out, but let's try this again. Some visitor, blah, 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 or whatever, post a comment. Here I can see it can either be removed or approved. And I'm going to try to publish this. And it looks like the publish is gone, and I get the publication date. Come to my blog, and I see last test post. Let's make sure I can actually remove and delete posts, see that there wasn't any issues with the delete views. I'm going to delete this post right here by pressing X. Perfect. Are you sure you want to? confirm that you want to delete this. Um, like I mentioned, maybe having loader on everything isn't a good idea since this is constantly changing colors, but we'll go ahead and confirm. And it looks like it deleted it, so my blog. And I can also click on About, make sure it takes me to that template view about this company. Thanks for checking it out. And let's make sure I can log out and still see everything. So if I log out, hit my blog, hit Test Post, everything's functional. And it looks like we were able to successfully uh, get rid of all the errors and troubleshoot this thing. And that was more or less a realistic experience of what it would be like debugging this stuff. I think the hardest thing as far as this particular debugging call was this one right here, where we come to models and fix this time zone dot now. In fact, we haven't even migrated that change yet, so it hasn't taken place. But that's the only one where you really have to have experience to understand that you wanted to just pass in the function itself instead of calling the function. So to fix that again, what you'd have to do is come over here and then call python manage.py migrate again. So We'll do that before we actually host the website on some sort of server. OK, thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the basics of the project. And I hope this gave you some ideas of how you can create your own blog. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome to your next social clone project. In this project, we're going to be taking bits and pieces from other social sites to build out our own platform. And our site is basically going to be a social outer space fan community site. So people who are big fans of things that have to do with outer space can come here and be part of the site. This clone project also takes full advantage of some of Django's 1.11's newest features, such as login view and logout view. So the basic idea of the site is that users can create groups on various topics that have to do with outer space, things like SpaceX, NASA, Pluto, etc. They can then create posts inside those groups, and they can also leave and join other groups. Let's discuss a few of the key features. So as I mentioned, there are groups in this website similar to things like subreddits, except we're just calling them groups. There's also multiple users and authorizations, just like any social media site or social network site. There's also posts inside the group, similar to posting a tweet. We're also going to be linking user profiles with an at symbol. So if you ever see a username somewhere, there's a little at symbol attached to it. You can click on that symbol and then go straight to their profile. And there's also multiple applications, unlike the previous clone project. Let's take a quick peek at the actual project. And remember, you can download the zip file in this lecture as a resource, which has all the code that we're going to be needing for this project. Let's jump to the browser and check out the project. All right, this is what the website actually looks like. It's called Star Social. 
and let's say it's the best community for all things on outer space. And one of the funny little features of it is with JavaScript and CSS, we can create stars and let them bounce around, etc. So the main idea is that we could sign up as a new user, and then we get this sign up page. So we have our display name. So we'll call this spacefan1 as our display name. Let's just give this an email address of hello at Gmail, and then we'll say test password, and we need to confirm our password. So we'll say test password. Hopefully I didn't mess that up. There we go. And now let's log in. So we'll say spacefan1 and my test password, log in. And it says now I'm logged in, go to groups. So I'll select go to groups and I can see there's some groups already created here for me. So I can create a new group and then it will tell me to create a new group. So we'll give this group uh, something that says like NASA rocks and then we'll say people who like NASA. So we'll create that group. So we can then join the group. So it has no members right now. So we'll join the group and now we can see it has a member count of one. So there's no posts in this group yet. Now you can notice that we have a post button, a group button and a create group button. We'll hit on groups and now we can see in the group list we have my new group, NASA rocks and then the second group. So what we can end up doing is posting to any of these. So if I click on post, it allows me to do a new message. So I'll say first post in NASA exclamation point and then I'll choose this NASA rocks group hit post and then I can see here I'm not super zoomed in but hopefully you can see this I'll zoom in a little more that I have the first post in NASA space fan and I can see at space fan one so I have this little at symbol I have the time I posted and in NASA rocks and if I hit on at space fan one there's my post history at space fan one and it's basically since I only have one post there it is and I can also delete posts so I can hit delete here it says, are you sure you want to delete this post? I can either confirm the delete or cancel it. So I'll just confirm that delete, etc. And now it takes me back to just a list of all the posts currently available for me. So again, hit groups. I can see members. I can join other groups, etc. All right. There's a lot to this project, even though it seems pretty simple. On the back end, there's a lot going on. But it's going to feel like a natural extension of our blog project. So let's discuss various things to know about this project and how to approach it. I'll hop back to the presentation slides now. So as I previously mentioned, you can download the zip files in this lecture for all of the code. And this project workflow will also be a bit different than the previous project. We're going to be focusing on a more realistic development process where we build out applications one by one versus the previous project where we kind of built all the views first and then all the templates, etc. We're actually going to focus on applications one at a time. And this approach we take here is definitely going to be more realistic, but by its nature, it's also going to contain a lot more debugging, especially because some applications depend on other applications. And while debugging isn't very fun when first learning a concept, by now you've learned enough that you should feel really comfortable enough to debug often. So keep that in mind as you approach these videos, you're going to see us debugging a lot, but it's definitely part of a realistic development process. Okay. Another note is that we're also going to be using some outside libraries. So keep this in mind if you happen to just immediately run the file that's in the resource for this lecture. If you don't have the right modules installed, you may get something that says no module named, etc. Then these can be easily fixed with just a simple pip install in your environment or in your virtual environment. And we'll do this in the video lectures as well as you run into those modules. So keep that in mind. If you get something that says maybe no module named bootstrap three, then you may have to install bootstrap three. Okay, this project is also specifically designed to feel like an extension of the previous blog clone project. And what I really want to kind of get across here is thinking of social media websites as extensions of simple blogs will really help your understanding as far as building a social media website with Django. So remember that we created a text blog for a single user, really similar to medium.com if it was just a simple single user blog site. And what we're going to try to do is expand this concept of a blog site to an actual social media site by simply expanding to multiple users. So let's think of this in some examples. Instagram, you could technically think of as just a photo blog with multiple users. Twitter is literally just a micro blog service with again, multiple users. YouTube is just a video blog service with multiple users. Don't be fooled however, it does take a lot more work than I'm kind of throwing out here to build sites like these, especially at scale, but the basic premise is the same. We can expand the idea of a single blog for a single user, attach multiple users to it, and now we're dealing with a social media network, especially with things like Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube, where they're especially focused on a particular type of post or blog. 
Okay, so these ideas are still there. More importantly, you now have awesome Django skills and we're gonna learn even more. So let's get started building out our site of Social Star Network. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Social Clone Project. What we're going to be doing here in part one is beginning by building out our basic setup for the project. That is the basic directories and just the basic structure for our code. We're also going to be giving you a quick tour of how you can customize your own Atom environment. You'll notice that as we actually code out through this second clone project, our environment is going to look a little different style-wise, such as the UI or the color scheme, versus the previous project. So I'm going to show you how you can set up and customize your own Atom environment. Okay, let's hop over to Atom and get started. All right, here I am at my Atom text editor, and you'll notice that for one thing, I'm actually going on this with a Mac operating system. So it's going to look a little different. But the other thing you may notice is the actual uh, color scheme and the theme looks a little different. So I want to actually describe how you can do this on any system. What you need to do is go to settings, or if you're on a Mac, preferences. So just open up the preferences or settings, or just restart Atom, and usually you'll see a link to the settings, and that looks like this. This is basically the same page where we are actually installing packages. And if you come over here to where it says themes, you basically have uh, two things you can really edit. It's the syntax theme and the UI theme. The UI theme, that styles the tabs, the status bar, tree view, drop downs, etc. And you can actually install themes that people create. So there's a ton of community themes here that you can uh, look at. Or when you actually click over here on install, you can search for themes. So click on themes and then take a look and search around for different themes that you may be familiar with if you've worked with other IDEs. Or you can just look at the featured theme packages. Coming back to themes, so here I have this uh, SETI or SETI theme. Uh, that's one of my favorites to work with. And then you can click here on this little settings tool and you can edit the UI theme further to your liking. And you can also select the syntax theme here to actually select the syntax. So if you like a light background or a dark background, whatever sort of color scheme you like, you can select that as well. And always you can click here on the settings icon and then style that a little more. If you want to further style the Atom text editor, you can click here on style sheet. And using your new CSS skills, you can actually do different stylings on this actual Atom text editor. So you can edit the background color of the tree view, uh, the text editor, edit that background color, etc. So go ahead and play around with that. I'm going to leave uh, the settings I have right now and get started with the actual project. So I've already created a project folder called Simple Clone. And inside of this, I'm going to start my command line tool to actually create the project. So we will say Django-admin. And then I will say start project, and I'm just going to call it simple social, and then hit enter. You can call it star social or whatever you want. And you'll notice now I have the simple social, so there's simple social, and then I have my settings, URLs, etc. So that's looking good. And the last thing I want to do is inside of this, I'm also going to start an application. So I will say cd into simple social, and then list here so I can see my manage.py and my main project file or folder, simple social. And then I'm going to say Django admin. You can also do this with manage.py if you wanted to. Start app. And we're going to start off with the accounts application. So that's really the main application we're going to be focusing on at first. And then later on, we'll add things like posts, groups, etc. So I'm going to start the accounts application. And there we go. We have it right here. So that's good to go. And what I'm going to do is add in a couple more directories that we're going to be needing along the way. We won't deal with all of them right now, but we will might as well create them. So underneath simple social, I will create a templates directory. So a new folder, templates. And if you wanted to, you could also do this straight from the command line. So there's my templates directory. And I'm going to leave those as empty templates that I can later use for the main project page. Things like my base.html or my index.html or even a thank you page. Then the next thing I'm going to do is set up my static folder. So I will say static for my folder. Sometimes people also call this assets. And then what I'm also going to do is set up a couple folders in here. So I'm going to set up a simple social. So let's click on static, create a new folder, and set up inside of static. Whoops, let's try that again. New folder, simple social. Hit enter and then expand static. And there I see simple social. And inside of that, I'm going to create two new folders called CSS for all my CSS files. And then new folder in there called JS for all my JavaScript files. And maybe if you want some top level CSS, sometimes what some people do is inside of static, just at the very top level, they'll say CSS. And then inside of this, they'll have some sort of master CSS file. 
So you can say new file and call this master.css. So I'll do that as well, just so everything matches along with the actual project notes. Okay, so now that we have all that, what I'm going to do is just set up my settings.py file inside of the simple social app to match everything so we can be ready to go when we're actually working with accounts. So open up the settings.py file. And what we're going to do is add in just the usual that we've been doing, plus a couple more lines of code. So the first thing I want to do is right at the top where it says base directory, and I'm going to actually collapse my tree now so I get a little more room to work with. I will say template underscore directory is equal to os.path join, and I'm going to join the base directory with templates. There we go. So now that's ready to go. And then the next thing I'm going to do is scroll down to where it says installed apps. And what I'm going to do is add in accounts. Now I'm just going to add only accounts for now. There's still a lot more stuff we have to add in, such as groups, posts. And we're also going to add in something called Humanize and Bootstrap 3. But we'll talk about those when we actually end up using them. So for right now, I'll just put in accounts there. And then I'm going to keep scrolling down to where it says templates. So that list, as always, we come over to the directories and add in that template dir that we just created. So then scroll down and save that. And then all the way at the bottom, if I scroll all the way down, what I'm going to do is right underneath static URL, I'm also going to add my static files, whoops, files underscore dir. So the directory for my static files, and that's going to just be, I'll put that in as a list, os path join, and that's going to be base directory joined with the word static, just so it matches up what I have. Now, some people like to put the static files directory all the way at, to, at the top here with the other directories. I personally like putting it down here because this is kind of where Django by default indicates where static files should go. So again, the only things I added right now were these static files coming all the way back up. I also added in the template directory and then I added in my accounts installed applications. So now that we have that, I'm going to kind of expand my command line here. Let me clear it. If you are on Windows, that will be CLS. Since I'm on Mac, that's just going to be clear. I'll zoom in just a little bit so you guys can see a better idea of what I'm going to be typing here. And I'm going to say python manage.py migrate. I'll hit enter. And that's going to do all the initial migrations. And then I'll say python manage.py make migrations for my accounts. I'll hit enter there. And it said no change to detect an app account. Perfect. So then I'll say python manage.py migrate, and we should see no migrations to apply. Okay, let's confirm that we just did everything right by saying python manage.py, run server, I'll hit enter, and it should be running now. So let me open this up, I'll copy and paste this. And now bringing in my actual Chrome browser, or whatever browser you happen to be using, at that link, it worked, congratulations on your first Django powered page. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show for this initial part one. In the next lecture, we're going to dive much deeper into setting up accounts for our actual little simple social clone site. So right now, you should be able to have the Django-powered web page working and your settings.py file, as well as the other directories, set up the same way we did. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome back, everyone, to part two of the social clone project. Now that we have the very basic setup, let's dive in into actually creating account functionality for our website. And as we're doing that, we're also going to begin to set up some basic template HTML files, things like our base HTML file and the index HTML file for the home page. All right, let's hop over to the Atom text editor and get started. Okay, here I am at Atom, and what we're going to start off doing is creating some basic template files that we know we're always going to be using, such as a base template and a home page template. That means I will come over to templates and I'm going to create a new file under my templates directory. That's the top level. I will create a base HTML file. That's where our actual base templates is going to go. And then I will also create a new file here called index.html for our actual home page. And then what I'm going to do here is type HTML and I will just set up some very basic home page. So let's just say something like here in our actual body. Let's create a heading one and say something like Welcome to star social exclamation point. And then right at the top of this, what I can do is I know I'm already going to be extending from base.html. So let's do that as well. So I'll say extends from base.html. And then I will also put uh, the, actually, since I know I'm extending from base.html, I'll put everything inside a block. So lastly, 
Let's get rid of all this. Since I know I'm going to have a content block, I'll say block and then content, and I'll put welcome to star social inside of this content block. Now that I have that, that actually means I need to go back to my HTML file or base.html file and set up a few things there. Since I'm going to be extending from base.html, I need to make sure that this is actually kind of a normal looking HTML file. So I'll keep that right now. And then inside the body, what I'm going to do is set up that actual block. So we'll say block, and then it's called content. So I will save that for now. There's still a lot more we can add in here that we are going to add in, such as a navigation bar, links to CSS, etc. But for right now, we'll keep it simple, and we'll just keep it as it is right now. So that's all I want to do for base.html. And in order to actually connect the base HTML and the index HTML to my actual web application or website, what I need to do is come over to urls.py under simple social and under this I'm also going to create a new file called views.py and basically we'll create a really simple view for our home page and then link it to the URLs for the entire page. So I'm going to say from django.views.generic import and I will import the template view that way I can just return back that template view. So we'll say class home page and this is going to inherit from template view. And then I'm just going to say, whoops, template name. My template name is equal to index.html. You can see I have a lot of autocomplete help there because I'm using a Django plugin package for Atom. So let me save that. I have home page, template name, index.html. That's looking good. And now I need to come over to urls.py and make sure that I actually link it here. So let's scroll down and then I will say not just URL, but also include from django.conf for configuration.urls and then I'm also saying from dot import views. So that just says go to the current directory which is simple social and then grab views from there. Let's add it in to our URL patterns. I will say URL and then using regular expressions I will say r uh, hat or caret dollar sign basically the home page so when someone just goes to your local host uh, whatever it happens to be the very first home page is going to be view, whoops, views dot home page. And remember for class based views, we need to say as view. So call that method off of it. And then I will assign this name home. Okay, save that. There's still a lot more to add to this, but let's just make sure that we actually made that connection correctly. And if not, we can debug. I will run the server and now let's hop over, slide. Refresh this, and now it says welcome to Start Social. Great, so we linked up our home page. Uh, that should have been pretty straightforward given everything that we've already learned so far in this course. Now let's actually jump over and start with our ad or accounts application. So I will come over to accounts. Let me close these so we don't get confused on anything. So now everything I'm doing is over on accounts. And under models.py, I want to create a simple model for accounts. And I'm actually going to use uh, Django's built-in uh, models for this. Okay, now inside this models.py file, what I'm going to do is import from Django.contrib import AUTH for authorization. So a lot of these authorization tools for accounts, they're actually built into Django. That way we don't have to mess around creating our own uh, models for users, etc. So I'm just going to say class user, and I'm going to inherit from authmodels.user and then I'm also going to inherit from authmodels.permissions mixin. And then inside of this class, I'm just going to have a very simple string representation of the object. And what I'm going to do here is say, if you want the string representation of a user, do the following. I will say at, such as the at symbol, kind of like a Twitter handle. And then using the format expression, I'm going to say self username. Now you may be wondering, well, where's username? Where is that defined? So that's actually an attribute that comes built in with dot user. So auth.models.user has the main attributes and you check out, you can check out the documentation for more information on this, but basically it comes with what you would expect it to come with. It has a first name, last name, email, username, um, and then maybe one more field. But what we're going to do is use this to automatically set up a form so that when someone is signing up for our actual website to become a user on it, uh, 
Django is essentially going to take care of all that on the back end for us. So let me save that. And then let's continue on by creating a view for this. So I'm going to create a view and we're going to need to connect this to a form later on. But I will do the following. I will say from Django, oops, Django dot core dot URL resolvers import reverse lazy. So reverse lazy, remember we're using that in case uh, someone is logged in or logged out where they should actually go. And then I will say from dot import forms. So what I'm going to do is now that I have forms here, I will create a forms.py file that will connect my forms for logging in or signing up to this actual views. So before I continue here, I will say just class sign up and this is going to be a create view, which means I need to import that. We'll say from django.views.generic import a create view. So this is for creating a new user. And then here I'm just going to say pass because I want to deal with my forms file first. So inside of accounts, I'll say new file and then I'll create a forms.py file. And now let's kind of create the forms for signing up. So this is actually again going to be uh, relatively straightforward given that Django is kind of doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us, which is a, kind of the whole point of Django that it does all this stuff right out of the box. It comes batteries included. So a couple things I need to import here from Django.contrib.off import get user model. So that returns the user model that's currently active in this project. And then I will say from Django.contrib.auth.forms import and then I'm going to import a user creation form. So as you can see, there's already a user creation form built into authorization package. So a lot of the stuff we're going to be using just comes from this particular uh, package, which also has excellent documentation. So again, basically the documentation page shows you how to create uh, user accounts, admin accounts, etc. It has a whole, uh, basically huge page that goes through an entire process of doing this. So if you ever get confused on this or want some more reference, check out the documentation. It's actually really good for this. So I will say django.contrib from forms, import a user creation form. This is essentially going to be kind of a sign up page. So when someone wants to create a user and then I will say user create form and I will inherit from the user creation form. What you want to be careful of is make sure that your class that's inheriting from this user creation form is not the exact same name as user creation form. So note here I say user create form and then user creation form. We could also say this as user sign up form, etc. But you don't want these to share the exact same name. Otherwise, sometimes Python will have an error with a self-reference call like that. So we'll say colon here, and I'm going to create my meta class, which we've actually kind of seen before. Remember, I can call the fields attribute inside of this and then put a tuple of fields. Now, these fields are actually already available for me uh, from contrib.auth. So the fields that I'm going to have a user fill out is their username, their email, and then password, whoops, let me put that in as a string. Password one, and then also as a string, password two. So that comes with the authorization user model, and it's basically just to confirm your password. So put in your password once, and then confirm it with password two. So those are the fields I want someone to put in. You could add more fields if you wanted to, but right now we'll just keep those basic default fields from authorization. And then this is kind of the most important part. We say model is equal to get user model, which allows us to use right here to get the current model of who's ever accessing that website. And then we will say diff init, and we're going to initialize this with self args keyword arguments. And this is essentially where I wouldn't expect you to memorize this, but instead reference the documentation for this particular thing. So what I'm going to do here, say create super and then initialize that with args and keyword arguments. And then here we'll just say self.fields username dot label is equal to oops display name. So what is this actually doing? 
Well, basically what's going to happen is when the user comes in and they're ready to sign up, we're going to call user creation form from authorization.forms, and then we set up the meta class basically saying, okay, these are the fields that I want a user to be able to access when they're signing up. So whenever we're connecting to our models or database, this is what they're going to have access to, the username, the email, and then set up and confirm their password. Now, if I actually want labels on that form in that template, what I can do is here under the init, after calling this uh, super class, what you end up doing is saying self.fields, almost like a dictionary, username, dot label, and then you can set up the label for that actual field. So that's the same thing as setting up a label um, on a form HTML page, except here we're going to set it from the actual forms.py view. And then finally, I want self.fields um, email label, I will say, let's just call that email address. So as a, quick, as a quick note, you don't really need to do this. This is kind of just for your own customization labels in case you had a specific thing that you wanted to show. So for example, let's say you're trying to make a Twitter clone. Maybe instead of username, you could say something here, such as display name, say something like Twitter account handle or et cetera. Um, if you are doing something that's kind of specific or customized to your website where you don't want a username just to say username, you instead want it to say my Twitter account handle, on the actual form, that way when the user is using your website, they have a better understanding of what username will actually stand for. This is where you would actually you know, do that. You would say self.fields, access whatever field you wanted to that's available to you in .forms. Uh, usually it's just your first name, last name, username, email, and password. And then you call .label attribute off of that, and then set it as your display name. So that's actually all we need to do here in forms.py. And now that we have that ready to go, we can come back to views.py and set that up. So I'll come back to views.py over here, and now instead of saying pass, let's start filling this in. So this is going to take a form class, uh, class object attribute, and it's just going to be forms.userCreateForm. And note here, I'm not instantiating the class, so I won't put parentheses, I'll just leave it like that. So my form class is actually equal to this form class, just setting this attribute equal to that class that we just created. And then I'm going to have a success URL be equal to reverse lazy, and then I'll say login. So what does that actually mean? It means once someone has signed up for our actual website, then in, on a successful sign up, I will reverse them back to the login page. But remember it's reverse lazy because I don't want this to actually execute until they've hit submit on that sign up button. Otherwise, if it was just a normal reverse, it would kind of automatically reverse without letting them sign up. That's why I have reverse lazy there. And then I need to finally say the template name for this. So the template name is going to be equal to accounts slash signup.html. So let me save that. And now let's actually work with templates on our uh, accounts. So underneath the accounts folder, I'm going to create a new folder called templates. Let's make sure that's there. So templates. And then under that, remember we kind of follow this app templates app directory scheme. So under templates, I will create something called accounts, a directory there. And then finally under here is where I'm going to have two template files, a login.html template and a signup.html template. So we'll say new file, login.html, and then we'll say new file, signup.html. Okay. So that's it for now. In the next section, or next lecture, I should say, what we're going to do is kind of keep continuing filling out these HTML files and then connecting the views to URLs. But let's quickly go over what we just did. So over here in accounts, what we ended up doing was from models.py inside the accounts, we basically created this really simple user model. Technically, it's not that simple. Our job is simple. Uh, the heavy lifting is being done by Django by just importing these two things models.user and models.permission mixin. And then what we're also doing is coming over to views.py and creating a very simple sign up create view. That's essentially creating a new user. And then we need to connect that to a user create form. So we create a new file called forms.py and we use this user create form. And then you also notice that we kind of set up our own custom labels for the username and email. These are technically not mandatory. You don't have to set up your own custom labels, but in case you ever needed to do that, that's how you can do it. All right. Coming up next, we're going to kind of mess around for urls.py, make the connections, and also set up these login and sign up.html templates. Okay, 
Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture where we continue working with accounts. Welcome back everyone to part three of the Social Clone Project. Now we're going to continue with the accounts application, and what we're going to do now is focus on setting up our template HTML files for the login page, the sign up page, as well as connecting that to our actual index page with a navigation bar. Let's get started and hop over to the Atom Text Editor. All right, here I am at the Atom Text Editor. Now before we get started, what we're going to be doing is installing a library called Bootstrap 3 for Django or Django-Bootstrap 3. And what this library does is it formats uh, forms in a really nice way using Bootstrap. So go ahead and in your virtual environment or even in your default if you're not using a virtual environment, say pip install Django-Bootstrap 3. Whoops. And then hit enter and let that install. Now I actually already have it, so it just said all packages uh, meet the requirements, already satisfied. But for you, inside your virtual environment, again, say pip install Django-Bootstrap 3. So that's something we're going to be using throughout the project to actually just make the forms uh, look a little nicer. Now once you've done that, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, clear that. Come over to your settings.py file, and in your settings.py file, scroll all the way down to where it says installed apps, and here what we're going to say is uh, bootstrap 3, and then comma. So again, pip install bootstrap 3 and then add it to your installed applications. And we'll show you in a little bit how to use it. It's essentially just the two lines of code. You load it in and then when you call form, say bootstrap form right before it and it will actually make it look a lot nicer in your application. Okay, let's come back to our accounts templates in login.html and signup.html. We're going to start off with the signup.html and it's actually going to look really similar to the login.html. So in the signup page, what I'm going to do is say extends, and I'm going to extend from base.html, which we're going to work with at the very end of this. And then the other thing I'm going to do is load bootstrap3, which is the library I just installed. So extend from base.html that we created earlier, and then load bootstrap3. And then what we're going to do is call block content, so that content block, and then I'm going to create a div of the container class. Inside of this, I'll have a heading one saying sign up, and then I will call a form. So inside of this form, I'm just going to, I won't have it have a class or even an action because the action is going to be taken care of by Django, and the method should be post. And I always like capitalizing it. It works the same if it's not capitalized, but that's just for readability for me. And inside of this, we always need our token. So you can start typing in CSRF underscore token inside a token call like that. And then the last thing we're going to do is create a form. And once you have Bootstrap 3 installed, what you're going to say is bootstrap underscore form space form. And that's going to allow us to actually make this form look a lot nicer using Bootstrap on our web page. And that's how you use Bootstrap 3. You can check out the documentation links for it, but essentially that's the way we're going to be using it for our project. And then after that, um, inside this form, we're going to have an input button. It's going to be type submit. I'll give it a value of uh, sign up. So that's what it says in the actual button. And then it won't have a name, but we will give it a class. Let's give it a class btn, btn-default, and save that. Okay, then I'm going to select all of this with control A, and then copy it, and bring over my login.html file, and I'm going to copy and paste this, because essentially we're going to be doing uh, something really similar here. So I am again going to extend from the base.html, bootstrap3, block content, container, but instead of sign up, this is now going to say login, and then save that, and then the value over here is going to be login. And then I'm going to save that. Okay, perfect. Now let's go ahead and set up our views.py file and our urls.py file and the connection between them. So coming over to views.py, again, this is all under accounts. You should already have this from the previous lecture, just this uh, sign up create view. Then go over to urls.py, which if we haven't created yet, what we need to do is create it. So underneath accounts, say new file, urls.py. So inside this new file, urls.py, hit enter. And now here, we're going to import a couple things. I'm going to say from 
django.configuration.urls import URL and then I will say from django.contrib.auth authorization import views as off underscore views. Now the reason we're doing this is make sure you have Django 1.11 at least to do this but Django 1.11 introduced a login view and a logout view so we actually don't have to take care of those in our views.py file anymore. Previously what we had to do is inside of views.py create a login view and a logout view. Now Django 1.11 has taken care of that for us and that's located under the contrib.auth views. So I'm going to say import views as authorization views or auth underscore views so I don't mix it up with my original views which is here. So I'm saying now from dot import views. So this is going to line number three is going to import my own views.py file and so I don't mix uh, the authorization views I'm going to import as authorization views. And now let's set up our app name. So I will call this app name accounts. That way in case I ever want to use URL templates in my base.html file, for example at the navigation bar, I can just refer to it as the accounts application. And then we'll set up our URL patterns list. So inside a list I will say URL and then using regular expression I'm going to say login. And now this is where we're going to use that new Django 1.11 feature. I will say auth underscore views dot and then the login view is the actual view and I will say as view and that's the new login view feature of Django 1.11. And then inside of that I'm actually going to connect it to the template name. So inside of login view as view I can say template name is equal to and whoops let me undo that. That's going to be a string and I'll zoom out just a little bit and collapse this so we can see the whole thing. It's going to be accounts slash login dot html and I'm going to give it the name equal to login. And that's going to be for URL templates in the future. And if you want you can separate that separate this out into more than one line. Here I'm just writing it in one giant line um, but you could just break this up into multiple lines as so. All right. So again, this is our login URL. We connect it to login. We call login view from this authorization views as view and then pass in the template we want to connect it to, in this case login.html, and give it the name login for future URL templates. Then a comma here for our next URL. And that's going to be uh, pretty similar, except it's going to be logout. So I will say regular expression, logout, dollar sign, and then I want authorization views and now I'm going to ask for the logout view as a view and set the name equal to logout. And then finally I will have the sign up view. So that'll be URL sign up view right there. And then from my views file I'll say views dot the sign up view I created as a view and then I will say name is equal to, and I'll just call this sign up. Okay, and now our urls.py file inside of our accounts application is ready. And just to quickly review what we just did here, we're already familiar with importing URLs. Again, I'm importing contrib.auth.views as authorization views so I don't mix it up with my own views.py file, and that's going to allow me to use these new features of Django 1.11, login view and logout view. As a quick note, for login view, you had to connect it to your template name. For logout view, it has a default view that we can use, so that's what we're going to do. We'll say logout view as view and name logout, and that will essentially go back to the home page once you logged out. And then our sign up, we already have that connected, so we'll say sign up as view, name sign up. And that's all we have to do for our urls.py file. Okay, now the next step is to actually connect our accounts application to our full project using views and URLs. So let's open up our tree and come back to simplesocial.py and then we're going to connect it via URLs. So right now I'm in the main project urls.py file and let's fill this in so it actually connects to the login pages for the accounts. What we're going to do is over here I will say URL, so create a new URL and using regular expressions, what we're going to do is say accounts forward slash, and then we will say include, and I'm going to include 
include accounts URLs. So that URLs file we just made and then give it the namespace. Oops, and this actually should go inside include. I will give it the namespace and let's just say accounts here, comma, and then save that. And then the other thing I'm going to do is say our accounts slash, and I'm going to include Django dash contrib dash or dot auth dot urls. Okay, and then comma, and we're going to leave that as is. And that should be it for the actual URLs file for connecting to the accounts. So essentially what this is doing is it's connecting the accounts main space to accounts.urls. That way if someone has login or sign up, that connects directly to urls.py file that we just created in the accounts application. Now this django.contrib.auth.urls, that's going to allow us to connect everything that Django has under the hood for authorization. So you'll notice that if we hit over on admin, dot pi under accounts, we actually don't really need to register any models here because we're using Django's built-in uh, users model. So we don't really need to register anything with the admin. Remember with uh, users, that was already included whenever you log into your admin page. So we're just using what Django has already nicely provided for us. Now let's jump over to our base.html file. So base.html all the way under our main templates. And essentially what I'm going to be doing is copying and pasting from the notes themselves and explaining each copy and paste. So the first thing I want to do is let's just give this the title of star social, save that. And then underneath or inside of this head, I should say, and underneath that title, I'm going to be copying and pasting some links. So the first one I'm going to copy and paste is just bootstrap itself. So let's put that in. So there's the giant link for the style sheet to bootstrap. The next one I'm going to do is the optional theme that goes with Bootstrap. So I'm going to copy and paste that as well. You can copy and paste this either from the Bootstrap site or from the notes themselves. I'd recommend the notes just so we make sure we're all using the same version or on the same page. And then finally, I'm going to copy and paste the JavaScript line. That's again also from the Bootstrap. Okay, so those are my three Bootstrap links. The other thing I'm going to do is copy and paste a link to a style. So the style sheet that I'm going to be linking to is our own style sheet, but also Google Fonts API. So we're going to be using this font from the Google APIs. So as we've seen before, I'm just going to link that up in the head and I'm going to link the master CSS file. So let's do that as well. Underneath this, I'm going to link to the master CSS. Now what's important to note is how I'm actually linking this. You remember that we created a CSS uh, folder underneath our templates folder. And then underneath that, I created a master CSS file and I'm going to link it using this static call. So wherever we say that load static, I'm going to be able to connect this. So we just say style sheet href, and this is probably the most important line here as far as getting everything connected. We'll say static, which means go look in the static directory that we set up in the settings.py file and then go to simple social CSS and then master CSS to actually link everything. Okay, now underneath the body, outside of the block, I want my actual navigation bar. So let's actually build this together. I will say nav, and there's my nav, and in my nav I will say class, and I will give this a nav bar, my nav, and then we can actually just give it the default uh, role. So we'll say this is role navigation. You can, I'm basically just, uh, this is copy and pasted from the documentation, but I want to walk through it just in case uh, you end up copying and pasting and are wondering what's going on here. So I gave it this class, navbar, my nav. My nav is something I'm going to be using later on. So that's my own special navigation. In case you ever want to add your own CSS styling, what you can do is just kind of uh, tack on classes. And then the next thing I'm going to do is set up a div here, and I will call this container from Bootstrap that we've seen before. And that goes inside navbar. And now it's time to add in an anchor. And the actual link is going to be to our home page. So we're going to do this with a URL template tagging. And we will say URL and give it the name home. And that will link to the home link. And then we're also going to say here, let's just say this will be star social. And let's make this into an actual brand, which means I'm going to say the class of this anchor tag is navbar 
dash brand, and I will tack on my nav class in case I ever want to edit the CSS for that. So again, right now, my name navigation, it's all in a container, and I set my brand, remember that's that large home button that goes all the way to the left. And now, I'm going to start an unordered list, and inside this unordered list, I will say class is equal to nav, navbar dash nav, navbar dash right. So kind of right align everything. And these are going to be just a couple of buttons, things that go to a post, a group, a create group, and a logout page, and then a login page and a sign up page. Now some of these we won't be able to fill in out right away because we haven't actually created them. So we're going to kind of leave certain links blank and then we'll fill them in later. Okay. First thing I want to do is I want to check if the user is authenticated. So a user object is going to be returned to this uh, web page. So I can actually check using some template tags if the user dot, and I can call the is authenticated attribute off of this, which means so the user is authenticated, they logged in, it's been successful, and we're going to basically see what the actual navigation bar will look like. So I put in list objects in this unordered list, created an anchor tag here. And right now, I will leave that blank as an href, but what it's actually going to say inside this anchor tag is just going to be uh, post. So that means if the user is logged in, they can then have a little button in their navigation bar that allows them to post something. The next thing I'm going to do is, again, list uh, anchor tag, and this will be uh, groups. So if the user is logged in, they'll be able to see the groups. Again, I'm going to leave that blank. We haven't actually created any groups yet. And then... Again, if they're logged in, I'm going to allow them to create a group. So we'll have a create group option over there. And then finally, I'm going to have a logout. So if the user is authenticated, that means they're logged in. So we should probably have a logout button here. So we'll say log out. And this one I can fill in because I do have this href ready to go. So we're going to say for the URL template, href is going to be equal to in a string accounts colon, logout, and that connects to that uh, urls.py, which connects to that logout view. And now, I'm ready to do the other options in case my user is not authenticated, meaning they haven't logged in yet. So, else, meaning they haven't logged in, I will do the following. I'll create a groups tag, so we should still be able to see the groups. Whoops, let me do an href colon here, and just type in groups under the anchor. So we should still be able to see the groups, even if you're not logged in. That way you can just kind of visit as an un or not logged in user. And then the other option was just going to be to either log in or to sign up. And these, I actually do have the URL links ready to go. We just created them. So let's create those here. So I will say URL accounts login for this guy. And then in the href here for the sign up, I will say URL accounts sign up. Save. And then I as always, if I have an if statement with template tagging, I need to say end if. So end if. Okay. So we're gonna be filling this a lot more once we have posts and groups created. But right now we're just using the basics. I have accounts log out, log in, and sign up. And that ends my unordered list. So that should end my navigation bar. And then I have my content. And I actually am going to wrap this content in a class container. So we'll say container. And then I'm also going to put in my content, which can be a class I later edit in my CSS file, that master CSS. And let's put the content inside of this. Okay. So going all the way down to the bottom, we're going to eventually link to our JavaScript. Right now we don't have a JavaScript file that we've been messing around with, but we'll take care of that later. So let's just save that. So by now we should have a simple navigation bar. A lot of the links are just uh, empty, but we should at least see, be able to see the uh, empty buttons themselves. So we'll see something that says post, groups, create groups, and this will allow us to kind of check if the user authentication is working. So that's our base.html file, and we should already have the index.html file ready to go since we've uh, done that earlier. Okay, our template files should be ready to go. We still have to do a couple of things, such as make the migrations and make sure the accounts are fully set up. We're gonna do that in the very next lecture. So I will see you right then, and we'll continue off right where we left off here.
Welcome back everyone to the part four of the Social Clone Project. We're going to finish up the accounts application, that means our login, logout, and sign up capabilities by setting up the login and logout URLs in our settings.py file, creating two more templates for that, and then we'll also set up the migration. So we're going to continue with the accounts application right where we left off from the previous lecture. Okay, here I am at Adam Text Editor. Remember in the previous lecture we finished off creating our base.html file. What we need to do is set up the login redirect URL and logout redirect URL that the login and logout views are going to call. And we're going to need to do that within our settings.py file. So go to simple social, settings.py, and then these usually go all the way at the bottom. So scroll all the way down and we're gonna set up uh, two variables. So you're gonna say login underscore redirect underscore URL. So this is the login redirect and we'll have this redirect to a test page and then we will have our logout underscore redirect underscore URL and I'm gonna have that be equal to a thanks page. So we'll save that and now that we've said test and thanks let's actually create those templates. So we're gonna create those templates inside of our top level templates in the same directory where base.html and index.html are. So we'll say new file and I'm gonna call this file test.html and I'll create one more file under templates, new file, and I will say thanks.html. And let's set those up. So the test, I'm just gonna test this. Um, basically, we're going to say extends from base.html. We're going to say block the content block and put this inside of a, con actually we don't need a container. We just need to say h1, you are now logged in, exclamation point. And then we'll just, actually we'll just have that be it. So we'll save that. That's essentially going to be our test page to see if logging in worked. Once we log in, it should take us to this page. You are now logged in. And then in our thanks.html pile, this is going to be the logout. So we'll say extends base.html. I will call the content block here. And then we'll say h1. Thanks for visiting. Come back soon. That's kind of the typical logout thing you usually see in a website. So if you log out of Facebook, you usually see, oh, thank you for visiting, come back soon, etc. So that's our login and logout. So login view from Django 1.11, essentially gonna look for those variables, which are then going to connect to these HTML files. So now that we created those HTML files, what we need to do is actually set them up with the views.py and urls.py of our simple social app. So in the simple social project, come over to views.py. Right now we just have our home page view. I'm going to add in the test page and the thanks page. I will say class, test page, and I'm going to again use template view here and then just set my template name equal to test.html and I'll set one more for the actual thanks page. So we'll say thanks page and this is going to be a template view and this will say template name is equal to thanks.html. Perfect. Now I'm going to save that. And since we have these in our views, we're going to connect these to our urls.py. So let's do that. Come over to urls.py. This is our project urls.py file. And we will say URL and whoops, URL. And then we're going to use regular expressions here. We will say uh, something like carrots. And let's actually make sure we have that in our accounts as well. That should always be there. So our carrot accounts, carrot accounts, and then carrot, this will be for the test page, so forward slash, and then I can put a dollar sign in there just to continue in case we wanna build off test. I will say views dot test page dot as view. So we'll call it as a view and then let's give it the name test. And then we'll say URL using regular expressions again carrots and then I'm going to say thanks and let's connect that to views dot the thanks page as a view and we'll give that the name thanks okay save that so now our URL patterns are done let's move on to the next step which is to migrate all the changes we did to accounts so I will say Python manage.py make migrations accounts hit enter and let that run great so it created the model user 
And now I'm going to say python manage.py migrate, hit enter, and we should see it should have applied those migrations. Let's check and see if this actually worked. We may have to do some debugging. We will say python manage.py and then run our server. Hit enter. Okay, so we got no bugs there. So we may have to do a little debugging, but right now looking good. I'm gonna hop over to the browser. And here I am at the browser. Let's refresh and see what we get. Okay. So it says template syntax error, invalid block, uh, line 17 static. Did you forget to register or load this tag? I probably did. So let's make sure it's actually registered. And we can see right here, it's happening at base.html, error at line 17. So let's fix that. So I will go back to my base.html file. So let me come back here. And here in my base.html file, I can see I'm using static, but in order to actually use that static call, you need to load static files. So scroll all the way back up here and right underneath this doc type, I'm going to call load as a template tag and then say static files. Save that. And now let's try this again. We'll come back to the browser and let's refresh. And it says, welcome to Star Social. Okay, looking pretty good right now. We can see we have a basic navigation bar. We have Star Social, groups, login, and sign up. So right now, groups shouldn't really do anything, but login and sign up should. Let's practice signing up. We'll click sign up. And you can see here, it actually looks uh, really nicely formatted. Here you can see there's extra stuff about the password and then required 150 characters or fewer. That's what Bootstrap 3 library is doing for us. It's making this really nice display. So let's sign up. I'm going to say my uh, display name is test user. Uh, my email address is going to be test at gmail.com. Password is going to be test password and then we will confirm our password with test password. Let's click sign up. Okay, so it signed up and redirected us to the login page as we expected. And it kind of auto-filled for me because I'm using Chrome right now, which is kind of memorizing the username and password. So let's make sure this is working. I'm gonna click login and it says, please correct uh, username. So whoops, wrong username. It should be test user. And then let me make sure my password is also correct. Test password. Okay, now I'm going to log in. And then boom, it says now you're logged in, perfect. And I can see here, the actual navigation bar has changed. Now I have post and create group. I also have log out. So let's test with log out, make sure that's working. And it says, thanks for visiting, come back soon. Fantastic, looks like everything is working for us. So what we're gonna do is in the next lecture, we'll continue on by moving to posts and groups. And we kind of have to work with those simultaneously. So we're not gonna be able to work on a single application like we just did here, but since they're so connected, it should be um, relatively straightforward as far as working with them in sync. Okay, I'm going to end it here and I'll see you at the next lecture. Thanks everyone. Hello everyone and welcome to part five of the Social Clone Project. Now we're going to begin by setting up the views, URLs, and template files for the groups and posts applications. And given that they're interconnected, we're going to have to work with them concurrently. So we can't just do posts first and then groups first, otherwise it won't make too much sense. So we'll have to do both at the same time. We'll try to keep a focus primarily on one application at a time, but keep in mind, we're gonna be working on both at the same time. We're gonna start off by just setting up the files we need, and then in the next lecture, we'll actually start programming. Okay, let's hop over to the text editor and create the directories and files. All right, to begin actually creating the directories, I first need to actually make the applications. So we will go to Django admin and say start app, and I will create the posts application. So we'll say start app for posts, and then I will say Django-admin start app, and I will start the groups app. So we'll say groups, and you could call groups whatever you want. You could call it something like subreddits or communities, etc. cetera. Um, I'll just choose the groups name since that's uh, pretty simple. Now what we're going to do is inside of each of these, let me kind of collapse accounts and collapse simple social and expand posts and expand groups. We are going to create the files necessary. So let's start off with posts. So in posts, we're going to make templates. So inside of posts, I will say new folder and then say templates hit enter, and then inside of templates, I'm going to create a new folder called posts, and then here are my post templates. And I'm actually going to create the empty HTML files for now. So let's start off with that. We will say, whoops, not new folder, new file. So inside of this, I'm gonna create a couple new files. One will be my base HTML file. 
for my post, which I'll call post underscore base.html. And then I'll also create a post underscore confirm underscore delete.html. That will be the delete view that you will confirm. And then we're also going to do, let me expand this just a little bit. We're also going to do a post detail. So as you can kind of tell, I'm already kind of thinking of class-based views right now. We will say post underscore detail dot html and then a couple more here we'll create a post form so when someone actually wants to type out the post they'll go to that post form and then if we want to actually list the post for list view I will create a post underscore list dot html and then finally we'll create a new file and this will be called user underscore post underscore list and if you click on a user we should see all their posts kind of like seeing someone's uh, Twitter feed so we'll have user underscore post underscore list. Now we're also going to create one more file in a format that we haven't really seen before. I'm going to say underscore post.html. And the reason for that is I'm actually going to use this underscore post.html file to inject it into other post.html files. Sometimes if your single HTML page or your simple template is actually getting uh, too big and overly complicated, Sometimes you can just break it up and inject it, and I'll show you how to do that later on. But for right now, we'll just keep that thought in our heads and we'll keep underscore post.html as our actual template. So we have those template files, and then next what we're going to do is actually create a few more files inside of posts. So inside of posts, right now I have models and views, but I'm also going to add a urls.py and a forms.py. So we'll say posts urls.py and then post new file forms.py. Okay, so that's all we're going to do with posts for now. So we created those templates and you can always just uh, copy and paste the templates or check out the notes for the directories of what those templates actually look like in case you had difficulty following along. But now we're going to do kind of the same thing for groups. So in groups, what we're going to do now is create that templates directory. I'll say new folder, templates, and then under templates, I'm going to say new folder, groups, and then under groups, I'm going to create a couple of HTML files. We'll say new file, group underscore base.html. So that will be my base HTML file for the actual groups, and I will extend from that. I'll create a new file called group underscore detail.html. Then I'll create a new file, group form. So when someone wants to create a new group, they'll come to this form page. Again, class-based views here. And then finally, we should see a list of all the groups so we will say group underscore list.html and hit enter okay so those are my four template files for groups and then i also want to create a urls.py file here so we will say underneath groups new file urls.py okay and then save all those changes close these now and we should have our basic structure or skeleton for dealing with posts and groups and what we're going to do in the next lecture is start off by actually focusing on groups first, since there's uh, fewer HTML files or template files to work with, and the structure is going to be a little simpler, and that will kind of dictate what we need the posts to look like. So we're going to try to focus on groups at first, but eventually we're going to have to work on them both at the same time. But to make it a little easier, we're going to try to focus on groups. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part six of the Social Clone Project. What we're going to be doing now is, after we've created the directories and files for groups and posts, we will actually build out the models.py files for both groups and posts applications. Let's get started. Okay, the first models.py file I'm going to be working with is the groups models.py file. And then once this one's ready to go, we'll move over to the posts models.py file. So right now, under groups, open up models.py, and then you can type along with me and then double check against the provided notes. I'm going to say from django.utils.text import, and I'm going to be importing Slugify. And Slugify just allows us to remove any characters that aren't alphanumerics or underscores or hyphens. And basically the idea behind that is if you have a string that has spaces in it and you want to use that as part of your URL, it's going to be able to lowercase and add dashes instead of spaces. That way it works with your browser. So we have Slugify. And then I'm also going to import something called Misaka, and that allows us to actually do uh, link embedding. Uh, if you've ever used something like a Reddit commenting system, you can actually put 
links or a little bit of markdown text. That what that's what Misaka actually does. Now, in order to use this, we need to actually install it. So open up your terminal, and then say pip install Misaka. Hit enter, and then my requirements are already satisfied because I already installed it earlier. But in your virtual environment, again, just type out pip install. M-I-S-A-K-A. -A. And that, again, is going to allow us to use Markdown inside of these posts. So I'm going to minimize this once that we've done that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is say from Django.contrib.auth, so that authorization, I'm going to import a function called getUserModel. And that returns the user model that's currently active in this project. So I'm going to be able to do that to create a user object. So get user model and essentially what that allows me to do is call things off of the current users session and that will make more sense once we actually call things off this user so we'll save that for now and then one last thing I'm going to do which I'm not gonna be able to explain right now but you'll see it in the future when we actually deal with a template that uses it I'm going to say from Django import template and then say register is equal to template.library and we'll talk about that later, but basically, this is how we can use custom template tags in the future. So later on, I'm going to have an in-group members check template tag when we're actually dealing with uh, the group HTML files, and that's going to come in handy here. So keep this in the back of your mind. You're not going to see it used until a future lecture, but we're going to go ahead and type it in now. Okay, now it's time for our actual main model. It's group. So I'm going to say class group. And this is going to inherit from models.model. .model. And right now I'll just say pass because I want to add in one more class here, which is the group member class. So I'm going to have groups and then group members. So we'll say group members and then we'll say models.model. .model. And then here I will also say pass and then save. Okay, so the simpler one is actually the group member. So that's the one we'll work on first and then we'll have group itself. Let me collapse the directory tree and get a little more space under group. And then once we fill this out, we'll remove the pass. So in class group member, what I'm going to do is create a group attribute. And that's going to be linked with a foreign key to the group class. So we'll say group, and then we'll give a related name. And the related name, I'm gonna call it memberships. And essentially that means that the group member is related to the group class through this foreign key, which we've called memberships, which makes sense. A group member can have a membership to a group. And then we'll have a user also be an attribute, and that's going to be models foreign key. And that's going to be a link to user, and the related name is going to be user underscore groups. So essentially, we'll have a user that we get from here, that current user that's logged in and playing around with the website, and they're going to have some groups that they belong to or that they're going to be a member of. So we wanna link this group member class to both the user and the various groups that this user could belong to. So we have that, and then finally, let's add in a DEF call for a string representation of this object, passes in self, and then I'm just going to return self.user.username. So you remember when we were creating the accounts application, we had a user, and remember users can have usernames, and that's what we're going to be using for the string representation. So I will save that, and then we want to add in one more subclass here, the meta. And here I'm going to call unique together. So unique underscore together, and say equals to group and user. And we'll explain later on what that actually means, but for right now, that's all we need in the actual group member class. We have the link to the group, to the user, the string method, and then this unique together for group and user, and then we will save that. And now it's time to deal with this larger group class, or group model. So this group model or model class is going to have an attribute called name, which is going to be the actual name of the group, and that's going to just be models, it'll be a character field, and we'll give it a max length of, uh, let's say, 255, doesn't really matter. And then I need unique to be equal to true because I don't want groups to have overlapping group names. So once we have that, the next thing I'm gonna do is say slug, and the group is going to have a slug, which is going to be models, a slug field, and I'm going to allow 
underscore Unicode be equal to true. And then I'm also going to require that this is unique. That way I don't get any mistakes calling a URL code uh, and I make sure that group slugs and group names don't accidentally overlap each other. Then we will have a description field as well, or attribute. And then we will say this is a text field and it can be blank, we'll let it be blank, or actually let's not let it be blank. Someone should always have a description for their group. So we'll say it has to be true. We'll make the default value be blank. So the default value is just going to be a blank string. So I have two single quotes there, and that's going to be the description for the group. And then we're gonna add another attribute called description, description underscore HTML, which you may find useful in the future, but Right now we'll just type it in whether or not we're going to use it. And it's just going to be a text field where we say editable, where the, whether or not you can edit it, we'll set it equal to false. The default value is going to be a blank string and we're going to say that it can be blank in case we want a kind of HTML version of our description. And then finally, the members of a group is going to be equal to models. And this is a many to many field. So many to many field and it's going to pass in a user object and then the through argument is going to be through a group member class. There we go. Okay, so now we have the basic attributes for our group and we're going to add in a couple of methods. So the first method we're just going to say str pass in self and this is just going to be the string representation of a group object. We're just going to return self.name. So the group string representation is just the name of the group. Next, we're going to say save. So when you want to save a group, we're going to do the following. We'll take in args and keyword arguments. And then we'll set the slug of the group once you're saving it to slugify self.name, which means whatever the name is, you can go ahead and put spaces in it while you're filling out the group form. But then when we actually save it, the slug will become the slugify call on self.name. Essentially just replacing and lower casing things. And then we will say self.description HTML, so that extra attribute that we created, that's going to be equal to misaka.html, allowing us to put markdown in there, self.description. There we go, so in case we have markdown, in the description, I can call it with misaka.html. And then finally, we'll say super. And I'm going to save args and keyword arguments. Okay, so that's going to be our save method for the group. And then I'm going to get another method called get absolute underscore URL self. And then this is going to return a reverse call of groups single, and right now we haven't actually defined our urls.py file, so keep that in mind. Later on we'll explain more about what groups and single is, but that's going to be a reverse, and we're going to add in some keyword arguments, basically a dictionary, where the slug is equal to self.slug. Okay, and then finally we will have a meta class call, and we'll say ordering is equal to, and this has to be passed in as a list, name. Save that, and let's kind of explain overall what we just did. So we set up our group class as well as our group member class. Group member just connects to a group that this group member belongs to and a user that connects to this actual individual member, and the string representation is a username. Then we have our actual group class or group model, the name of the group, the slug representation of that group, the description of that group, and then a description, .ht, or description underscore HTML that we're going to use with Misaka to actually get some markdown text. And then we will call members, which is just many to many fields, so all the members that belong to this particular group. And that so far is all we have to do with the models.py file underneath the groups application. Okay, now let's hop over to the models.py file in the posts application. So I will save this models.py, come over to posts models.py, and then collapse this. So right now, this is the posts models.py file that we're going to be editing. All right, so the first thing I want to do here is a couple of imports. So for the posts, I'm going to say from Django.core 
.url resolvers import reverse. That way when someone does a post, what are we going to kind of send them back to? And then the other thing I'm going to say is from Django .conf import settings. I'm going to import Misaka again. That way people can write markdown inside of their actual posts. And then we will say from groups.models import group. So we can connect the post to an actual group. And then finally, we can do this below this comment, kind of up to you wherever you want to put them. We'll say from Django.contrib.auth for authorization, import get user model. And it will create a user object saying get user model. And that's just going to connect the current post to whoever's like logged in as a user. That way you can actually get the current user logged into the session. And now I'm going to say class post models.model. And I'll just put in pass right there for now. And what we're going to do is a couple things. We need to set up the attributes for post, set up the string representation method, the save method, and then the get absolute URL method, which means once someone has posted something, where are we going to send them? And then we'll have a meta class for my other information. So I'm going to now get rid of that pass and start typing that out. Okay, so we have user. And that's going to be models. And that will be a foreign key to a user, basically this current user. And I will say related name is equal to posts. I'll create a field called created at, and that's going to be equal to models. And that will be a date time field. And I'm going to have it be auto now is equal to true. That way, once someone posts, the actual date time that they posted is just automatically connected. So you don't actually fill in the time you posted. It's just auto-generated for you. And you can display that uh, or not display it. It's kind of up to you. But we'll have that information inside our admin models. So then I'm going to say message. So what's actually the message in that post? That's going to be equal to models text field. And I'll just use all the defaults there. I don't want to really put a max length on that right now. And then the HTML markdown version of this. So we'll say message underscore HTML. That's going to be equal to models text field, but I don't want people to be able to edit that. So we'll say editable is equal to false because we're going to basically grab that directly from message and you'll see that in a second. And then one last attribute here, I will say group. That's going to be models foreign key, whoops, foreign key. And that's going to connect to group, which we remember imported from our group.models. So this post is connected with a foreign key to a group. It has a related name of posts. And then we'll say null is equal to true. And then we will say blank is equal to true. Okay, so our foreign key can be null, it can be a blank true, but we'll take care of that in further detail of the templates themselves. But let's go through those methods that we were going to do. So whoops, first one is the string representation of this. And that is just going to be the actual message of the post. So we'll say return self dot message. The next one I want to do is the save method. And that's going to look similar to what we've been doing in the past where we have args, our keyword arguments, k args or kw args. And then that will be self uh, message underscore HTML is equal to Misaka HTML of self.message. That way, if someone writes in Markdown, so they put a link in their post, it doesn't look with like uh, strange notation of brackets and stuff. It actually is supported with the HTML from Misaka. And then we're just going to say super save, and then again, the args and the keyword arguments. All right, so that's the save method. And then finally, we're going to do the last method, get absolute URL. After that, we'll do class meta or a subclass. So the get absolute URL is going to say self. And this is going to return the following. Let me put some more lines in here. This is going to return the reverse function call. And we will pass in posts single. So again, we haven't set up the actual URLs, but that will be set up eventually. And then it's also going to take in some keyword arguments, which is going to be a dictionary of the username, 
that will be self.user.username. And then the other thing that's going to go in here is the primary key. So we're going to be kind of using primary keys as a way to uh, relate to posts back to the URL. That's going to be equal to self.primaryKey. And that should be it for the actual get you absolute URL call. Then we're going to say class meta. We'll say ordering is equal to, let's just say created at, but notice I put a minus sign here. That way we see them in descending order. So the most recent posts are at the top. And then we will say unique underscore together is equal to, and that's going to be a list. It can also be a tuple. We'll say user message. Okay, that way um, every message is uniquely linked to a user. All right, so those are the models.py for files for posts and groups. Now we definitely did a lot of typing here, so double check that you match up to the supplied notes um, in case you were, weren't able to follow along or were looking down and typing, etc. So always check against the actual provided.py files. And coming up next, we're going to expand off these models.py files and begin to work with them using our views.py. All right, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome everyone to part seven of the Social Clone Project. What we're now going to do is focus on the groups application by creating the views for the group templates and then connecting the template files to those views using the urls.py file for group applications. All right, let's hop over to the Atom text editor and get started. All right, so by now you should already have your models.py file filled out for the groups application. And we're gonna open up views.py under groups and start filling out some very basic views for our actual groups application. And what we're going to do is a couple of things. First, a couple of imports. I will say from Django.contrib.auth for authorization, mixins, and then I'm going to import, and I will import two mixins here, the login required mixin, and then the permission required mixin. And if you want, you can put these on multiple lines just by having parentheses. So something that's common to see is if you have really long uh, import lines, you can just use multi lines with a parentheses there. And then what we're also going to do is a bunch of other imports. We will say from Django.core.url resolvers import reverse. And then I will also say from Django.views import, and then I'm going to import those generic views. And that's just the class based views that we've worked with before. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to say class and I will have a create group view. So if someone is logged into the site and they want to create their own group, kind of like creating your own subreddit, this will be the view for that. And it's going to take in the login required mixin and it will also take in the create view. And then here, I just need to specify the fields I want them to be able to create. So we say fields is equal to, and I want them to be able to edit the name of the field or the name of the group that I should say, and then the description. And those are just directly linked to the models.py. So the name and the description. I don't want them to be able to edit things like slug or members because that really wouldn't make sense. So when they create a group, it takes a generic create view. And then finally, I just need to connect it to the actual model. So if I'm gonna connect it to the group model, that means I need to import it. So we'll say from groups.models, and you can also say from dot models. I will import group and then group member. That way I can call them throughout these class-based views. So right now we have our very basic create view. So to actually connect this to a template, we're gonna to need to later on uh, edit our template underneath groups as well as our urls.py file. But let's continue. I'm gonna create a detail view and a list view and then we'll actually mess around with those template files. So I will say class and let's just say single group. And this is just going to be a generic detail view. So it's just the details of that specific group. Things like the posts inside that group, etc. And that's just going to be connected to a model called group. So pretty simple. And then we'll have a list groups. So when someone goes to like the list groups page, they'll just see a list of all the available groups. Kind of like selecting a list all subreddits or something like that. And then we'll say generic and that will be a list view. And you can see already that class-based views making our lives a lot simpler. And then we'll say model is equal to group. So now I'm going to save that. 
looks like we have uh, three main class-based views. Now let's head over to the templates and actually create those template files that connect them. We already have group base, group detail, group form, and group list, so we should be uh, pretty good to go. Let's start off by saying group base, and in the group base.html, I'm going to say extends from base.html, and then I'm going to call block content. So that's going to extend from the actual base.html file that I've already created underneath the project templates. And then I have my content here, and I'm going to create a div container class, and then I will say div class row, in case I need that, for bootstrap purposes. And then I'm going to make three blocks here. I'll have a pre-group block, a group content block, and then a post-group block that we'll see how we can use later on. So this block I will say is pre-group. We can actually just uh, put it like this so it's a little more readable. Then I'm going to copy and paste this and then we will have a block that is the group content, so group underscore content, and then the post group. So we won't use all of these blocks in every template but in case we ever want to have something that goes before the group content we have pre-group, during the group content we have group content, and then after the group content we have post group. Okay. So that's all we need, so I will save that. And then we're going to continue on with uh, the other templates. So let's start off with the group detail page. So we'll come over to group detail, that very next template, and I will say extends from groups forward slash group underscore base.html, that HTML file we were just working with. And then let's put everything we want to occur before the group name. So I will call block, and this will be my pre-group block. And then as a heading one, I'm going to have the group name, and I can call that using template syntax by saying group.name. So remember, with those class-based views, there's actually a, a context dictionary that gets passed that holds everything that the model has. So since groups have names, I can just call group.name. And this word group is the lowercase singular version of the actual model. So if you come to models.py, this is the lowercase model, G-R-O-U-P, which is where that actual context dictionary comes from. And that just, as we've told you before, it comes from class-based views. Then heading two, I'm going to say member count. And here I'm going to input another, uh, basically, call to the context dictionary. And I'm going to call group members. So again, come back to the model. Remember, we have members here. And off of that, I'm actually going to call a method. And I can call the count uh, method or attribute off of that. And if you want a list of these, you can check out the documentation for various things you can call off of uh, model objects. All right, now the next step for this actual group detail page is on that group detail page where it's actually listing the posts. If you're a member and you're logged in, I want you to have a leave or join button there. So let's try to add that in. Inside this same pre-group block, I'm going to create a div, and I will call this content, in case I ever want to edit this with CSS. And inside of this, I'm going to say if, and I will say if user in group.members.all. So that means if this user happens to be inside uh, this, essentially an array or list of all the members inside that actual group model, then I'm going to do the following. I'll have an anchor tag that has an href to URL and then groups leave. So we haven't actually created this um, view or URLs yet, but later on in our URLs file for the actual groups, what we're going to be able to have is the option to leave the group. So we only want that if the user is already in the group. So we'll say, okay, if the user is already in the group and they're visiting this page, they have the option to leave and they're going to be able to leave, but we also have to define what slug, and that's just going to be equal to group.slug. And we'll kind of edit this later on, but let's actually make sure this is a URL template with those uh, percent signs. And then inside of this, we're gonna go ahead and give this a class. So we'll say class, and let me collapse this so we get a little more room here. Class is equal to, we'll just have this be a normal button, let's say btn. Actually, let's make it a really large button so it's kind of obvious. I can start this on a new line. So we will say class button, uh, let's say button dash LG for a large button, 
I'm going to fill out this button and then let's make it a warning button so it's like really obvious to the user that if they click that button they're going to leave. Okay, and then what we're also going to do is add in a span. So we're going to use glyphy icons or glyph icons and this will allow me to actually have an icon there instead of just like a word that says uh, leave group. So it's going to look like an exit sign or something. So we'll have it be a remove circle and that that will be right next to the word leave. So we do this by creating a span and then inside that span we create a class and that class is going to be a glyph icon and then it's glyph icon dash remove dash circle and you can technically not really uh, have the span that's just kind of an icon I want to put in there and you can check out the bootstrap documentation for all these codes and all the different icons they have available and then I'm going to say leave. Okay, so we have this button that shows up if a group, if a member is already in that group, and then they can click on that button and they'll leave the group. So that's if that user is already in the group. Else, we should probably give them the option to join the group. So we'll say else, and it's going to be a really similar thing. We'll have H, and then let's actually just copy this because it's so similar. So I'm going to copy this entire anchor tag and then post it here. And then inside this anchor tag, let's change what we want. So else, if they're not going to leave it, then we know they're going to join it. So we'll make another view later on for URL groups join. Same thing is going to be the slug. And we can have the same thing as a button warning. You can change if you want button warning or button default, etc. for coloring. We will have, instead of a remove circle, I'm going to say OK circle. And then we will say, instead of leave, join. All right, again, basic idea. We check if that user who's currently visiting this page is in group.members.all and then uh, whether or not they're going to leave or join. All right, now we're actually almost done with group detail.html. I'm gonna scroll down past this block and then I will start a new block. And this is just going to be my group content here. And then what we will do is I don't want the group content that is the list of actual posts to take up the entire page. I kind of want them lined up a little bit. So what I'm going to do is say div class and I will give this a class of call medium dash eight. Those are those bootstrap formations. And then we'll say if, and I'm going to say if group.post.count is equal to zero. And that basically means if the group doesn't actually have any posts in it yet, what I will say is instead of listing something, I'm just gonna have a header two that says no posts in this group yet. Whoops, let's make sure we spell that right. So no posts in this group yet. And then if we don't have else, actually let's say else. Else, what else are we gonna do? We're going to say for, for post in group.post.all. And then I'm going to just cycle through this but what I'm going to do is say include, and then we'll say posts forward slash underscore post.html. And let me kind of describe, since we haven't really seen include yet, what's going on there. And other than that, we're actually done with this page. So let's take a little bit of time to kind of do a little description of line 31. So all I'm doing here is I'm saying if the group currently has no posts, just have a heading to that says no posts in this group yet. But in the more likely situation where we actually already have post net groups, what I want to do is say for posts in groups.post.all, and then I'm going to include. Now include is kind of a way of saying extends, except you're going to essentially insert it right in the middle of an HTML file. So instead of actually uh, extending and using blocks, what you can do is use this include statement to inject an HTML file. Since there's going to be so much stuff going on with the posts themselves, a lot of HTML calls, a lot of template calls, a lot of template tags, I don't want to include all of that in this group detail.html. Instead, what I will do is have that all taken care of in this posts.html file. And since this is going to be injected to kind of signify that as a developer, I have this underscore there. Now I technically don't need that underscore there. It's really more for me to understand that this particular piece of HTML file is designed to be injected into other HTML files using include. So that's the kind of syntax that I'm going to be using to actually understand that. So that's it for the group detail page. And what we're going to do is finish off those other class-based views that we just created. So we'll come back up here. The next one we're going to do is the group list page. So that should be pretty straightforward. So let's go to group list. 
click on that. And then this is going to extend from groups slash group underscore base dot HTML. Let's collapse that uh, directory tree again. And then I'm going to call a block for my pre content or pre group content. Then here, what I will say is give this a class of call medium for, and a lot of these class calls, um, you can adjust them yourself. This is more for styling. And then we will say content. And now what I want to do is check if a user's logged in and they're authenticated, I want something to say a welcome back uh, username. And if not, it's going to just say, hey, welcome to the groups page, select the group. So let's try that out. We'll say if the user is underscore authenticated, and I can use all these user template calls because of the Django.authorization package. It basically uh, takes care of all the heavy lifting to connect this on the back end. So you can just say user dot is authenticated. And what I will do is if they're authenticated, I'll have a heading two on this web page that says welcome back. And inside of this heading two, I'm also going to have an anchor tag and it's going to link to their actual profile. So we'll say a URL, and then posts for underscore user, so that it actually links to their profile where it has a list of all their posts in case they ever want to see that. And then I also need to provide their username. So we'll say username is equal to user dot, whoops, user dot username. And then inside of here, in the actual anchor tag, what I'm going to do is say at and with template tags, oops, I need to inject this with double. We'll say at user dot username. So that basically has that kind of Twitter quality or basically any social network quality where if this user is authenticated, it'll say welcome back. There'll be a link here that says at user dot username. And if you click on that link, it will take you to a list of all your posts. Now we're going to take care of that view later on when we're dealing with posts. Now we'll end the if. So uh, for everyone though, it will show the following. It'll say groups heading two, and then we'll just have a paragraph here that says welcome to the groups page exclamation point. Save that. And then the other thing I want to do is check that if the user is authenticated, I should be able to kind of have a button there that says create new group. So we'll do that as well. We'll say um, if outside of this uh, first div tag, if the user is underscore authenticated. I will have an anchor tag here, where again, the anchor tag is linked to URL groups underscore create. And there's a couple ways you could have done this. You don't have to do it exactly the same way I'm doing it, but I'm just gonna do it with a simple button call, btn, btn-md, btn-fill, btn-warning. Now remember from the navigation bar, technically the user can already create a group from any page. There's a little link in the uh, navigation, but since you're on the groups page, it, be, it might be nice to actually have it as a separate button as well on the actual group page. So that's why I'm adding this in. And then we will go ahead and add a span and use those glyph icons. So in the span, I will give it the class uh, glyph, whoops, let me make sure I spell that right. Glyph icon, glyph icon, whoops, having trouble with this, glyph icon dash plus dash sign. So it looks like a little plus sign. And we'll just have the text right next to it be create new group. And then we need to end that if. All right, so that's it for that at the very top of the page. And so that will end the pre-group block. So it just checks, welcome back, and then says welcome to the groups page, has a little button there if you're authenticated to create a new group. Next what we're going to do is the actual group or content. So we'll say, have a new block of group content. And then let's go ahead and give this one more uh, division. We'll say, this should be call-median-8. So it doesn't take up everything. And then we'll say div class, I'll say list group in case we ever want to edit this with CSS. And now I'm going to have a for loop. So I'm going to say for group in object underscore list. And we'll talk about this uh, object underscore list later on. So our for group in object list, I'm going to have an anchor tag and we'll give this a URL call. We'll say URL groups 
single where the slug is equal to the group dot slug itself. And I'm going to have this actually have a class. We'll say this class will be list group item in case I ever want to edit or call it. And then let's kind of start this rest of this anchor tag on a new line. And that is going to have, let's say inside this anchor tag, we'll have a heading three with a class of its own. And this class will say title list group item heading. So in case you ever, ever want to edit that, that's where you can do it in the CSS. And then I will say the group actual name. Okay, so that's the heading three. And what is actually going on here? Let's kind of briefly describe it. So, so far I have for every group in my object list, which is essentially going to be a list of the actual groups. Remember this is the group list HTML. I'm going to have an anchor tag that so far has a link to the group name. So if you click on that group name, it'll take you to that group's single page through this slug connection. But there's still more I want to add here. I'm going to, inside of the same anchor tag, create a div class and we'll say list group item and I'm going to call it text and then say container dash fluid so that's a bootstrap a container call and then here is where I'm finally going to use that description so we'll say description underscore HTML and then pipe operator I'll say safe so that allows me if you remember from the previous uh, clone project that allows me to actually use uh, HTML code in a safe way so that if something is bold, you actually see bold text instead of seeing uh, bold template tags or bold HTML tags. Now what we want to do is right after this, we're going to call another div. And this is just going to be a row. And I know there's a lot uh, to type here. So if you want, just copy and paste this from the actual uh, solution so you don't make any typos anywhere. It's really easy to make a typo here. And I'm sure I'm making one right now, which we're going to fix later. And we'll create one more that says call medium four. And we'll create a span. And we will say this is a class. And we'll give this a badge class. And then what we're going to do here is inside the span, I'll have group members count. And then inside of that, I'm going to say member whoops, member, and I will say group.members.count, pluralize. And later on we'll actually see what this does, so pluralize. Make sure I don't accidentally spell that wrong. Okay, so that's the end of this particular div, and then we're going to start one more inside of this row object. So sweet div, and this is also going to be call md4, and here again, we'll basically have the same thing, span with the class is equal to badge. And then we'll call group.post.count. And then outside of this, we will have post with template tagging. I'm going to inject group, posts, counts, and then we will call pluralize on that as well. Okay, so a ton of div tags here. And I promise we'll go over all of this um, at the very end. But now what we're going to do is basically scroll down and end this, make sure everything's lined up. And we should have two div tags after the end four, and then an anchor and three more div tags before that. And everything else should be lining up. So if you don't have that, um, you probably made a typo somewhere. So just a copy and paste from the solutions. That's a lot easier than typing along with me. But let's actually go through this group list page since there's a lot going on here. First off, in pre-group, what we're doing is just checking if the user is authenticated. If they are, we have a little thing that says welcome back at whoever the user is, and it links to that user's post. So you log in, you go to the groups page, it says welcome back Jose, click on that, then it takes a list of all Jose's posts. Then it says end if. Now for everybody, we say welcome to the groups page. Then we check, okay, if the user is authenticated, let's add a little button there so they can create a new group. There's also one on the navigation bar, but we should have one here as well. That's the end of the pre group block. Now it's the much more complicated uh, group content block, but it's actually not so bad. Basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, for every group in this object list, which is going to be a list of all the group objects, 
we're going to have, and essentially you can kind of ignore these class calls since they're just CSS, and focus on what's really going on here. So here we're going to say group name, and you can click on that group name and it will take you to the single uh, group page, so that group detail page that we just created earlier. And then the actual description, we call with description underscore HTML, and we call it with safe, that way in case there's any uh, bold tags or uh, italics tags, whatever, they happen to be displayed correctly. And then we have these uh, group members count and group post count. So on the actual page where it details the groups that are available, it will say how many posts that group has and how many members that group has as well. And that's basically all that's going on here. It's just the large amount of div class calls that kind of make it hard to read. But essentially it's just a pretty simple for loop that's displaying the group name, the number of members in that group, and the number of posts in that group. Then once you click the group name, it will take you to that actual group detail page. And that's all that's going on in groups list. Now finally, what I want to fill out is let's say someone does click on create a new group, they're going to go to groups create, and that's going to be created by that create view. So let's come over here and set that up with group underscore form. So in this page, I'm going to say extends groups slash group underscore base.html. And then I'm also going to remember this is a form, so I will load up Bootstrap 3 to make the form look nice. Then we'll have block, and then it will say group underscore content. And here, doesn't really matter what heading size you use, I'm just gonna say create a new group, and then we'll create a form here. We'll say form, whoops, not for, form. And this form, it won't have a class, but it will have an action. And the action will link back to URL groups underscore create. So this is basically uh, linking to our create view. And then we'll give this a uh, post method. And we'll actually also give it an ID in case we ever want to edit it with CSS. And we'll say group form. Let's make it a uh, group form of camel casing just so I know. And inside of here, since it's a form, we always need our CSRF token. And then below that, we're going to have the form call. So with template, whoops, with template tagging, we'll call bootstrap form, as we saw before, bootstrap underscore form, and then pass in the form. So this makes it look a lot nicer using bootstrap three, which again, you had a pip install. Finally, we'll have an input block, and that will just be type submit, and it'll say value says create, so it says create, and then let's give this a class, we don't need to give it a name. It'll be btn, btn primary, and then btn large. Okay. So definitely did a lot of stuff here, so let's quickly review. We finished off all the templates for groups as well as most of the views, so let's quickly review. So what we did in this lecture was we came over to views.py in the groups application, and we created three main views for creating a new group, for looking at a single group, and then the list groups. And then we actually went to the templates and filled that out ourselves. So the base template just has these three blocks, what goes before the group, what the actual group content is, and then the post group, that way we can easily separate them. Then we actually have the detail page of a group, which just shows the group name, the number of members in that group, and then it actually uh, says if the user is in that group, there's a leave button. If the user is not in that group, there's a join button. That way we can connect users to groups themselves. And here we just say, okay, if there's no posts in the group, just say no posts. If there are posts though, we're just going to kind of inject this underscore post.html content that we'll work with later on in the future lecture. Then we actually went to the group list page, which was a little complicated, but essentially just shows welcome back to the user, says welcome to the groups page. If the user is authenticated, we have a little new button that says you can create a new group. And then here we just actually list out every group with the link to the group, and then the number of members and the number of posts in that group. Finally, for that create view, we have group underscore form, which just says create group, and we have that form that we just created. Okay, we're actually still not done with all the views for groups. There's a two more, a little more complicated views that we're gonna do in the next lecture. And that's basically the views for joining a group and leaving a group. So that's going to kind of require a little bit more of uh, code to actually make those work. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums. Definitely did a lot here, and we definitely typed a lot. So if you're stuck on something or something didn't seem quite right, you can always just copy and paste from the provided notes. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome to part eight of the Social Clone Project. 
Now what we're going to do is connect the views that we've already created in groups to some URLs. We still have two more views to create in the groups application, but we'll worry about those later on. Right now we're just going to connect the views we created to some URLs, and we're also going to register the group models that we previously created to the admin.py file. Let's hop over to Adam and get started. All right, here I am at the text editor. I have the models, views, and the various templates we created. What I want to do now is go to urls.py. This is the groups urls.py file. And here's where I'm going to basically connect all the views I just made. So we will say from django.configuration urls import URL. And then I'm also going to say from dot import views to actually access the views we just created, specifically those class-based views. And then we'll give this an app name groups so we can reference it later on with URL template tagging. Now I'm going to make a list of URL patterns and we're going to say the first pattern is just going to be the very basic uh, groups page and that will be the list groups page. So we'll actually just call it caret dollar sign. So when someone actually goes to yourwebsite.com slash groups, it shows you the list of all the groups. So we'll say views, list groups dot as view. And then we'll give this name, we can just give it all. And then we're also going to say URL. And for this one, this is going to be the create page. So you can either call it slash create, I'll call it slash new. And then what we're going to do is say views and that will be the create group as a view. And then we'll say name is create. Then we'll create another URL function. This is going to be for the actual detail view. And this one's going to be a little more complicated. What we're going to do is say uh, post slash in slash, and then this will actually be the group. And we're going to use a regular expressions to plug in the slug there. So it goes question mark, capital P, and then uh, open tag, close tag with slug, and then in brackets here we'll say minus backslash w, and then we'll say plus, and after all of that it's a forward slash dollar sign. And basically what this does is just it's going to say post in, and then it's going to slugify the actual group name. And then that will lead to the actual single uh, group there. So that will be views dot, and we called it single group, we'll say as view, and we'll give this the name, I can collapse this so we get a little more room, we'll just call this single, and save. We still have two more URLs and two more views to make about leaving and joining groups, but right now we won't really worry about them, we'll take care of that when we actually create those views. The last thing I want to do in this particular lecture is assign the admin.py file for the models we created. So remember previously we created the group model as well as the group member model. So let's set that up in our admin.py. Going to open that up and then go to admin.py from Django and then I also want to say from dot import models. So I want to register these models with the admin and I will say admin.site dot register and then I just pass in models dot group and then the other thing I want to do is a little special with a tabular inline. And the inline class that we're going to be using basically allows us to utilize the admin interface in our Django website with the ability to edit models on the same page as the parent model. So our group member basically has a bit of a parent model with group and what we can do is we can use a tabular inline class so that when we visit the admin page I can click on group and then see the group members and edit those as well. So let's see how we can do that. All I need to do is say class group member and then I'm going to say inline and then I call admin tabular inline and then I just do the assignment of model is equal to models.group member and then I don't actually have to register it because now the group member model is inline here and we'll see what that looks like with more detail when we actually visit the admin site. And that's all we're going to do for this lecture, just connecting the views we previously created in our urls.py file, which you can reference in the notes, as well as set up our registration for the model. So the group model, just typical registration, and then here we did a tabular inline, which we're going to see later on when we actually visit the admin page. Okay, so a much shorter lecture than the last one, so take your time with this. Uh, definitely a lot of stuff to uh, type out, you can always copy and paste from the notes. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome to part 9 of the Social Clone Project. Now we're going to jump over to the Posts application and set up our views.py file there. A lot of the views will require extra methods to ensure that certain privileges are connected correctly to the logged in user and selected group. What we're also going to need to do is install a library called Django-Braces and you can do that at your command line with pip install Django-Braces and this allows us to access some convenient mixins to use with class-based views. Alright, let's hop over to the editor, go to the postviews.py file and get started. Alright, here I am at my postviews.py file. I'm going to collapse the directory tree to give us a little more room. And I'm going to start off by doing a couple of imports. We're first going to say from django.contrib.auth.mixins import login required mixin. That way we know someone needs to be logged in to actually do a lot of these post actions, such as creating a new post. Then we're also going to say from Django.core.urlResolvers import reverse lazy so that in case someone wants to delete a post we have that reverse lazy call which you can use later and then we also are going to be using some generic class based views I will say from Django.views import generic and then we're also going to be using uh, HTTP 404 that way we can return a 404 page later on so we'll say from Django.http import HTTP 404. Save that. And then finally, we'll say from braces.views import select related mixin. Now remember that you have to install braces as we just discussed in the slides. And you can do that just by going to your command line. So, and at your command line, inside of your virtual environment, just say pip install Django braces, hit enter, and then let that install. Now, my requirements are already satisfied because I've already installed it before this lecture. Okay, so now we have braces ready to go, and then I'm also going to say from dot import models, so that's my actual models for the posts, and then later on we're actually going to create a form for the post, so we'll say from dot import forms, although we haven't actually created the forms.py file yet, although we'll uh, do that later on. And then I will say from Django dot contrib dot auth import get user model and that's going to be a function that allows me to set a user object equal to get user model and then I call get user model and basically what that means is when someone's logged into a session I'm going to be able to use this user object as the current user and then call things off of that so let's start off with probably the simplest view here and that's going to be the post list view so once you select a person uh, you can see a list of all their posts or once you select a group you can see a list of all the posts for that group so we'll start off with the post list class and that's going to be a list of posts belonging to a group so we're going to say pass in the selected related mixin as well as call this a generic list view and then let's give a couple more lines here go all the way back up and inside of this post list all we're going to do is connect it to a model so that will be models.post, so our post model that we created earlier. And then I'm also going to have this method or attribute selected underscore related, which is just a mixin that allows us to provide a tuple of related models. So basically the foreign keys for this post. And that's going to be the user that the post belongs to and the group that the post belongs to. And then I'm saving that. And up next, we're going to create another class for user posts. And that's just going to be a generic list view. And let's give ourselves some more room here. Don't want to forget that colon. And then this is going to be the generic view for the user posts. So we'll connect this with model, models.post. And then we'll give it the template name. So the template name is going to be equal to post slash user underscore post underscore list dot HTML. Okay. Now we're going to have to add a few more methods in here to make sure this all works correctly when a user is logged in. So we're going to have a method called get underscore query set, pass in self, and this is what we're going to do inside this method. We're going to first try to say self.post.user, so check if self.post.user is equal to, actually this isn't really a check, this is an assignment, so assign user.objects. and then we're going to call prefetch underscore related posts. And remember, we can say uh, these different methods or attributes. You can call off objects. So this is another one. There's a giant list of them in the documentation. And then off of this, we're going to say get, 
and we'll say get the username underscore I exact underscore or excuse me equals self dot keyword args dot get and then in parentheses username and that's it. So we're going to first try to do this whole giant line. So let's explain what's going on here. Here we're going to try to get the query set. So basically when you call user post that list view, what is it actually going to attempt to do? Here it's going to try to set post.user, that is the user that belongs to this particular post, equal to user, that user's objects. We're going to prefetch related posts. And then this username, this should be a double underscore. As I described before in previous lectures, we can call uh, these double underscores, and you can see how the syntax highlighting changes. And then we're going to get where the username is exactly equal to the username of whatever user is logged in or whatever user you happen to click on. So we're going to try to do that, and then we're going to match this try call with an accept call. So we'll say accept, and we'll say accept if the user does not exist. So for some reason, the user got deleted. So we'll say user does not exist, and this is just an attribute. I will raise HTTP 404, and we don't have to actually call that, you just raise it. And then else, I'm going to return self.post underscore user dot post dot all. Okay, and we'll save that. Now this is basically just to make sure that when you call the query set for the user post, that the user actually exists, and then you're able to fetch the posts that are related to that user using this uh, check right here, I exact. Continuing on, we're going to do one more method here, def, and we'll say get underscore context data, and that's going to be self, and then some keyword arguments. And then we'll say context is equal to super get underscore context data, and then pass in keyword arguments. And then we'll say context post underscore user is equal to self dot post underscore user. And then I'm finally going to return that context. That way I'm just returning the context data object uh, essentially connected to whoever actually posted that, that specific user. Okay, moving along we have a uh, couple more classes. These are much simpler than this one. This is probably the most complicated class that we had to deal with, just connecting those posts to those users. Next one we want to do is just a post detail. So we'll say post detail. And that's going to take in that select related mix in as well as a generic detail view. Essentially this is the detail view when you click on a singular post. And what happens is we just connect this models.post and then we'll say select related and we're going to connect it with some foreign keys and this is just going to be the user and the group that this post detail belongs to and then after this we're going to say def get the query set self and then we'll say query set is equal to super get whoops, super dot get query set, and we'll explain all this in just a second, and then we will say return the query set, and we're going to filter it. So what are we going to filter this? We want to check that the user's username is exactly equal to where self keyword arguments get that username. Kind of similar to what we were doing before with this uh, get query set. So again, what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, get the query set for that actual post. And then I want you to filter where the username that we're gonna pass in is equal to the username. And it's gonna have to be exactly the user's username, essentially just that username off that models object. And I know this sort of uh, syntax can be really strange at first, those double underscores and this sort of uh, object model, that uh, object relation model that Django has, but definitely check out the documentation. This can help a lot essentially just go through those examples. They have really well written uh, documentation there. Go through it and this will become uh, clearer and clearer as you see more and more examples of this. It's definitely really weird at first, these sort of customized get query calls. Okay, moving on we have two more classes we want to create for those views and that is a create post and a delete post.
So for the create class or create post, we're going to say create post, and this will have a login required mixin, a select required mixin, or select related mixin, I should say, and then generic create view. Then let's give some extra lines here. And inside of this, we'll start off by saying fields. So the fields I want someone to be able to edit is just the message of the actual post and then the group that the post belongs to. And then the model can be models.post. And we just want to check if the form is valid. So we'll say def form underscore valid as a method. And this will take in self and the form. And then this will be self.object is equal to form.save. And we're going to set commit equal to false. And then say self object dot user and set that equal to the request user. So the actual user that's at the request and then we will say self dot object save. And essentially what this is, it's just to connect the actual post to the user itself. And then once we're done with that, we'll say return super form, oops, form underscore valid pass in form. Save. And then finally we have the delete post which will be another class called delete post. And that's going to be a login required mixin, a select related mixin, and another generic view, in this case, the delete view. Get some more lines in here, come back up, and we'll connect this to a model, so that'll be models.post. Then we will also say select related and set that equal to the user and group, as we've just been doing before. That needs to be in a string. And then we're going to say success URL, and that's just going to be reverse lazy, and that's going to go to posts all. So you can use that URL template tagging. So basically what that means is, once you delete a post, well, what's the success URL? So if you hit, yes, I confirmed the delete, it should take you back somewhere. Reverse lazy, and we'll just go back to all the posts. Then we're going to say, the EF, a get query set self. And then we'll say the query set of this is equal to super get query set. And then I'm going to return query set that I just made, that variable. And I'm going to filter out where the user ID is equal to self.request user.id. Okay, so that's the parameter in for the filter. And then finally, I'm going to have a delete method on this self args keyword arguments. And that's going to be the messages success. And we'll say self dot request. And we'll send in post deleted. And then we're going to return super delete. And you can look up a lot of these kind of convention calls in the documentation for a delete view. A lot of these things, um, they're really just chosen by the convention, that delete view. So delete view kind of expects, uh, if you want to mess around with what happens after you click delete, it has a delete method for it or a get query set. So a lot of these things, we're not actually making up the terms or methods or variables to use. Um, a lot of them just come with the class-based views. So we've already seen a couple of them, things like model or success URL. Uh, methods like delete are just uh, on top of that kind of thing. Okay, so that should be everything we need for our actual views.py. And what we need to do next is link them up to our URLs in our posts.py. So let's come over to the posts folder, open up urls.py here, and then fill out the URLs we need. We'll say from django.clnf for configuration, URLs, import URL. And then I'm also going to say from dot import views. And let's give this app a name of posts. That way we can use that in our template tags. Then we will say URL patterns is equal to, and essentially now it's just time to make all the list of URL patterns. And I'm going to collapse the directory tree to get a little more room here. And we'll start off with a regular expression. So for the actual, if you just go to uh, yourdomainname.com slash posts, we'll say dollar sign. And this will just give views.postlist.as underscore view. 
and we'll just give this the name all. So simple view there. Then the next URL we can do for a new post. So if someone wants to make a new post, that will just go to post slash new dollar sign, and then this will be the create post. So views dot create post as a view, and the name is equal to create. Then after that, what we're going to do is for the user post. So when you click on a user, you can see a list of all their posts. And then we also need to do the post detail and delete post. So let's start with that user post. So we'll say URL. And in here, again, regular expression. And this will be by, or honestly, whatever you want to call that. And then we will use some regular expressions here, which is just going to look similar to what we just used in the past. Question mark, P and then open tag username, close tag, and then we'll use another regular expression, minus backslash w plus, essentially this just matches up the username, so we'll, when you go to your domain name.com, post slash by slash who's ever username, then we can actually have views dot user posts as view. And we'll give this the name uh, for user since I believe that's what we've been using in the templates. We'll say for underscore user. And then we want just one more, or two more actually, the post detail. So it's actually going to look really similar to this as far as the regular expression. So I'm going to copy this entire string. And this shows all the user posts. So then we're going to do one more slash. And we're going to copy and paste this. Actually, let's just write it out so we can see more detail here. We'll say parentheses, question mark, P, open tag, PK, close tag, backslash, D plus, forward slash, dollar sign. And then that's views, post detail, as a view, and we'll give this the name single. And then the last one is just if you want to delete something, it'll be delete, and then we want to connect to the actual primary key here, because we already know it's going to be the user itself that is going to be able to delete them. So we'll say delete that primary key, and then dollar sign, and then views dot delete post as a view, but the name is equal to delete. Perfect. So those are the URLs we need. So we definitely did a lot here, and there's a lot of new stuff that we haven't actually seen yet. Whoops, let me make sure that says from. There we go. So let's quickly review everything we just did. We'll start off with the views. So in postviews.py, what we ended up doing is essentially a bunch of imports that we're going to use later. And we started off a very simple one, just the post list. But remember before that, we wanted user equal to get user model. So we could play around and pass that in if needed. So class post list. So this shows a list of the posts related to either the user or the group or both of them really since post model has that. Then we have the user post, so that's the list view for a specific user's post. And then we have this get query set method, which essentially just checks where the username is exactly equal to the get username of who's ever logged in right now. So we can see here that user object that we set up, the get user model, this is where we could use it. So that's the uh, ORM that Django provides, that object relational uh, model or mapper. Then we have the get context data, which allows us to grab that post user and then return the context dictionary off of that. And then we have the post details. So when you select a particular post, there's a detail view on it. Again, just connecting to the post model and select related. This should be in a string. So good catch there. Save that. And then we have the create post. And again, that's just when you want to create a post, the message in the group. And then we check if the form is valid. And then we have delete post. Very simple thing, except we added a little more on this delete method to actually return something saying the post was deleted. OK, so finally, after that, we said urls.py and just matched up all the URL patterns that we just created. Definitely check out the documentation for a lot of these class-based views. If you're having trouble with uh, some of these methods, such as the get context data or get query set, the documentation really explains those uh, thoroughly. Those are methods that you're going to use as you get more advanced in Django. A lot of the class-based views, uh, you can use them without these additional methods. In fact, we've seen that already in the past, especially with that groups application. It's only when you start getting more advanced or want certain functionality that you'll end up adding on with extra methods. A lot of the functionality you'll be using for a lot of your own projects, probably at the start, are going to work just fine with class-based views. 
Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, welcome to the Social Clone Project Part 10. Now that we have our views for the posts app and the urls.py file complete, let's create the template HTML files for the posts pages. Once that is complete, we can begin to debug in the next lecture. All right, let's hop over to the editor and get started. All right, so what I've gone ahead and done is under the posts application, under templates, under posts, I have the HTML files that we created earlier uh, in this section of the course. Now what we're going to do is start off by editing post underscore base.html. This is the post based file. So first we're going to extend from our initial base.html, which has the navigation bar. And we're going to do a really similar thing here, just like we did with a group base HTML file. Let's create a block. And this block is going to be called content. And then inside of this, I'm going to create a div class. And this will be the post page in case I ever want to edit this. And then inside of that, I'll create a container. And then inside of that, I will create a row. And then what we're going to do here is just have three blocks. And it's going to be just like we did with the groups. It'll be pre-post, the post content, and then post-post. So pre-post. And, and then I'm just going to delete this blank space and copy and paste this. So this should look really familiar to you after we did the group base. So pre-post, and then this is going to be called post underscore content, and then this we'll call post post. Kind of a weird um, fortune with the words there, but that's okay. And that's basically all we have to do with the post underscore base.html file, just like we did with the group base.html file. Coming up next, what we're going to do is create the post form. So I'm going to open up post underscore form .html, and this is the HTML template that's linked to creating a new post. We're going to say extends from post slash post base .html, and then we're going to load bootstrap three, and hopefully this feels really familiar to you because this is essentially just like that group form page. And then we're going to have our block and it will be the post content. Then we're going to say h4 or h3, whatever you want, create a new post. And then we'll insert a form here and the class. Um, we actually will just give this an ID in case we ever want to mess around with it. It'll just be post form ID. And then the action is going to go back to a URL template. This is going to be URL post create. And then we're going to say method is post. So that's all we need here. Inside of the actual form, we need a couple of things. One, as always, is our CSRF token. Then we're going to actually call our form. So let's do that with a template tag. And since we're using bootstrap three, we're just going to say bootstrap underscore form, make this look nice, and then pass in form. Once you've done that, we just need the input button. So we have the input button. The type is submit. The name, it doesn't really need a name the value, we'll give it the value of post so we can connect to it later. And then let's go ahead and give it a class based off some bootstrap things. So we'll say btn, btn primary, and a lot of this is really up to you, uh, btn large. So it's just some style calls. And that's all we have to do for the post form. So far everything's looking really similar to what we did with the groups application. The post base is really similar to the group base and then group post form, really similar to the group form. Now let's move on to the actual post list.html. So again, this is the post list.html file, the one I'm working in right now. And what we're going to do here is start off by extending. So we will say extends post slash post underscore base.html. And then we're going to call our blocks. So our block will say pre post content. And we'll start off here by saying div class call md-4. Then the next thing I want to do is check if the user is actually authenticated. So what I can do here is say if, and here I need to call the request user is authenticated. And then inside of that, we're going to say create a div class. And we're going to use some kind of bootstrap stuff. So card with shadow. 
Again, this is all really styling calls, so you don't have to do it this way. In fact, you can just do no classes if you kind of want to get an idea of the bare bones content and then add in classes as you get more and more familiar with Bootstrap. But inside of this, we'll have a, whoops, a title that we can later edit. And this is just going to say your groups. So if the user's logged in, we want to list out uh, their groups. And then we're going to say, create an unordered list. And we'll give this a class list-unstyled. Again, you don't really need to follow along with those classes exactly. The next thing we're going to do inside this unordered list is say for member underscore group, and this can just be a variable name, whatever you want to call it, in, and this is where it's going to look a little familiar. We'll say get user groups, and you might be wondering, this looks a little familiar, this underscore user groups. So what that actually is, is if you remember back on the groups application, when we were working with the models.py file underneath groups, we had this from Django import template, register is equal to template.library, and that actually allowed us to, if we scroll down over here, use this related name to actually grab that. And you can add the get underscore to connect to the group member. Now definitely check out the documentation because this is more of an advanced thing, but basically that allows us to do a link from the post to the group member. So we'll come back to post list. And now we're saying for member group and get user group. So essentially, if you're a user for every group that you're actually a member of, what we're going to do is create a list item and that's going to be an anchor tag inside of that. And essentially it's just going to say URL groups single, where the slug, let's make sure that's in single quotes and spaced out correctly, where the slug here is equal to member underscore group dot group dot slug. Okay, so basically grabbing the member group inside of all this user's groups and then grabbing dot group off of that model and then grabbing slug off of that group. So that's what that entire line's doing. Let me collapse the tree so you can see that whole thing a little better. Definitely a more advanced call there. And what I'm going to do is add a class to that list element so it just looks a little nicer in the future. So let's make this class equal to, and we're going to say group and then add on li with bullet. Save that. And then that's going to end our for loop and that will be the end of that unordered list. And we're gonna keep going down until we get to that end if. Okay, so, so far we have that little uh, view where someone can see all the groups that they belong to. And then we're gonna continue on after this end if. We'll create another div and we'll say card, card with shadow. Then inside of this, we will create a div the class call will be content. And then we'll say heading five, and we'll give this a class equal to title. And this will be just all groups. And then we'll say an unordered list. And inside, we'll, let's give this a class. This will be list, list dash unstyled in case we ever want to edit that. And here, what we're going to say is another for loop. We'll say for other group in get underscore other underscore groups create a list elements and then we will say create an anchor tag where the reference is going to be the following URL groups single essentially what we just did where the slug is equal to whoops let me make sure that single quotes there correctly there we go where that slug is equal to other group dot slug so there, I'm not actually calling a, a member group, so I don't need to call uh, other group dot group. The group itself is right here under other group. Okay, and that will end the four. And let's also give this list a nice class so it looks a little nicer. So this list element is going to have a class equal to group, and we'll say li with a bullet. And save that whoop, with a bullet. And then end that for loop. Then finally, all the way past this unordered list and all the divs, right after this end block, we're going to scroll down and create another block here. So we'll say block, post content, and then inside of this, we'll say div class, and this is going to be equal to a call, 
MD8. And then we're going to say for the post in post list, we will inject that underscore post, which we're going to work on in just a little bit. We'll say include. And we've actually already seen this before in the groups uh, pages. We'll say post underscore post.html and then save that. Okay, so here with include, we're going to be able to inject post.html and we have these two basic things. One is checking if the request user is authenticated. We have that uh, list right here of those member groups. Okay, saving that, let's move along. I'm going to close this. So let's deal with the actual underscore post.html file since I just down here said include it. So I will open up underscore post.html. So remember this is underscore post.html that I'm about to do, whoops, underscore. So again, find your underscore post.html file. And then here, what we will do is we actually don't need to extend from because we're, we know we're directly going to inject this right here. We're not going to have it be part of a full page by itself. So in that case, we actually don't need to say extends. Instead, we'll basically start right where we want to, which is going to be something like a div. So we'll have a div here. And then the heading three is going to just be the post message HTML. And then we want it to be safe so that it looks good. And we'll say div and we'll give this class uh, media body. And then we'll have a strong call here or bolded, doesn't really matter. We have post user dot username. So the actual name of the person here, that's going to be that at symbol and then we'll have h5 and let's give this a class of media heading and again we may or may not use all these classes it's really up to you and then after that we're going to have a span and then we will say let's give this span a class for username okay and then inside of this we will say give an anchor tag so that anchor tag it's going to be a URL reference, so URL to posts, whoops, make sure that's in quotes, posts for the user. So that's essentially a link to that actual user's individual posts, and then where the username is equal to post.user.username. Okay, so what does that actually mean? Well, basically, we're going to have the post message and then whoever wrote the post that means the actual username and then if you click on that username which is going to be something like at Jose or at Cindy etc whatever their username is it will take you to all the posts for that particular user and this essentially is the link between clicking on someone's name and then viewing their quote-unquote profile in our case the profile is really simple it's just a list of all the users posts okay so that ends that span the next thing we're gonna do is create a little time tag. So the time tag is actually going to allow us to post a time and that's going to essentially indicate what time was this post created at. So we'll give this class equal to time in case we ever want to edit that. And then inside of this will be another anchor tag. And then we'll say href and let's just have this take you back to URL posts single where the username is equal to post.user.username where the primary key is equal to the post primary key. Okay, great. And we can actually kind of close that off in case it's getting too long and that will end that time. And then what we should do is actually paste this whole thing inside of the heading five. So let me grab that closing tag and paste it right here. There we go. And then we have our div tags. So let's continue on by right after this h5, we're going to create a new div and we'll give it again media footer class, media dash footer. And we're going to say if inside of this if statement, I will check if the user is authenticated. So if the user is authenticated, and I also want to confirm that not only is the user logged in, but this actual post, is it the user's post? So I want to say and if post user is equal to the current user. So if those two things are true, then this person should be able to delete the post, which means we're going to have an anchor tag here and we'll send them to 
the URL of posts delete, where the primary key is equal to post dot primary key. Okay, and then let's go ahead and give this a couple more things here. We can also give this something like a title if we really wanted to. So we could say title delete, and then let's also give this a class. So I was going a little too far. I'm gonna continue with the anchor tag there. Class. This will just be a basic class. Uh, btn btn dash simple. Okay, so simple button there. And then inside of this, let's actually create a span so we can call a glyph icon. I'll say class and then glyph icon, glyph icon, remove text dash danger. And then we're also going to say, oops, area dash hidden is equal to true. And basically, you may have seen hidden before, but you haven't seen um, ARIA hidden. So what that is, that's accessible rich internet applications, and that defines a way to make the web content and web applications uh, more accessible to people with disabilities. So basically what happens is, if certain people have disabilities, they have screen readers, so they kind of hover their mouse, or they open up a window, and it starts reading stuff for them. So instead of just saying hidden, for people with those disabilities that are using those screen readers, we have this ARIA-hidden. And basically what that means is the hidden attribute that's new in HTML5, it tells browsers not to display the element, and this particular one tells screen readers to ignore the element and not read it out loud. So again, this is actually uh, just kind of keeping in mind people with disabilities and putting it in there. So let's continue along. After that, we're going to just create the actual delete. So we'll say span, whoops, not span, span. Let me make sure I start writing that again span and let's give this a class equal to text dash danger icon dash label and we'll say delete that's going to be the end if there and that's it for this underscore post so you should have three closing divs after that at the very bottom okay so that's it for underscore post we still have a couple more things to do we finished underscore post finish post underscore base.html, haven't done confirm delete, so let's take care of that now. That one's pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is say extends post slash post base, whoops, dot HTML. And then we're going to say a block of post content. Let's create a heading three asking something like, are you sure you want to delete? this post question mark then inside of this we'll say div and whoops div enter and then we'll say class posts and this is where we're going to include so we will include posts slash underscore post .html. and then we can say with post equal to object and then we'll say hide delete equal to true. Let me make sure I didn't accidentally do doubles here. Okay, so there's a little include inside of that div. So it actually kind of includes that post you're going to delete. And then finally, we need our form. So the form doesn't need a class, doesn't even need an action. We just need a method to post. Take in a quick CSRF token, and then we'll say input type is submit, essentially just saying, yes, I want to delete. And we can give it a value of confirm delete just to make it really obvious to the user that they're about to delete their post. So confirm, delete, and then let's give this a class. Good class, probably danger button, and let's give it large. So we have this uh, BTN, BTN danger, BTN large, and we'll create a link here for URL posts single. This is essentially going to be the cancel button that we're building out. Username is equal to user dot username, since we know they have to be logged in to even reach this page. And then primary key will just be object dot primary key. Essentially just a way to go back. And let's make sure this is spelled right, URL. There we go. So they can either hit this uh, confirm delete input button, which submits that they do want to delete this, which is linked to our delete view, or they have this cancel button, 
which is going to be essentially a uh, link here. And then let's say cancel. Okay, perfect. And actually we need to give this a class so it looks good. So inside of this anchor tag, I'm going to give a class and we'll have that class be equal to, let's say btn, btn dash simple, btn large, btn defaults. Uh, we can just keep stacking them. That really doesn't matter. Okay. So that's looking good. That's the end of our form. That should be the end of our block. So that is the confirm delete. Essentially just uh, saying, okay, do you want to delete this? If not, take them back to that actual post, that individual post detail view. Okay, speaking of detail views, that's uh, one of the ones we have left. We already have post form, post list, and we still need to do user post list, which is going to be really similar to post list, but let's take out that post detail page first. Luckily for us, we actually took care of a lot of that work. So we just need to extend from post dot post underscore base dot html and then say give a block of post underscore content create a div class of call dash md dash eight and then we're just going to include post slash underscore post html and that's all we have to do because basically all the heavy lifting of the actual post detail page was done in underscore post html Perfect. So we're going to have that ready to go. Then we have post form ready to go, post list, and we just need the user post lists, which is actually quite simple. So user post list is going to extend from post underscore post base HTML. We'll have a block here for the pre post. And then inside of this, we'll have a div and let's make this be call MD four h1 and that will say at we'll say post user dot username so it actually so shows the username before the post you can also put this above the post doesn't really matter or below the post so either above or below the post wherever you prefer the usernames that's fine then we're going to say block post content we'll create a div for this and the class is going to be call dash md dash eight and it's going to be a for loop that says for post in post underscore list what we'll do is include post forward slash underscore post dot html save that and then that's actually it for user post list okay so definitely did a lot of the heavy lifting for the templates. This is stuff that is really easy to make a typo, and I'm sure I've made one along the way, which we're going to be debugging in just a little bit. So in the very next lecture, what we're going to do is make sure all our settings and all our migrations are ready to go, and then we'll start debugging. Definitely check against the provided note files to make sure that everything you have matches up with those note files. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome everyone to part 11 of the Social Clone Project. Before we can begin debugging, we have to add in views for leaving and joining groups. We kind of left those uh, views untouched and now we're going to add them in. It's going to be two class-based views and then we're going to connect them to the urls.py file inside of the groups application. Once we've done that, we should be ready to go for debugging and testing. The reason we have to do this before we actually jump straight into debugging is that we'll get a lot of errors because inside of a lot of our templates, we're actually calling um, groups join and groups leave for those actual buttons. And we need some sort of view to at least connect them. Let's hop over to the editor and finish that up. All right, here we have the views.py file for groups application. And we have create group, single group, and list groups. And I'm going to create two more class-based views and it's going to be a join group, I'll put pass there for now, and a leave group. And they're going to look really similar, just one's going to be for leaving a group and another one's going to be for joining a group. Let's start with join group. First off, to join a group you should be logged in, so we'll have login required mix in. And we're going to use another generic class based view, and that one's going to be a redirect view. So once someone clicks on join, we should do some stuff on the back end of our models to join the actual user to be a group member of that group, and then we're going to redirect to another page. So what we can do here is say def, and there's a method we can define called get redirect URL, and that will allow us to grab whatever 
uh, URL we want to direct them to once they join a group. So we'll say self, args, and keyword arguments, and we're just going to re return a reverse call. So in order to use reverse, make sure you scroll up here and actually import it. It's right here under URL resolver, so we're good to go. And let me collapse the directory tree, get a little more room here. And then we're going to redirect to groups single. So that will be the detail view of that particular group. Now, in order to know what groups we're talking about, we're going to add in a keyword arguments dictionary, and it's just going to define slug as self keyword arguments, whoops, self keyword arguments get slug. Essentially, you just get whatever slug of the page or clicking button that you're on the joint group of. And that's all you need to do for get redirect URL. And then what we can do is add in some more checks in case uh, this person's already a member of the group. So we can say def get, and that will be self request, and that takes in args and keyword arguments. And we'll define group as get object. In fact, we're going to need to import this. We'll say get object or four or four, which either means try to get the group that this person is currently looking at or return a 404 page. So in order to use this command, we're going to scroll back up and then we'll say from Django.shortcuts import get object or 404. And you'll also notice there's a get list option, but we're just looking for a single object. So we'll just say group and then we'll say uh, group is what we want. So uh, then we're going to add in a couple more things. We will say group slug, and slug is going to be equal to self, keyword arguments, get slug. And then we're going to try, we will say group member objects create user is equal to self request user where group is equal to group. All right, so what does that actually mean? I'm going to try to get the group member objects and create one where the user is equal to the current user and group is equal to group. So creating a group member, and then I will have an accept, accept, and I can actually accept a specific error. So the specific error we're looking for is an integrity error, although you don't have to technically, you can just say accept, you don't have to write in the error here. So we can say integrity error, and then we will say messages warning. And in order to use messages, you're actually going to need to import it. So let's scroll back at the top and say from Django.contrib import messages. So these are basically things we can send back to the user. So we'll say from, whoops, from Django.contrib import messages. So we can send them a message, hey, um, you're already a member of that group if you're trying to join it again. And then say self.request. And then we actually pass in what we want to warn here. So we can say warning already a member. So that will be if they're already a member, we'll get some sort of error there. Else, what we're going to say is messages success. And then we'll say self.request. And then say Whoops, is it a second? Well, crap, this is not supposed to be an equal sign. Neither is this. I'm just supposed to pass in the request itself. And then here we're going to say, um, as a second argument, you are now a member. And we actually don't need these parentheses here. It's just a second argument. Okay, so that should be it for that. And then at the end of all this, of get, we're going to return, call super get request args and then keyword arguments and then save that. So what we're doing here is if you're joining a group we have this get redirect URL from this redirect view that just says okay once you join the group go back to that group's single detail page and then for this we want to make sure that a person is going to receive some sort of error or warning message if they're already inside the group and a good way to do that is by using Django's built-in uh, messages from contrib so using that, you can just try to do what we would do, which is grab a group member object and create it with user equal to the current user and group equal to group. 
which we just said get object or create. So that's where groups coming from. So this group right here is linked to this group right here on line 29. And then we can say accept integrity error. And you can just actually say accept. So if there's any sort of error, you could just say, for instance, this. That's totally fine as well. Save that. And then we're going to send some warning message that says, hey, you're already a member. Otherwise, if it works, we'll say you are now a member. And then we're just going to return super get request and then args and keyword arguments. Then we're going to fix this for leave group. And this will actually be uh, pretty similar. So for leave group, we're going to, again, say you should be log in to leave a group. And we'll also have a generic redirect view. So once you leave a group, you should redirect it somewhere. So we'll say, in fact, this, we'll just make it the exact same thing. Once you leave a group, you get redirected to that group's page. You could also make it uh, redirect to the home page if you wanted to, or the group list page, but we'll keep things simple. Let me make sure my indentation's right. There it is. So again, pretty much the exact same thing. Once you leave a group, you'll be redirected to that group's detail page. And then finally, we'll have a get method, very similar to the one we just made. So get is going to be self, request, args, keyword arguments, to make sure that they can't accidentally leave a group if they're not really in it. So what we're going to do is first try. So we'll try to get a object, we'll call it membership, and set that equal to models group member. And that will be objects. And I'm going to filter those objects. And we will filter, let me start this on a new line. User is equal to self.request.user. And then group underscore 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 slug is equal to self dot keyword arguments get slug and then off of all that we're going to just call get method so we're going to attempt to try to get a membership and that's off that group member assuming that the user is already in that group so grab the group slug grab the user off that group member object and that's going to be my little membership that I'm going to be playing around with and then I'm going to be accept and I can say accept models group member does not exist so that's an actual thing I can call off that group member object so if that thing doesn't happen to actually exist it means that group member was never actually a member of that group so you accidentally click the leave button on a group you weren't ever a member of so say messages warning self dot request basically the same thing we were doing last time and says sorry you aren't in this group and let's say you are not so I don't have to worry about syntax for single quotes okay so sorry you aren't in the group else what we're going to do is if everything's working we will say membership and we can call a delete method off of this and then we're going to say messages and call a success message and then pass in the request self.request and says you have left the group and then I'm going to return super get pass in request pass in args and then pass in keyword arguments okay so that should be looking good I'm going to save this and the next thing I want to do is make sure I actually connect these views to my urls.py file so let's open that up, urls.py, inside of groups, we have a couple more uh, views to do. So we'll come over and we'll add in the leave and join view to the url.py file. We'll say url join forward slash, and we will say, we're actually going to just grab and copy and paste the same thing here. Join, and then we will say views dot join group and call that as a view and give that the name join since that's what we did in the templates and then the other thing we're going to do is add in the leave so let me just copy and paste this since it's almost the same thing copy paste but instead of join it's going to say leave and instead of join group it will be leave group and then instead of the name join it will be leave so we're going to save that and that's it for the join and leave views that we had to create. So again, over in views, these are definitely the more complicated views. That's why we kind of waited till now. For joining group and leaving group, 
they're really, really similar. They're both redirect views, meaning you just kind of define, okay, once this person's performed this action, where should they go to? And that's the redirect view. And I can actually pass in keyword arguments and grab things off that current uh, request, such as the slug that they're looking at to go to that detail page. And then we have two get methods, both in leave and uh, join group. And basically what these do is check to see if the user can actually perform the given action. If you didn't have these try accept else calls here, you may just get uh, broken pages if the uh, person wasn't in the group and then try to join it um, and then try to join it again, etc. Instead of doing all that, we can just have these messages show up um, and that will help fix any issues. Okay, so that's it. We should now be ready to take care of a few more things in settings.py connect everything, and start debugging this. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome, everyone, to part 12 of the Social Clone Project. Now let's go ahead and try running our application or our website and see if there's any debugging that we need to do. I'm sure we've made typos along the way, so let's see how we can actually fix those. We also need to make sure we do our migrations and double check our settings.py file so that the applications that we just created, groups and posts, are actually inside that settings.py file. Let's get started. Okay, here I am back at the editor and I wanna open up our settings.py file. So under simple social project, open up settings.py. And then I'm going to scroll down to the installed apps and I wanna make sure that we add in the groups app that we've made as well as the posts app. So we will save that. And I also want to make sure that we do the migrations. So I'm going to clear my console or CLS if you're on Windows and then say Python manage.py. Let's make sure I'm in the right one. CD to simple social Python manage.py. And then I'm going to type migrate. It should complain and we'll run that. Okay, great. So it complained. So what we're going to do is say Python manage.py make migrations. And we'll start off with groups, hit enter, and then we'll also do python manage.py, make migrations, and then we'll do posts, hit enter, and then finally we'll say python manage.py, migrate, and then it's ready to go. So now let's actually try running this and see if we need to debug anything. We'll say python manage.py, run server, hit enter. Okay, it looks like it's running. Let's hop over to our browser. Okay, in my browser, everything's looking like it's functioning. So let's actually log in and see if we can create a new group and then create a new post in it. I will log in. Actually, let's sign up just to make sure everything's working. So I will sign up as Jose. My email address will just be jose at gmail.com. Um, that's not my real Gmail address, so don't bother whoever that Jose is. And then we'll say test password, test password, and then sign up. Okay, now I'm going to log in. Username, Jose, password is test password, log in. And it says now we're logged in, great. So I have this create group, so let's try creating a group. I hit on that, actually we haven't linked that yet, so we still need to, on our actual uh, navigation bar, make sure that's working. So that's something we can add in. Let's go ahead and hop over to the editor and fix that. So back in the editor, I will open up the base HTML file. That's the one that actually has a navigation bar. Let me collapse my directory tree. So in base.html, where the navigation bar is, remember I have all these kind of missing links. So let's add those in. First, the URL for a post is just going to be URL, post, create. And then for groups, it's going to be, let's put the template tag here, URL, groups, all. And then for create groups, it's going to be groups create. And then let's also fix this one. So else we will say groups and that will be URL groups all. So the list of all the groups. Okay, save that. And now let's hop back over here and refresh this page. And now I have a syntax error. So it says groups create expected elif, else, or end if. Did you forget to register or load this tag? So let's make sure it was actually groups create for the groups uh, creation page. I'm gonna hop back over and make sure I fix that. So here I'm saying groups create and it looks like I forgot to type in URL. So now I'm gonna save that and we'll refresh again. Okay, so it looks like post is not a registered namespace. So what does that actually mean? Well, it says error during template rendering 
base.html line 29. So if I come over here, it says posts create, it's not valid. So let's make sure that in our urls.py file, I've actually defined posts as the app name. So hop back over here, open up my directory tree. Under posts, I'll open up urls.py. Looks like my app name is registered. So now let's make sure we have create registered. And it looks like that's working as well, which means it may be an issue with the urls.py file in the project level. So let's go over to urls.py at a project level. And if I scroll down here, it looks like I still don't have the groups and post links. So that's definitely something I need to add in. It's a good thing we're debugging now. And hopefully this was kind of obvious to you as you kind of went along here. So we'll do comma, add in URL, and now it's time to register posts. So we'll say using regular expression, caret, posts, and essentially just linking to the actual posts. So we'll say include, and I'm going to include posts.urls. And then let's give it a namespace, which is essentially what it was complaining about. So this was the error that we were getting. It wasn't complaining about the other posts. And let's add one more here for the groups. So we'll say caret, groups, forward slash, and then I'm going to include groups.urls, and then give a namespace equal to groups. And I will save that. Okay, perfect. Now let's try again. You can see it auto restarted for us. So we'll come back over here, refresh the page. It says now I'm logged in, it's looking good. Let's hit on groups and it says, welcome back at Jose, that's looking good. Groups, welcome to the groups page. And then kind of an obnoxious plus sign, but it says create new group. Obviously we can add more CSS styling to make that look better. Let's try hitting create group here, make sure that works. So that works as well. I'm going to go back a space and make sure this button works as well. And it looks like they're taking us to the same groups new. So that's looking good. We'll say first group and the description will be my first group group. And I hit create. Okay. It looks like we have an issue here. It says groups name reverse is not defined. So hopefully by now you kind of realize I probably forgot to import reverse somewhere. So somewhere along the line, I need a reverse call and I probably called it, but didn't actually import it because it says name reverse is not defined. So let's go back and make sure in our groups uh, file where we're actually having that uh, create group view, we imported reverse. So we'll come back. So coming back to my actual editor, I can now see if I expand my command line here that I get this name error, name reverse is not defined. And going up, it actually tells me where it's coming from. It's coming from simple social groups models.py line 30 and get absolute URL. So that's probably where the issue is. So let's go ahead and find that models.py file. It's not in views. So we're going to scroll down a little bit, come over to models.py. And then over here is where we're actually going to see if we can fix that mistake. So over in line 30, it says, if we scroll down, return reverse. So it looks like we just forgot to import reverse. So now we'll come back up here and we'll say from django.core.url resolvers import reverse. Okay, so we will now save that. And it looks like it's running again. Come back up here, uh, go back, and then let me refresh this page and let's try uh, second group and we'll label a description of second try. Create. All right, so now back at the page after refreshing, it looks like our group was created. Now the font's actually really large here. That's because I'm zoomed in 200%. So keep that in mind. A lot of the things that we do with Bootstrap might look a little strange here just because I'm zoomed in so much to make sure you guys can see clearly. But we have the second group, member count is zero. Let's try to join this group and see if it works. I joined and now the member count is one. And let's leave, see if that works. And it looks like we have a problem with leave. So it says name models is not defined. So over here, we're saying models.groupmember.objectfilter and that's in the views.py file of our groups. So it looks like we forgot to import models or do something with our actual views.py file inside of groups. So let's head over and make sure we actually imported the group models. We'll come back over here and this is the views.py file. And what I need to do is all I need to say is from dot import models, save that. And let's head back and refresh this page. And it looks like we're still getting a uh, leave group has KQ. Oh, whoops, like definitely misspelled something here. That should have been a W. So again, we'll come back over here and let's see if we can search for that. Uh, KQ, there we go. So that should be KWRGs. Save that and make sure that there's double asterisks here as well. 
and we'll come back, refresh this page, and now remember count zero, so let's try joining again, and now let's try leaving again, and it looks like it's working, perfect. Now there's no posts in this group yet, so let's try posting something. I'll click on post and say this is my first test post, exclamation point, and under group we're going to just to assign this to second group, post. All right, now we get this error that says user post object has no attribute post. And the fact that it's saying has no attribute, remember you call attributes with a dot or a period, meaning probably somewhere along the line, I'm calling dot post off of something where I really shouldn't be doing that. And it says right here, it's under simple social post views.py in line 28. So let's head back to views.py and under posts views.py, here it is. I'm going to take a look at this on line 28. I can see here, I'm saying try self.post.user equals a user object. Really what I should have been doing is assigning this. So here I said self.post underscore user and that's actually what I meant to do in line 28. Basically creating this uh, attribute object or editing this attribute object of post user. So now that I've saved that, let's head back over and refresh the page. Okay, it looks like at Jose, I can see this is my first test post, and it just says uh, delete here, so let's try that. I'm going to try delete, and it looks like template does not exist, post delete one, post, post base.html. So somewhere along the line, we are getting a failure for post underscore base. So it says this template doesn't exist. Let's head back and figure that out. I'm gonna hop back over, and let's confirm that we do have a post underscore base, so that looks good. Meaning, over here on the confirm delete, probably something is happening here that's wrong. And it says extend post, post HTML. Looks like I accidentally have double quotes there. So let's delete those, save it, and then try again, see if that fixes the issue. And there we go. So it was just an issue of accidentally having double quotes there in that extends call. So it says now, are you sure you want to delete this post? Let's try it, confirm delete. It looks like messages is not defined. That probably means I didn't import messages. So that's under views.py in line 70. Again, head over, post, uh, views.py, line 70. If you take a look at it, uh, messages, success. I forgot to import that. So we'll say from Django, and I believe it's from .contrib, import messages. Save that. Come back here, and I'm going to refresh this. Continue. And it looks like it deleted that post. But let's try again. Let's make sure that's working for us. If I hit groups, I see all the groups. I'll come to first group, I'll join that group, and then I'm going to post the first group this time. Okay, so let's see if this is working. Now let's put this to first group, post it. Okay, so let's see if this is working. Jose, I'm going to delete this. Are you sure you want to delete this post? Let's see if it's working. Confirm delete. And it looks like deleted it. Now right now what's happening is the redirect is probably not working off the delete, so we should definitely check that as well. And if you notice off the post, it looks like the date or timestamp wasn't working as well. So if we come back to groups, uh, let me add a post here. So I'm going to, well, I don't have to actually, actually let's join it and let's post. So I'm gonna just say blah, blah, group, second group, post. And now if I take a look at the groups, I can see second group has one post. So it looks like the counting is working. And then it says right here, this post. And if I hit um, my post, so if I actually wanna delete this, it looks like it's working. I'm going to hit cancel and see that it redirects here. Okay, so it looks like we're able to post, but notice that we're not getting a lot of the functionality we thought we were going to get. Things like the date that the post was created at, or my at Jose isn't actually linking to my profile. And it's probably because we forgot to put some things either on this particular template page or one of the templates it extends from or injects into. So let's go back to our editor. And you'll notice that for this page, that would have been the user uh, post page or the post confirm delete. In fact, if we go back, this is post by Jose number three. So this is actually the post detail page. So post underscore detail, if we take a look at it, it essentially just injects underscore post.html, meaning all the issues are probably within underscore post.html. So again, coming back here, I'm getting some issues at Jose. I expect that to be clicking. Um, I expect this to probably say at Jose instead of just Jose. Uh, and I don't know what this S is doing there, so there's still some problems here. Let's come back, and this page is directly what we're looking at. Since there shouldn't be any problems here, it's just about five lines of code, it's probably all in underscore post.html. So we'll go to underscore post.html and add some stuff in here. Let me collapse this directory tree. 
it looks like we actually forgot to add in the text for these anchor tags, which was probably a big oversight. So let's do that now. Um, underneath media heading, these anchor tags, these should probably have something since they're linking to something. So we will say at, and then this will be the username. So we'll say post.user.username. Save that. Let's go back and see if that affected something. Okay, so there I see at Jose, and I don't really want this double Jose there, so we'll come back here, and then let's get rid of this. So post user, post username. I'm going to just comment that out, because I feel like I don't really need it now. There we go, so that's looking a little better. Come back up here, and it looks like the time isn't actually posting, so let's do something there as well. We will insert here, or inject post created at, remember that was that property of what time it was created at, save it, and then I'm going to refresh. Okay, looks like we have a creation at Jose, that's looking good. We see that we still have this weird S floating around there, and if I refresh this page, uh, it's still there, but I can see that it's after the delete button. So let's try to confirm that it's an underscore post or if it's actually in the user post list. So coming back here, if I type something outside of this, so this is outside underscore post, save that, and then refresh this page. Looks like that happens first, so outside underscore post, which means this S is not part of the injection itself. So that means the problem is not actually in underscore post.html. So I'll save that, and it should have been under user post list. So clicking on user post list, I can see include, and whoops, looks like the S was right here the whole time. Delete that S, save this, come back here, refresh the page, and now the S is gone. Looking good. If I come back to Star Social, that takes me to Welcome to Star Social. I can see the list of groups, first group, second group, and it looks like everything is working. Let's try creating a new user, going through all the actions, and then verifying that everything is working. So I will log out. It says, thanks for visiting, come back soon. Let's hit sign up. Actually, before we do that, let's see if we can view the groups without being logged in. That's looking good. First group, no post in this group yet. Hit the groups over here. There's one post in second group, and there's the post itself. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Then I'm going to sign up. We'll sign up as new underscore user, new at gmail.com. This will be test password, test password, sign up. Okay, so I have new underscore user, and I believe it's the same password as Jose, so we'll just log in. Okay, now it says I'm logged in, perfect. I'm going to try to create a group, and this will take me to my new group, just make it really obvious, brand new. Hit create. Okay, so my new group, member count, no post in this group yet, and again, I'm uh, pretty zoomed in here, so that's why it looks a little weird. I'm going to join my own group, and then let's try posting in it. So this is the first post in new group. And then I'll go to my new group, hit post, and there it is. This is the first post in new group, new user, and if I hit on new user, it takes me to essentially the same page. So let's try exploring. If I go to groups, uh, the second group, that had a post by at Jose. Let's try clicking at Jose. And now I can see at Jose's profile. Essentially, it's like his profile or Twitter feed, and I can see whatever post that this person has done. Perfect. So it looks like all our functionality is working. Um, up, coming up next, all we have to do is set up our CSS files to kind of uh, give this a nicer look. Okay, we'll do that in the next lecture. I'll see you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the final part of the Social Clone Project. Now our website actually has full functionality. We can sign up new users, have them log in, and they can create both groups and posts, and the groups have a count of how many members they have and how many posts they have. Now what we're gonna go ahead and do is add in the CSS and JavaScript files to give this website a cool look. And this is where you can diverge and customize the site to your own liking. We will copy and paste from the Farida notes, and a lot of this code just comes from a code pen that's publicly available. But again, this is really a personal preference and up to you how you want to style your particular site. Let's hop over to the notes and finish up this project. All right, here I am in the editor, and the first thing we want to do is make sure that in our settings.py file we have the static files linked. And if you scroll all the way down, I believe we may have made a small typo. So you should have static underscore URL equal to static and static files underscore, it should be D-I-R-S, so static file directories. And the reason for that is because we pass it in as a list, it could have multiple static directories. 
and then we say os.path.join base directory static. So make sure you uh, change that and save it so that it's static files underscore dirs. Okay, once you have that, what you need to do is come over to static and inside of simple social CSS and JavaScript, create a master CSS file and a master JavaScript file. Now inside of these, I've already copied and pasted the code from the notes as well as the code in this master CSS, so this other CSS file. In case you ever want to play around with uh, other things, you can link this as well. Uh, mainly we're just going to be using uh, this CSS file, which essentially makes everything black and the color white. And then this JavaScript file, which is sourced from this code pen, so you have the link there. And this is what allows you to set the stars when you click on something on the website. These stars will pop up. So right now the JavaScript, this master JavaScript file, isn't linked yet. So what we're going to do is link that to our base.html page. That way it shows up in every single page. So we'll come over to base.html, scroll all the way down to the bottom because we want this to load after the entire body is loaded. And we're going to add in a script call here. So a script, it's going to be type text JavaScript. And then let's say the source. So the source is going to be static. So wherever the static directory is, and it's just simple social JavaScript slash master.js or whatever we happen to call it. So that's where we can find it. I'm going to save that. And then this whole thing, the source should be in quotes itself. There we go. And the syntax highlight can kind of hint at that. Okay, so that should be all we need for that particular script. Let's save that change, and then let's make sure we scroll up and actually loading the static files. Okay, we are loading the static files. So everything should work. Let's run this and finish up this project. Confirm we'd have no bugs. All right, now coming to the website, we can see here it says, Welcome to Star Social. Everything's turned black, and as we hover above buttons, now they're kind of inversed in color. And if you click somewhere here, you'll end up seeing the stars being created. So you can click a whole bunch, and you'll see a bunch of stars being created. And that's basically it. Now, given the way that the actual nav bar and the content is created, there is kind of a buffer zone here as far as the stars. So they're bouncing off and there's essentially, I can click here to close to the border so you can see it. Uh, there's no way to go above that. Now you could spend a lot more time with CSS and JavaScript and make sure all these elements that their background and their canvas is linked so that the stars go everywhere. I mean, kind of up to you. Uh, that's a lot more work on the front end. That's really not what Django's about. So really up to you how much you want to customize this, if the stars are really your thing to begin with. But that is an example of how you could spruce up your project and just make it look better. Okay, um, that's basically all there is to this project. I hope you had fun. The main thing to really get out of this project is creating users and creating groups of users and having them connect that way. So those two kind of model ideas, essentially just an expansion off the blog project. All right, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lectures. Hello everyone and welcome to this quick advanced side lecture where we talk about the Django debug toolbar. We've already seen how to manually debug Django at the end of our clone projects, but maybe there's a better way that we could try to get a little more help. And luckily there is. It's called the Django debug toolbar and it's a favorite tool for Django developers to help them try to catch where errors are happening inside of their project. The Django toolbar gives useful panel tools about your project that can help you clarify why certain behavior is occurring or happening. It won't be able to directly pinpoint the exact source of a bug or help you figure out how to actually change the syntax. It really just contains useful information that you may find helpful to actually find and help fix the bugs. So this is what the toolbar actually looks like. We'll actually play around with it a lot more in the next lecture, but essentially, you see on the right hand side this toolbar and there's various panels that you can click on and then it gives you information about your website. Now keep in mind, this may or may not fit with your workflow style, but it is helpful enough that many developers that work with Django keep it up to date with their open source contributions. So it may not work for you, but it's a very popular tool for Django developers in general, which is why it's worth talking about. In order to get the debug toolbar in your virtual environment, Go to your command line and type pip install django-debug-toolbar. And depending on how you actually install Django and your version, you may even already have it installed. But again, go to your virtual environment and do that pip install command. Okay, in the next lecture, what we're going to do is briefly go over the panels and what information they show you. Then you can decide if it's a good fit for your workflow. 
A lot of the projects in this course are small enough where the toolbar may not be a deciding factor on whether or not you use it, but once you become a Django developer, either as part of a larger company or you start to develop your own really large projects, the toolbar may be a good choice for your workflow. Okay, I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome everyone to the Debug Toolbar Overview Lecture. Now what we're going to do is install the toolbar and go over what each panel means. In order to actually view the toolbar in your website, you're going to need to make several changes to your settings.py file in your project. You can check out the Django Debug Toolbar documentation for helpful hints if you want to follow along there, or helpful hints in case what we do here in this actual video lecture doesn't work for you. All right, select any previous project from the course to play around with for the settings.py file, we're going to be choosing Pro 2 from Django Level 2 because it's a really simple website that just shows a list of users for us. All right, we'll head over to the Atom Text Editor, open up Pro 2, install the toolbar, and then edit the settings.py file and see what the toolbar shows us. All right, here I am at the Atom Text Editor, and I've opened up the Pro 2 project that was the PROTWO project from Django Level 2. Let's run the project so we can remember what it actually does. We'll say Python manage.py run server, and I've also activated my virtual environment. We can see right here my Django ENV, and then this will run at the local host. So let's go to our browser and open up the local host. Going to the URL in your browser, you should see something that looks like this working, go to slash users to see the user list. So let's do that. It will say slash users. And then here are your users for app two. So remember we populated that by running the population script and then we essentially showed kind of a manual list view, first name, last name, email, etc. And this was done manually. Later on, we learned about list views from generic class-based list views, but here's the basic idea of what our app is doing. Now let's try to add in the Django debug toolbar to see how that can help us eventually learn more about our application. We'll head back over to the text editor and install it. All right, back at the text editor here, I'm going to control C and quit that server, CLS on my windows to clear. You can do um, clear if you're on a Mac or Linux. And then what we're going to do is inside my virtual environment, say pip install Django-debug-toolbar. All one line, hit enter, and this will install the Django debug toolbar for you. I'm going to hop forward in time as this finishes installing. Okay, now that it's successfully installed the Django debug toolbar, what we need to go ahead and do is edit our settings.py file to make sure that we actually can view the debug toolbar. It wouldn't make sense to not have to edit the settings.py file, otherwise you would never be able to turn the toolbar off. So it makes sense that we have to go to the settings.py file, as shown here, add it to our list of applications, and then set it to be viewed. So we'll scroll down. The first thing we wanna do is make sure under installed apps, we have the debug toolbar. So you'll scroll down, installed apps, make sure that it goes after static files because it relies on static files. And we haven't mentioned this yet, but installed apps are loaded in the order of this list. So if there's a dependency of one of these applications on a later one listed, you may get errors. So usually what you wanna do is load up all the default Django and default built-in stuff. Then you will load up uh, applications that you downloaded. And then at the very end, you'll load up all the applications that you created. So after static files, write debug underscore toolbar, and we'll have a comma there, and save that. So that's the first step we need to do, make sure that it's actually loaded after static files. Then we wanna set up the URL configuration. So we wanna add the debug toolbars URLs to our projects URL configuration, which means we'll do the following. We'll come over to our project level urls.py file. Remember that's uh, not an application URLs, but our actual project level urls.py file. Here we have a relatively simple one where we just defined URL patterns. Then what we will do is below this, we'll say if settings.debug. That way we have to have debug equal to true in our settings.py file to actually see the debug toolbar. And in order to use settings here, we need to import it. So up at the top, we will say from Django.configuration import settings. And then we'll say if settings debug, we're going to import debug underscore toolbar. And then once we've done that, we're going to reassign URL patterns. 
we'll say URL patterns is now equal to, we'll have a list here, and we're going to call URL, that's the URL function we imported uh, up here from config.urls, and we will pass in using regular expression, caret, underscore, underscore, debug, underscore, underscore, forward slash, and then we'll type in include, and pass in debug underscore toolbar dot urls. And we're able to do that because we imported it here. Now we still want the rest of these URL patterns. So then what we can do is just say plus URL patterns. And that's going to reference this previously created URL patterns. So we're essentially concatenating our old URL patterns list with an additional entry in case settings is debug and we import a debug toolbar. Then what we need to do is make sure that debug toolbar is listed in our middleware. So we will save the urls.py file here. We'll go back to settings.py. And we could have done this uh, earlier, but it doesn't really matter what order you do this in. And in your middleware in settings.py, what you will do is add a new entry, and it will be debug underscore toolbar dot middleware dot debug toolbar middleware. And pay attention to the capitalization here. You can always reference the documentation. They essentially have all these lists, uh, all these steps listed out for you. So it's really easy to follow along. But all we need to do is add that to middleware. And then we're going to save our settings.py file. Once we've added the debug toolbar to the middleware list, the final thing we have to do in our settings.py file is add in an internal IPs attribute or variable. So we'll scroll all the way down to the bottom. It really doesn't matter where you put this, but we'll put it all the way in the bottom and we'll in all caps say internal underscore IPs and set it equal to a list. And then as a string, we're going to pass in our internal IP. So 127.0.0, whoops, 0.0.0.1. And that basically allows the debug toolbar to know that it should only be operating if you're running something locally. That way, if someone ends up using your site and you left the debug toolbar in the middleware or something like that, they don't accidentally uh, see it while they're using the site. This is really only for us, which makes sense. So I will save that to the settings.py file. And now let's try running this again. We'll say python manage.py and whoops, let me put a space in there, manage.py run server. Hit enter. And then I'm going to hop over to the browser. All right, coming over to your browser, you should now see the debug toolbar over on your right-hand side, which looks pretty nice. And if you ever want to hide it so you can see more of your website, just click on this hide button and it'll say right here, this little tab, Django debug toolbar. And you can click on this and it's almost operating like a, a little JavaScript add-on to our page with a lot more information. Let's go through each of these panels and explain what kind of information they're trying to give to you. So versions, that panel just shows you the versions of things you're using. For example, right now I'm using Django 1.10 in my virtual environment and Python 3.5 and the debug toolbar version was 1.8. So if you're using any Python packages, this will report back the versions, which is kind of nice in case you uh, don't want to have to dig in and look up what versions you're using. This will tell you directly. Then the time panel right here just tells you the total time it took to load up this page. So for example, let's go to the slash users page, hit enter, and then you'll see here it took a little longer, about 400 milliseconds versus this other page, which didn't have to make any calls to our model, took way less, 15 milliseconds. So it makes sense. Let's go back to the users tab because there's basically a SQL query here that is going to be useful. If you click on the settings panel, this shows you all the settings in your settings.py file. That way you don't need to go back to your text editor. You can see them all here. So I can see, for example, debug is equal to true, which is why I'm able to see this um, debug toolbar and all the installed apps, app2, debug toolbar, etc. So I'm going to close this now. So far, pretty self-explanatory has saved us time from having to go back to the editor. If we check out headers here, this panel tab shows the HTTP request and response headers, as well as a selection of values from the WSGI environment down here. Then next we have the request panel, and the request panel just shows you the get or post request, so it shows you essentially view information um, and the cookies. So this is a little more useful on a uh, page that has a form, that way you can see the posts or get requests and then the data that's associated with them. Since we're using a really simple website as our example, we don't see much information here, but in the views that you had that actually have a form, which is trying to get something or post something, you'll see that information here on the request panel. Then we have the SQL panel, 
And this essentially shows you the SQL queries, including the time to execute and links to try to explain each query. So let me close this real quick. Hopefully you remember that essentially what we're doing here in the users for app two is showing a manual list view of all the users, meaning we had to query our models, essentially our SQL database using SQLite. And what Django did was it transformed your Python code into a SQL query. And if you want more details on that SQL query, you can click here on the SQL panel, and then you can click plus, and it will show you the SQL query that it created for us. So it said select from order by ascending order, and you can see here what we actually did in our template. We said if users for person and users, etc. And it also showed you how much time it took to execute that query. Obviously our model was pretty small and our query was really simple. There was only 12 users here or something. So it took like 0.5 milliseconds, which is super fast. Okay, so that may be useful information, especially when you get to more complicated class-based views. Static files, we have no static files, but this would show you information about them. Things like the CSS or JavaScript. That way, in case you ever don't get a connection uh, from your Django application to your CSS files, this can really help you figure out what's going on there. Then there's the templates. This just shows you the actual template that it's connected to. Again, pretty useful if it's connecting to a template you don't expect. Cache, this is just shows the cache queries. Um, right now, this is just so simple, um, we actually don't really have anything here. Then we have signals. The signal is just a list of signals, their arguments and receivers. Uh, right now, at the level we're programming in, this may not make a whole lot of sense, slash it may not be very useful to you, but in much larger uh, projects, you may find useful for this tab. Then finally, logging. We actually haven't been logging anything, but in case you ever wanted to use Python's built-in logging module to log things like error messages, et cetera, you could easily accept those and find them here. And those are all the really useful features of the debug toolbar. Again, right now we're developing pretty simple website applications. And since we're doing everything from the ground up and we essentially write all the code for these larger clone projects that we've been experiencing, the debug toolbar may not be right now the best fit in your workflow. But once you start doing a much larger project, working with other people, your colleagues, you're working at a company, or you start using other outside libraries that you may not have written yourself, the debug toolbar will hopefully be a really good addition to your workflow. All right, that's it for this section of the course. Just wanted to show you the debug toolbar, what it's capable of, and how to set it up in your project. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next section of the course. Hello everyone, and welcome to this advanced topic section where we're going to be discussing customizing the Django admin interface. Now often the default admin page is great and it's all we need for our projects. But sometimes we may also want to expand what the admin page can do. And we also have a lot of tools in Django to customize it to our own needs. And we're going to now learn how to customize the Django admin page as well as features of the admin page. So we're going to learn how to do the following. We'll discuss a quick review of the admin page, how it's used, then we'll change the admin page template, show you how you can actually override templates on the admin page, and then we'll show you things like changing the order of fields that show up and adding search and filters to the admin site. We're gonna start by quickly creating a new project and application. We won't really do anything on the front end since we really only are going to focus on the admin back end. So essentially it's just going to be an empty front end with two models connected and registered to the admin. Let's jump to our editor and get started. Okay, here I am at the Adam text editor. And what I'm going to do is just create a new project. I've gone ahead and created a new folder on my desktop called test to do this in. Really, it doesn't matter too much wherever you decide to do this. And we're going to call this my underscore video rental. We're gonna kind of make it as if it's a rental video store website. So go ahead and create that project. And then I'm going to CD into my video rental here. And then off of this, I'll say Django admin start app, and we'll just call this app videos. And this is where we're going to have a model.py file and an admin file that we can later kind of play around with. So let's expand this, make sure this all worked out. So I see my video rental, I see videos, I see models. So what I'm going to do is in my settings.py, I'm going to make sure I register this videos here. So I'm going to scroll down and under installed apps, just go ahead and add that app name that we just created called videos. Save that. Always make sure you save so you can have those changes. Then we're going to come over here to models and we're going to quickly create two models. Uh, nothing too major here. 
the models we're going to create essentially just going to mimic having a movie and having a customer. So we'll say class movie and then we'll say models dot model and then let's give it some fields. We'll say title is models dot and we'll have it be a character field and let's go ahead and give it a max length of 256 characters. And then let's say the movie has a length in minutes and this is since it's a length of minutes we know it needs to be a positive integer so we'll have that be that type of field and then there's also a release year and technically that should also be a positive integer so we'll do that as well just keeping things simple um, the main idea is not working with the models is working with the admin page we're essentially just creating these because we need something to play around with later on so I'm also going to create another model here called customer model and we'll say inherit from models.model and let's say customers have a first name, let's say models, and that's also a character field with max length equal to 256. You can always copy and paste this from the notes as well if you don't want to type this all out. And let's say last name is models, basically the same thing here. It has a max length of 256. And then finally, let's say they have some sort of phone number or some sort of digital code. Doesn't matter too much, but we'll have that one also be some positive integer field. Okay, so Command S or Control S to save that. And then I'm going to make sure that I register these into the admin file. So we'll come over here to admin.py in our videos and let's register these. We're gonna say from dot import models. And then I will say admin dot site dot register, whoops, register. And I'm gonna register my models that way I can see them in the actual admin page. So models.customer and then admin dot site dot register models.movie. Then I'm going to control S to save that. And let's go ahead and make sure we do our migrations. So over here down at the terminal, I can just zoom in a little bit for you guys. I'm going to do the following. We'll say, make sure I say Python manage.py. And then I'm going to say make migrations. And it went ahead and created model and movie. Well, excuse me, created model customer, created model movie. Then we're going to say python manage.py and I'm going to migrate any changes that we have under videos. It may say running migrations, there we go. And then I always like to say make migrations one more time to make sure there's nothing left. So no changes detected, perfect. And since we're actually going to be using the admin interface, we need to actually create a super user. So let's make sure we do that as well. We'll say python manage.py and this line is create super user, which we've done before. And if you get this error, no such table, auth user, that's actually an easy fix. It just means that you need to run python manage.py migrate. So come over here back to the terminal and say python manage.py migrate, hit enter and let it migrate everything. Now try it again, python manage.py, create super user and you should see it ask for your username. I'll say Jose, email address, doesn't really matter. We'll say blank at gmail.com. Password, I always use test password. And type it in again. Your password's hidden for security. So there we go. Super user created successfully. Let's make sure it all works out. So we'll say now python manage.py run server. Hit enter there. And then let's copy and paste this URL and bring it into our browser, which I'm going to bring over now. So bringing in my browser, it says it worked. Congratulations, your first Django powered page. That's exactly what we want. As I mentioned before, we're really not gonna be doing anything on this front end. So let's go ahead and say slash admin and come over to our admin page. My username and password is already filled out for me, Jose and test password. You may have to fill it in depending on uh, how many times you've done this before. Go ahead and log in and here we go. Let me make this full screen. I can see my groups and my users. That's authentication authorization, which we've actually discussed before. If you click here on users, I can see Jose blank as Gmail. I have staff status, etc. And you'll notice that I have a filter option here. And we're going to discuss later on how to create these sort of filters on our own models. But let's go ahead and go back to home and check out our models. See here I have customers. And then if we come back to videos, I can see here I have movies, etc. So let's go ahead and create some customers. I'm going to add a new customer here. Let's just have the customer be me as well. 
and then some sort of phone number. It doesn't really matter. So we're going to save and add another. And then let's make a couple more kind of generic names, random phone numbers, doesn't really matter. Save and add another. And last one, we'll say Cindy. Let's say that's also Smith because I'm not very creative here. And then we're going to say save. Okay, so we have three customer objects. Those are looking good. We'll come back to videos. We'll say movies. And then we'll add some movies here. So let's go ahead and add in some movie, movies, Jurassic Park. Let's say it's 120 minutes, release year, I, 1993, I'm guessing. Save and add another one, we'll say Star Wars. Length of this one, let's say it's 90 minutes, I don't know if that's true or not. And let's say 1973, I also don't know if that's right. And finally, let's do one more movie here. Uh, let's say Indiana Jones. Let's say it was in 1984, whoops, that's actually the length. So let's also say this one's 134 minutes and 1984. Again, totally just making that up. Okay, so now we have three movie objects and we're ready to go. So let's go ahead and go back to our page where we had the models and make the string representation, not just say movie object, but have it actually say the name. So we're gonna go back over here and under models.py, notice I have my class movie and class customer. Let's go ahead and give it a string representation that we've done before. We'll go ahead and here we'll say def underscore underscore str underscore underscore. It takes in self and it's going to return self dot title. We'll have that be the model. And then also down here for the customer, we're going to add a method here. This will be self. And then let's have it return. Let's just have it return self dot first name. And then we're going to concatenate it with self dot last name. And basically I'm just concatenating this string and then a little space there and then the last name. So now that we've done all that, let's go ahead and make sure that we migrate any changes that may have occurred. We'll say Python manage.py migrate. It'll say running migrations, no migrations to apply. So let's make sure that all worked. We'll say Python manage.py run server hit enter, our server is running again. Let me come back to the browser and bring it over. And I'm gonna just come straight to the admin page. Okay, so here's the admin page. And if we check out customers, now we see Cindy Smith, Mike Smith, Jose Portilla. And if we come back to movies, we can see Indiana Jones, Star Wars, Jurassic Park. So now that we have these kind of string representations here, the string method, we can see that it's printing out that string as its name. So you click on Indiana Jones, you can see title, length, and release here, etc. Okay, so that's the very basics of the Django admin interface, and that's everything that basically already comes for free. And what I mean by free is that no work was involved, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, because this is a lot of kind of power features and already stuff that you can edit without having to code anything out. All you had to do was basically register it to the admin site. But we're going to learn how to add even more stuff to this. So the first thing you're gonna learn is how you can edit this template. Maybe you want things like a different color, or instead of saying, saying Django admin, or Django administration, you want it to say like Blockbuster's admin page or something like that. Not every user is gonna know what Django admin means, etc. So in the next lecture, we're gonna learn how to actually edit these templates. Thanks, and I'll see you there. Welcome back everyone to this lecture on admin templates. Now for projects where other users will have access to the admin page, not just yourself, the person who created the website, you may want to add some customization to the admin templates. That way when they log in, it looks a little nicer, it's more related to the actual website, etc. So to do this, you can overwrite template HTML files that are associated with the admin pages. In order for that to work, you must have the correct template name and directory structure. Finding the file names that are correct involves looking around Django's open source code on GitHub. So what we're going to do is we're going to create the directory structure and then find the template name from GitHub. We'll kind of walk through through the whole process. Then afterwards, once we have that template, we're going to essentially copy and paste that HTML file into our code and change the template however we want. Let's get started by jumping over to our editor and setting up the directory structure. Okay, so in your project directory, where you have your project directory, your project folder, and then your application folder, what you're gonna have right underneath the project directory at the very top level, you're gonna add a new folder 
and you're going to call it templates. And then under that new templates folder, you're going to create a subfolder called admin. And this is where you can copy and paste template HTML files that are associated with the admin and essentially overwrite the original admin template files. Now to show you what these template files should be named, we're gonna hop over to our browser and walk you through the Django documentation or open source code just a little bit. Let's open up my browser and head over to Django's GitHub page. Okay, so here I am at github.com slash Django slash Django, and this is all the open source code for Django. And we actually need to play around with this a little bit and find where the admin template files are. So let me go ahead and show you how you can find them. You're first gonna to come to this Django folder. Let me zoom in just a little bit here so it's kind of clear what we're looking at. You'll come over to Django, let that load up, and then underneath Django, you'll scroll down to see Contrib, click on that, and then you'll find Admin here. And then under Admin, you'll find the Templates folder. So this Templates folder is where you have Registration and Admin, so depending on what you kinda of wanna play around with, you can edit those two as well. But we are just editing the Admin page right now, so we'll click on that. And this is why we had to have that specific directory structure, templates underscore admin, because essentially we're gonna be overwriting one of these HTML files. And for now, we can overwrite the base site HTML. That's the very first page you see. So if you hit that and click on open a new tab, you'll see here that it says, hey, it extends from admin base.html, and essentially just has the index page and the Django site admin header page. Now, if you come back here, you can see that there's base HTML, and this is the base HTML code that kind of has the styling, the links, et cetera, and builds out what a lot of these pages are gonna look like. So if you wanna end up doing things like setting the admin page to have certain styles or colors, anything with CSS, or just kind of something that extends to the majority of the pages, this is the file you kind of wanna play around with, base.html. But we just really wanna play around with that very first thing. So we'll say base site.html, base underscore site.html. I'm going to copy all of this. So right click, copy, and then I'm gonna hop over back to my editor, just need to minimize that. And I have my editor right here. So underneath admin, I'll create a new file. And remember, it needs to have the exact same name as what we just discussed. So it's gonna be base underscore site dot HTML. Hit enter, and now we have this template file. So then I'm going to just paste. And here, if I just run this right now, nothing's going to change. So what I'm actually going to do is change over the first heading one. So you can see heading one right now, it links to the index page of the admin site, but then it also has this kind of template insert. So it sees here like, oh, I'm inserting some site header, default Django administrator, etc. Instead of doing all that, I'm just going to kind of put in my own line here. So let's delete that and let's just have it say something like new, well, I guess we're doing a video store. So let's do video store admin. And then I'm going to save this. Now that we've gone ahead and edited this base site.html, we want to make sure that our settings.py file is ready to accept any template changes. So we'll open up our project folder, open up settings.py, and as we've done before, you can actually just do this directly. Usually we had another uh, variable name, but instead what we're going to do is, if you come over to where it says templates, I'm just going to search for it. Templates, there we go. And notice it has directories right now is empty. So let's go ahead and do the following. We'll say os.path.join. And we're going to join that base directory with templates. So save that. And once you have that, we should be able to see the new changes in our base site.html. So you'll notice that basically Django already restarted for me. So I'll bring into my browser now with the admin page. And if I bring it over, you can see now it says video store admin. So those are the kind of changes you can make. Basically anything stylistically that you want to change with CSS, you're probably better off doing the base.html file. But if you want to change kind of minor things around this kind of index page of base site HTML, you can do that as well. Now definitely be careful. You don't want to change things too much to actually break the functionality. I would recommend this more for style choices. As far as functionality editing, we're going to learn the more correct ways to do that later on throughout this series of lectures. All right, that's it for this lecture. I'll see you at the next one. Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we're going to discuss ordering fields on the admin page. Now by default, the admin will display fields in the detail view in the same order they are defined in the model. 
We can easily change that with a few edits in the admin.py file. Let me show you how. I'm first going to show you what the original default detail view looks like and then show you how you can edit it. Let's hop over to our editor and our browser. Okay, so I have my browser here open in front of my editor and I first want to show you the default views for the model. So we can think of it when we click customers and then we click on a particular customer, I can see this detail view of that customer. And then if we come back to videos, if I take a look at the movies, select the title of a movie, I can see title, length, release year. Now, maybe you want to have these in a different order. Right now, by default, they're in the same order that they are defined in in the model itself. Let me show you how we can change the order of this detail view for these different fields. We'll come back to videos, and then we're gonna move this browser aside and do the actual edits in our admin.py file. So come over to admin.py, which is going to be underneath our application. So under videos, admin.py, and so far we've just registered models.customer and models.movie. In order to actually order the fields, what you end up doing is you create a new class, and this class is going to be called movie admin, and it's going to inherit from admin dot model admin. Now this actual naming structure by convention what it should be is the name of your model and then admin attached to it. So I want this class to be kind of in relation to this models.movie class. For the other one we could say customer admin. Then off of that we end up adding an attribute called fields. And the fields is just a list. And remember a list is a particular sequence with an index and it's going to be the actual fields of whatever model you're referring to, in this case, movies, and it puts them in the order you want. So if we take a look at models right now, and we take a look at a movie, it has a title, a length, and release year. Let's try to make the release year the first thing, and then have title and length afterwards. So we'll come back to movie admin, and we'll say release year, and then we'll say title, and then let me make sure what the last one was, it was length. So we're going to save those changes, and the last thing we want to do is we now want to register this class with along with the actual model. So we'll say models.movie and then comma, we're also going to register movie admin. Now save that, and let's bring in our browser again. So here's my browser, I'm going to just refresh this, make sure those changes are good, and then we'll hit on movies hit on Indiana Jones, and we notice now the release here is the first thing showed, then it goes title, and then it goes length. For this particular example, it wasn't a big deal to change the orders, but oftentimes you'll have some sort of relational field, and that one's going to be really useful to have at the top, that we can kind of choose, okay, which other model is it related to, etc. But hopefully now you can see here, you have full flexibility on the way you want to see these, and what order you want to see these in. Okay, that's really all there is to it. As a quick review, all you end up doing is you create a new class, with the name of your model and then admin, so that's by convention, you inherit from admin.modeladmin and then you create an attribute called fields and then you just list the fields in the order you want them to appear in and then you register that along with your original model. Thanks everyone and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we'll show you how to add search on your admin view pages. So we currently only have a few entries in our models, just a few movie titles, a few customers, but if a more realistic project ends up having hundreds or even thousands of entries, it's gonna be hard to just quickly scroll through and find what you're looking for. We can add a search in the admin page to quickly and easily find what entry we're looking for. And Django actually makes this incredibly easy. It's essentially just one attribute you add into a class. So let's hop over to the editor and show you how to do that. Okay, I'm back here at the editor, and on your admin.py file, remember these classes we created where we could add in a fields or the ordering of fields. What you can also do is add in an attribute called search underscore fields, and you can set that equal to a list of fields you want to actually search in the search box that Django's gonna automatically create for us. So for instance, for movies, you probably just wanna search the title, but you can imagine that if there was a description to this movie, you may wanna search that as well. Now, the more terms or fields you add in here in the search field, that means the longer it's gonna to take to search something. However, it's all relatively quick, so it shouldn't be a big deal to add in uh, more fields here. However, you probably don't wanna add fields like length unless you intend to search for length in the search box. So I'm going to save this so you can see what this actually looks like. 
let me bring in my admin page. So here's my admin page, and we added a search field to movies. So if we click on movies, notice here, now we get this nice little search box. And what I can do is I can begin typing something like Indiana, and then hit search, and it's gonna return anything where Indiana happened to be in that title. Okay, now if I search something like 123, or let's say 120, and hit search, right now zero movies pop up because it's not searching uh, the length of movies, it's only searching the title of movies. So let's edit that so we can see the effect. I'm gonna hop that over over here, and then let's go ahead and say length is something we can search as well. Save this. I'm going to refresh this, come back to videos, come back to movies, and now I'm gonna search for, let's say 120, hit search, and I see Jurassic Park shows up, because remember, now I can search for the length of a movie. So if I click on Jurassic Park, that was the length of that movie. Okay, that's really it for adding search. As you saw, it's incredibly easy and incredibly powerful. All you need to do is inside one of these classes, add in this attribute search underscore fields, and then add in a list of fields you wanna search. And remember, you need to register this along with the model. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome back everyone to this lecture on adding filters. So we can also add filters for our admin view of our models, and filters will automatically show up on the right-hand side of the view, and they will also auto-filter depending on the data type, and I'll explain more about that later on. Keep in mind, not every field will be useful as a filter. Let's explore how to easily create filters for our admin views. I'm gonna hop over back to the editor. Okay, here I am at my admin.py file, and if you notice what we have right now, if I bring it over my browser, is if I'm selecting videos and then I check out the movies, I see a list of movies and I can search them, and then I can also add movies here. What I wanna do is if we come back to home, notice how the built-in users, it has a filter, filter by staff status, super user status, active, etc. So I can filter based off these different fields. I'm gonna show you now how to add in those kind of filters for your own models on the admin page. So to do that, it's actually really simple. All you need to do is in this class that we created, and you can do this for any model that you may, just create another class such as customer admin. The attribute you need to add in is called, whoops, list underscore filter. And then you just add in the list of things you want to filter by. So the different attributes of your model that you can filter by. So for movies, what might make sense is filtering by, for instance, the release year or filtering by the genre or maybe even the length, etc. What probably does not make sense to filter by is the title. So I'm going to add all of these as filters. That way you can get an idea of how this actually works and why some of these choices are probably not good choices for filters. So I bring in back my movies over here and I'm going to refresh. And now I can see over here on the right-hand side, let me kind of expand this so you can see it. On the right-hand side over here, if we zoom in a bit, I can see by filter. So filtering by release year, that may make sense because you know there's different or multiple movies per release year. By length, that could also make sense depending if things are standard length or not. By title, it doesn't really make sense because title is probably a unique ID in this model. So you don't want just kind of hundreds of titles here. So you usually want to filter by some sort of categorical uh, attribute of your model where many movies or many objects are going to fit to that category. Okay, so that's how you can easily add in a filter. And that's really all there is to it as a quick review. It's just this attribute of list underscore filter and then the actual attributes you want to filter by. Okay, thanks everyone and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we'll learn how to view additional fields. Currently, we can only see one field of our models in the list view on the admin page. We can actually add in more fields to view and order by. And again, this is also just an easy addition of an attribute in that class we've been kind of playing around with. Let's hop over to the editor and show you how to do it. All right, so here we are back at the admin.py file. And before we actually add in the attribute, I wanna show you what it currently looks like when we look at the list view for a particular model. I'm gonna bring in over my browser. And right now, if I don't do any filters, so if I show all, I can see all the movies. So I only see right now movie in this list view of a model. So bringing that over again, let's go ahead and show you the attribute. And the attribute is quite simple, it's just list display, list underscore display. And let's go ahead and just copy this list so we display all the fields. Usually you probably don't wanna do this depending on how many fields you have in your model, but that should be enough for us. 
we'll save it and then let's bring in back our list view page and then I'm going to refresh this and now you can see the release year, the length, and the title. And the order you put them in the list is the order they show up. So I probably want the title over here on the left hand side, so let's do that as well. I'm going to move this over and let's go ahead and have title be first. So I'm going to cut that here. Whoops. Let's actually just insert title and then remove it over here on the back. There we go. So I'm going to save this and now I'll refresh the page and I can see title is now here first. So whatever's first in this column is the one you can click on to go to the detail view page. So again, this is the list view. Click on one of these, it shows you the detail view. You can also now sort by these guys. So you can notice these little kind of pop-ups here. So you can sort by release here just by clicking here on the top column. And that's how you can add uh, more fields in your list view, simple as that. Again, the attribute is just list underscore display. And hopefully now you get the theme of how easy it is to work with Django admin. You essentially just create a class here, inherit from admin.modeladmin, and then add in attributes as you need them. Things like filtering, displaying, search fields, etc. And then just remember to register that particular class. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we'll show you how to create edits from the list view. As I mentioned, you can also add the ability to edit attribute values from the list view instead of having to click into that detail view. And again, this is an easy attribute addition. Let's quickly show you how. I'm gonna hop over to the editor. Okay, so here I am in admin.py. The attribute you need to add to this is called list underscore editable equals, and then you just add in the list of the attributes or fields that you want to be able to edit from that list view. Now keep in mind, those attributes or fields that you can edit also have to be displayed, otherwise it won't make sense. You need to display something so you can edit it. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's edit the length, and then I will save this and then bring back my actual browser. So bringing in my browser, and this is what it looks like right now. Let me refresh this, and you'll notice now, in my list view, I can edit the changes. So maybe I can make this 100 minutes here, and then save that, and I can see the changes, and you can even see the filter has affected those changes as well. So this makes it really easy to do bulk changes or bulk additions from the list view instead of having to click in to the actual detail view based off some sort of field. So again, this hopefully makes your life a lot easier. Now as a quick note, you should be cautious with this approach because if you intend multiple people to have access to the admin page and have access to this list view, you may cause uh, problems if they're trying to edit the same attribute or same field at the same time. Basically, whoever clicked save last ends up having the final say. So keep that in mind as you kind of play around with this. Again, the attribute is if we kind of come back here, it's just list underscore editable, and you have to remember that needs to be under display as well. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.